Section 26 of The Art of Public Speaking. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Adams. The Art of Public Speaking by Dale Carnegie and Joseph Berg Essenwein. Chapter 26 Riding the Winged Horse. To think and to feel constitute the two grand divisions of men of genius, the men of reasoning and the men of imagination. Isaac Disraeli, Literary Character of Men of Genius And as imagination bodies forth the forms of things unknown, the poet's pen turns them to shapes, and gives to airy nothing a local habitation and a name. Shakespeare, Midsummer Night's Dream it is common among those who deal chiefly with life's practicalities to think of imagination as having little value in comparison with direct thinking. They smile with tolerance when Emerson says that science does not know its debt to the imagination, for these are the words of a speculative essayist, a philosopher, a poet. But when Napoleon, the indomitable welder of empires, declares that the human race is governed by its imagination. The authoritative word commands their respect. Be it remembered, the faculty of forming mental images is as efficient a cog as may be found in the whole mind machine. True, it must fit into the other vital cog, pure thought, but when it does so it may be questioned which is the more productive of important results for the happiness and well-being of man. This should become more apparent as we go on. 1. What is imagination? Let us not seek for a definition, for a score of varying ones may be found, but let us grasp this fact. By imagination we mean either the faculty or the process of forming mental images. The subject matter of imagination may be really existent in nature, or not at all real, or a combination of both. It may be physical, or spiritual, or both. The mental image is at once the most lawless and the most law-abiding child that has ever been born of the mind. First of all, as its name suggests, the process of imagination, for we are thinking of it now as a process rather than as a faculty, is memory at work. Therefore, we must consider it primarily as 1. Reproductive imagination. We see or hear or feel or taste or smell something, and the sensation passes away. Yet we are conscious of a greater or lesser ability to reproduce such feelings at will. Two considerations, in general, will govern the vividness of the image thus evoked, the strength of the original impression and the reproductive power of one mind as compared with another. Yet every normal person will be able to evoke images with some degree of clearness. The fact that not all minds possess this imaging faculty in anything like equal measure will have an important bearing on the public speaker's study of this question. No man who does not feel at least some poetic impulses is likely to aspire seriously to be a poet. Yet many whose imaging faculties are so dormant as to seem actually dead do aspire to be public speakers. To all such we say most earnestly, Awaken your image-making gift, for even in the most coldly logical discourse it is sure to prove of great service. It is important that you find out at once just how full and how trustworthy is your imagination, for it is capable of cultivation as well as of abuse. Francis Gorton, footnote, Inquiries into Human Faculty. Francis Galton says, the French appear to possess the visualizing faculty in a high degree. The peculiar ability they show in prearranging ceremonials and fates of all kinds, and their undoubted genius for tactics and strategy, show that they are able to foresee effects with unusual clearness. Their ingenuity in all technical contrivances is an additional testimony in the same direction, and so is their singular clearness of expression. Their phrase, figurez-vous, or picture to yourself, seems to express their dominant mode of perception. Our equivalent of 
image is ambiguous. But individuals differ in this respect, just as markedly as, for instance, the Dutch do from the French. And this is true not only of those who are classified by their friends as being respectively imaginative or unimaginative, but of those whose gifts or habits are not well known. Let us take for experiment six of the best-known types of imaging, and see in practice how they arise in our own minds. By all odds the most common type is A, the visual image. Children who more readily recall things seen than things heard are called by psychologists eye-minded, and most of us are bent in this direction. Close your eyes now and recall, the word thus hyphenated is more suggestive, the scene around this morning's breakfast table. Possibly there was nothing striking in the situation, and the image is therefore not striking. Then image any notable table scene in your experience, how vividly it stands forth, because at the time you felt the impression strongly. Just then you may not have been conscious of how strongly the scene was laying hold upon you, for often we are so intent upon what we see that we give no particular thought to the fact that it is impressing us. It may surprise you to learn how accurately you are able to image a scene when a long time has elapsed between the conscious focusing of your attention on the image and the time when you saw the original. b. The auditory image is probably the next most vivid of our recalled experiences. Here association is potent to suggest similarities. Close out all the world beside, and listen to the peculiar wood-against-wood wood sound of the sharp thunder among rocky mountains. The crash of ball against ten-pins may suggest it. Or image, the word is imperfect, for it seems to suggest only the eye. The sound of tearing ropes when some precious weight hangs in danger. Or recall the bay of a hound almost upon you in pursuit. Choose your own sound and see how pleasantly or terribly real it becomes when imaged in your brain. C. The motor image is a close competitor with the auditory for second place. Have you ever awakened in the night, every muscle taut and striving, to feel yourself straining against the opposing football line that held like a stone wall, or as firmly as the headboard of your bed? or voluntarily recall the movement of the boat when you cried inwardly, It's all up with me! The perilous lurch of a train, the sudden sinking of an elevator, or the unexpected toppling of a rocking chair, may serve as further experiments. d. The gustatory image is common enough, as the idea of eating lemons will testify. Sometimes the pleasurable recollection of a delightful dinner will cause the mouth to water years afterward, or the image of particularly atrocious medicine will wrinkle the nose long after it has made one day in boyhood wretched. D. The olfactory image is even more delicate. Some there are who are affected to illness by the memory of certain odours while others experience the most delectable sensations by the rise of pleasing olfactory images. F. The tactile image, to name no others, is well nigh as potent. Do you shudder at the thought of velvet rubbed by short-nailed fingertips? Or were you ever burned by touching an ice-cold stove? Or, happier memory, can you still feel the touch of a well-loved absent hand? Be it remembered that few of these images are present in our minds except in combination. The sight and sound of the crashing avalanche are one. So are the flash and report of the huntman's gun that came so near doing for us. Thus imaging, especially conscious reproductive imagination, will become a valuable part of our mental processes in proportion as we direct and control it. 2. Productive Imagination All of the foregoing examples, and doubtless also many of the experiments you yourself may originate, are merely reproductive. Pleasurable or horrific as these may be, they are far less important than the images evoked by the productive imagination, though that does not infer a separate faculty. Recall, 
again for experiment, some scene whose beginning you once saw enacted on a street corner, but passed by before the denouement was ready to be disclosed. Recall it all. That far the image is reproductive. But what followed? Let your fantasy roam at pleasure. The succeeding scenes are productive, for you have more or less consciously invented the unreal on the basis of the real. And just here the fictionist, the poet, and the public speaker will see the value of productive imagery. True, the feet of the idol you build are on the ground, but its head pierces the clouds. It is a son of both earth and heaven. One fact it is important to note here. Imagery is a valuable mental asset in proportion as it is controlled by the higher intellectual power of pure reason. The untutored child of nature thinks largely in images, and therefore attaches to them undue importance. He readily confuses the real with the unreal, to him they are of like value. But the man of training readily distinguishes the one from the other, and evaluates each with some, if not with perfect, justice. So we see that unrestrained imaging may produce a rudderless steamer while the trained faculty is the graceful sloop skimming the seas at her skipper's will her course steadied by the helm of reason and her lightsome wings catching every air of heaven the game of chess the warlord's tactical plan the evolution of a geometrical theorem the devising of a great business campaign the elimination of waste in a factory the denouement of a powerful drama the overcoming of an economic obstacle, the scheme for a sublime poem, and the convincing siege of an audience may, nay, indeed must, each be conceived in an image, and wrought to reality according to the plans and specifications laid upon the trestle board by some modern imaginative Hiram. The farmer who would be content with the seed he possesses would have no harvest. Do not rest satisfied with the ability to recall images, but cultivate your creative imagination by building what might be upon the foundation of what is. 2. The Uses of Imaging in Public Speaking By this time you will have already made some general application of these ideas to the art of the platform, but to several specific uses we must now refer. 1. Imaging in Speech Preparation a. Set the image of your audience before you while you prepare. Disappointment may lurk here, and you cannot be forearmed for every emergency, but in the main you must meet your audience before you actually do. Image its probable mood and attitude toward the occasion, the theme, and the speaker. b. Conceive your speech as a whole while you are preparing its parts, else can you not see, image, how its parts shall be fitly framed together. c. Image the language you will use, so far as written or extemporaneous speech may dictate. The habit of imaging will give you choice of varied figures of speech, for remember that an address without fresh comparisons is like a garden without blooms. Do not be content with the first hackneyed figure that comes flowing to your pen-point, but dream on until the striking, the unusual, yet the vividly real comparison points your thought like steel does the arrow-tip. Note the freshness and effectiveness of the following description from the opening of O. Henry's story, The Harbinger. Long before the springtide is felt in the dull bosom of the yokel, does the city man know that the grass-green goddess is upon her throne. He sits at his breakfast eggs and toast, begirt by stone walls, opens his morning paper and sees journalism leave vernalism at the post. For whereas spring's couriers were once the evidence of our finer senses, now the associated press does the trick. The warble of the first robin in Hackensack, the stirring of the maple sap in Bennington, the budding of the pussy willows along the main street in Syracuse, the first chirp of the bluebird, the swan song of the blue point, the annual tornado in St. Louis, 
the plaint of the peach pessimist from Pompton, New Jersey, the regular visit of the tame wild goose with a broken leg to the pond near Bilgewater Junction, the base attempt of the drug trust to boost the price of quinine foiled in the house by Congressman Jinx, the first tall poplar struck by lightning, and the usual stunned picnickers who had taken refuge, the first crack of the ice jam in the Allegheny River, the finding of a violet in its mossy bed by the correspondent at round corners. These are the advanced signs of the burgeoning season that are wired into the wise city, while the farmer sees nothing but winter upon his dreary fields. But these be mere externals. The true harbinger is the heart. When Strephon seeks his Chloe and Mike his Maggie, then only as spring arrived, and the newspaper report of the five-foot rattler killed in Squire's Pettigrew's pasture confirmed. A hackneyed writer would probably have said that the newspaper told the city man about spring before the farmer could see any evidence of it, but that the real harbinger of spring was love, and that, in the spring, a young man's fancy lightly turns to thoughts of love. 2. Imaging in Speech Delivery when once the passion of speech is on you, and you are warmed up, perhaps by striking till the iron is hot, so that you may not fail to strike when it is hot, your mood will be one of vision. Then, A, re-image past emotion, of which more elsewhere. The actor recalls the old feelings every time he renders his telling lines. B. Reconstruct in image the scenes you are to describe. C. Image the objects in nature whose tone you are delineating, so that bearing and voice and movement, gesture, will picture forth the whole convincingly. Instead of merely stating the fact that whiskey ruins homes, the temperance speaker paints a drunkard coming home to abuse his wife and strike his children. It is much more effective than telling the truth in abstract terms. To depict the cruelness of war, do not assert the fact abstractly. War is cruel. Show the soldier, an arm swept away by a bursting shell, lying on the battlefield pleading for water. Show the children with tear-stained faces pressed against the window-pane, praying for their dead father to return. Avoid general and prosaic terms. Paint pictures. Evolve images for the imagination of your audience to construct into pictures of their own. 3. How to acquire the imaging habit You remember the American statesman who asserted that the way to resume is to resume? The application is obvious. Beginning with the first simple analyses of this chapter, Test your own qualities of image-making. One by one practice the several kinds of images, then add, even invent, others in combination. For many images come to us in complex form, like the combined noise and shoving and hot odour of a cheering crowd. After practicing on reproductive imaging, turn to the productive, beginning with the reproductive and adding productive features for the sake of cultivating invention. Frequently, allow your originating gifts full swing by weaving complete imaginary fabrics, sights, sounds, scenes, or the fine world of fantasy lies open to the journeyings of your winged steed. In like manner, train yourself in the use of figurative language. Learn first to distinguish and then to use its varied forms. When used with restraint, Nothing can be more effective than the trope, but once let extravagance creep in by the window, and power will flee by the door. All in all, master your images. Let not them master you. Questions and Exercises 1. Give original examples of each kind of reproductive imagination. 2. Build two of these into imaginary incidents for platform use, using your productive or creative imagination. 3. Define a. Fantasy b. Vision 
C. Fantastic. D. Phantasmagoria. E. Transmogrify. F. Recollection. 4. What is a figure of speech? 5. Define and give two examples of each of the following figures of speech. Footnote. Consult any good rhetoric. An unabridged dictionary will also be of help. At least one of the examples under each type would better be original. A. Simile. B. Metaphor. C. Metonymy. D. Synecdoche. E. Apostrophe. F. Vision. G. Personification. H. Hyperbole. I. Irony. 6. A. What is an allegory? B. Name one example. C. How could a short allegory be used as part of a public address? 7. Write a short fable. Footnote. For a full discussion of the form, see The Art of Story Writing by J. Berg Essenwein and Mary D. Chambers. 7. Write a short fable for use in a speech. Follow either the ancient form, Aesop, or the modern, George Aid, Josephine Dodge Dascom. 8. What do you understand by the historical present? Illustrate how it may be used, only occasionally, in a public address. 9. Recall some disturbance on the street. A. Describe it as you would on the platform. B. Imagine what preceded the disturbance. C. Imagine what followed it. D. Connect the whole in a terse, dramatic narration for the platform and deliver it with careful attention to all that you have learned of the public speaker's art. 10. Do the same with other incidents you have seen or heard of or read of in the newspapers. Note, it is hoped that this exercise will be varied and expanded until the student has gained considerable mastery of imaginative narration. See chapter on narration. 11. Experiments have proved that the majority of people think most vividly in terms of visual images. However, some think more readily in terms of auditory and motor images. It is a good plan to mix all kinds of images in the course of your address, for you will doubtless have all kinds of hearers. This plan will serve to give variety and strengthen your effects by appealing to the several senses of each hearer as well as interesting many different auditors. For exercise, a. Give several original examples of compound images, and b. Construct brief descriptions of the scenes imagined. For example, the falling of a bridge in process of building. 12. Read the following observantly. The strikers suffered bitter poverty last winter in New York. Last winter, a woman visiting the east side of New York City saw another woman coming out of a tenement house wringing her hands. Upon inquiry, the visitor found that a child had fainted in one of the apartments. She entered and saw the child ill and in rags, while the father, a striker, was too poor to provide medical help. A physician was called and said the child had fainted from lack of food. The only food in the house was dried fish. The visitor provided groceries for the family and ordered the milkman to leave milk for them daily. A month later she returned. The father of the family knelt down before her and, calling her an angel, said that she had saved their lives, for the milk she had provided was all the food they had had. In the two preceding paragraphs we have substantially the same story told twice. In the first paragraph we have a fact stated in general terms. In the second we have an outline picture of a specific happening. Now expand this outline into a dramatic recital, drawing freely upon your imagination. End of section 26, chapter 27, Growing a Vocabulary. Quote,
Boys flying kites haul in their white-winged birds. You can't do that way when you're flying words. Careful with fire is good advice we know. Careful with words is ten times doubly so. Thoughts unexpressed may sometimes fall back dead, but God himself can't kill them when they're said. Unquote. Will Carton, The First Settler's Story the term vocabulary has a special as well as a general meaning true all vocabularies are grounded in the everyday words of the language out of which grow the special vocabularies but each such specialized group possesses a number of words of peculiar value for its own objects these words may be used in other vocabularies also but the fact that they are suited to a unique order of expression marks them as of special value to a particular craft or calling. In this respect, the public speaker differs not at all from the poet, the novelist, the scientist, the traveller. He must add to his everyday stock words of value for the public presentation of thought. Quote, a study of the discourses of effective orators discloses the fact that they have a fondness for words signifying power, largeness, speed, action, color, light, and all their opposites. They frequently employ words expressive of the various emotions, descriptive words, adjectives used in fresh relations with nouns, and apt epithets are freely employed. Indeed, the nature of public speech permits the use of mildly exaggerated words which, by the time they have reached the hearer's judgment, will leave only a just impression. Unquote. Footnote. How to Attract and Hold an Audience. J. Berg Asenvine. Form the Book Note Habit. To possess a word involves three things to know its special and broader meanings, to know its relation to other words, and to be able to use it. When you see or hear a familiar word used in an unfamiliar sense, jot it down, look it up, and master it. We have in mind a speaker of superior attainments who acquired his vocabulary by noting all new words he heard or read. These he mastered and put into use. Soon his vocabulary became large, varied, and exact. Use a new word accurately five times, and it is yours. Professor Albert E. Hancock says, quote, An author's vocabulary is of two kinds, latent and dynamic. Latent, those words he understands. Dynamic, those he can readily use. Every intelligent man knows all the words he needs but he may not have them all ready for active service. The problem of literary diction consists in turning the latent into the dynamic." Unquote. Your dynamic vocabulary is the one you must especially cultivate. In his essay on A College Magazine, in the volume Memories and Portraits, Stevenson shows how he rose from imitation to originality in the use of words. He had particular reference to the formation of his literary style, but words are the raw materials of style, and his excellent example may well be followed judiciously by the public speaker. Words in their relations are vastly more important than words considered singly. Quote, Whenever I read a book or a passage that particularly pleased me, in which a thing was said or an effect rendered with propriety, in which there was either some conspicuous force or some happy distinction in the style, I must sit down at once and set myself to ape that quality. I was unsuccessful, and I knew it, and tried again, and was again unsuccessful, and always unsuccessful. But at least in these vain bouts I got some practice in rhythm, in harmony, in construction and coordination of parts. I have thus played the sedulous ape to Hazlitt, to Lamb, to Wordsworth, to Sir Thomas Brown, to Defoe, to Hawthorne, to Montaigne. That, like it or not, is the way to learn to write. Whether I have profited or not, that is the way. It was the way Keats learned, and there was never a finer temperament for literature than Keats. 
It is the great point of these imitations that there still shines beyond the student's reach his inimitable model. Let him try as he please, he is still sure of failure. And it is an old and very true saying that failure is the only high road to success. Unquote. Form the reference book habit. Do not be content with your general knowledge of a word. Press your study until you have mastered its individual shades of meaning and usage. Mere fluency is sure to become despicable, but accuracy never. The dictionary contains the crystallized usage of intellectual giants. No one who would write effectively dare despise its definitions and discriminations. Think, for example, of the different meanings of mantle, or model, or quantity. Any late edition of an unabridged dictionary is good, and is worth making sacrifices to own. Books of synonyms and antonyms, used cautiously, for there are few perfect synonyms in any language, will be found of great help. Consider the shades of meaning among such word groups as thief, peculator, defaulter, embezzler, burglar, yegman, robber, bandit, marauder, pirate, and many more, or the distinctions among Hebrew, Jew, Israelite, and Semite. Remember that no book of synonyms is trustworthy unless used with a dictionary. A thesaurus of the English language by Dr. Francis A. March is expensive, but full and authoritative. Of smaller books of synonyms and antonyms there are plenty. Footnote. A book of synonyms and antonyms is in preparation for this series, The Writer's Library. Study the connectives of English speech. Fernald's book on this title is a mine of gems. Unsuspected pitfalls line the loose use of and, or, for, while, and a score of tricky little connectives. Word derivations are rich in suggestiveness. Our English owes so much to foreign tongues, and has changed so much with the centuries, that whole addresses may grow out of a single root idea hidden away in an ancient word origin. Translation, also, is excellent exercise in word mastery, and consorts well with the study of derivations. Phrase books that show the origins of familiar expressions will surprise most of us by showing how carelessly everyday speech is used. Brewer's A Dictionary of Phrase and Fable, Edward's Word, Facts and Phrases, and Thornton's An American Glossary are all good, the last an expensive work in three volumes. A prefix or a suffix may essentially change the force of the stem, as in masterful and masterly, contemptible and contemptuous, envious and enviable. Thus, to study words in groups according to their stems, prefixes and suffixes is to gain a mastery over their shades of meaning and introduce us to other related words. Do not favor one set or kind of words more than another. Quote, Sixty years and more ago, Lord Brougham, addressing the students of the University of Glasgow, laid down the rule that the native Anglo-Saxon part of our vocabulary was to be favoured at the expense of that other part, which has come from the Latin and Greek. The rule was an impossible one, and Lord Brougham himself never tried seriously to observe it. Nor, in truth, has any great writer made the attempt. Not only is their language highly composite, but the component words have, in De Quince's phrase, happily coalesced. It is easy to jest at words in osity and Asian as dictionary words and the like. But even Lord Brougham would have found it difficult to dispense with pomposity and imagination. Unquote. Footnote Composition and Rhetoric J. M. Hart the short, vigorous Anglo-Saxon will always be preferred for passages of special thrust and force, just as the Latin will continue to furnish us with flowing and smooth expressions. To mingle all sorts, however, will give variety. 
and that is most to be desired. Discuss words with those who know them. Since the language of the platform follows closely the diction of everyday speech, many useful words may be acquired in conversation with cultivated men, and when such discussion takes the form of disputation as to the meanings and usages of words, it will prove doubly valuable. The development of word power marches with the growth of individuality. Search faithfully for the right word. Books of reference are tripled in value when their owner has a passion for getting the kernels out of their shells. Ten minutes a day will do wonders for the nutcracker. Quote, I'm growing so peevish about my writing, says Flaubert. I'm like a man whose ear is true, but who plays falsely on the violin. His fingers refuse to reproduce precisely those sounds of which he has the inward sense. Then the tears come rolling down from the poor scraper's eyes, and the bow falls from his hand. Unquote. The same brilliant Frenchman sent this sound advice to his pupil, Guy de Maupassant. Quote, Whatever may be the thing which one wishes to say, there is but one word for expressing it, only one verb to animate it, only one adjective to qualify it. It is essential to search for this word, for this verb, for this adjective, until they are discovered, and to be satisfied with nothing else." Unquote. Walter Savage Lander once wrote, quote, I hate false words, and seek with care, difficulty, and moroseness those that fit the thing. Unquote. So did Sentimental Tommy, as related by James M. Barry in his novel bearing his hero's name as a title. No wonder T. Sanders became an author and a lion. Tommy, with another lad, is writing an essay on A Day in Church, in competition for a university scholarship. He gets on finally until he pauses for lack of a word. For nearly an hour he searches for this elusive thing, until suddenly he is told that the allotted time is up, and he is lost. Barry may tell the rest. Quote, essay. It was no more an essay than a twig is a tree, for the gawk had stuck in the middle of his second page. Yes, stuck is the right expression, as his chagrined teacher had to admit when the boy was cross-examined. He had not been up to some of his tricks. He had stuck, and his explanations, as you will admit, merely emphasized his incapacity. He had brought himself to public scorn for lack of a word. What word? they asked testily. But even now he could not tell. He had wanted a Scotch word that would signify how many people were in church, and it was on the tip of his tongue, but would come no farther. Puckle was nearly the word, but it did not mean so many people as he meant. The hour had gone by just like winking. He had forgotten all about time while searching his mind for the word. The other five examiners were furious. "'You little tatty dooly Cathro roared. "'Were there not a dozen words to wile from if you had an ill will to puckle? "'What ailed you at Mansey? "'Or I thought of Mansey,' replied Tommy woefully, for he was ashamed of himself. "'But, but a Mansey's a swarm.' It would mean that the folk in the kirk were buzzing the gither like bees, instead of sitting still. "'Even if it does mean that,' said Mr. Duthie, with impatience, "'what was the need of being so particular? Surely the art of essay-writing consists in using the first word that comes, and hurrying on.' "'That's how I did,' said the proud McLaughlin, Tommy's second competitor." I see, interposed Mr. Gloke, that McLaughlin speaks of there being a mask of people in the church. Mask is a fine Scotch word. I thought of mask, whimpered Tommy, but that would mean the kirk was crammed, and I just meant it to be middling full. Flo would have done, suggested Mr. Lonimer. Flo's but a handful, said Tommy. Curran, then, you jackanapes! Curran's no enough. Mr. Lorimer flung up his hands in despair. 
"'I wanted something between Curran and Mask,' said Tommy doggedly, yet almost at the crying. Mr. Ogilvy, who had been hiding his admiration with difficulty, spread a net for him. "'You said you wanted a word that meant middling full. Well, why did you not say middling full, or fell mask?' "'Yes, why not?' demanded the ministers, unconsciously caught in the net. "'I wanted one word,' replied Tommy, unconsciously avoiding it. "'You jewel,' muttered Mr. Ogilvy under his breath, but Mr. Cathro would have banged the boy's head had not the ministers interfered. "'It is so easy, too, to find the right word,' said Mr. Gloag. "'It's no, it's difficult as to hit a squirrel,' cried Tommy, and again Mr. Ogilvy nodded approval. And then an odd thing happened. As they were preparing to leave the school, Cathro having previously run Tommy out by the neck, the door opened a little, and there appeared in the aperture the face of Tommy, tear-stained but excited. "'I ken the word now!' he cried. "'It came to me out at once. It is Hantle!' Mr. Ogilvy said in an ecstasy to himself, "'He had to think of it till he got it, and he got it. The laddie is a genius!' Unquote. Questions and Exercises 1. What is the derivation of the word vocabulary? 2. Briefly discuss any complete speech given in this volume with reference to a. exactness, b. variety, and c. charm in the use of words. 3. Give original examples of the kinds of word studies referred to on pages 337 and 338. 4. Deliver a short talk on any subject, using at least five words which have not been previously in your dynamic vocabulary. 5. Make a list of the unfamiliar words found in any address you may select. 6. Deliver a short extemporaneous speech, giving your opinions on the merits and demerits of the use of unusual words in public speaking. 7. Try to find an example of the overuse of unusual words in a speech. 8. Have you used reference books in word studies? If so, state with what result. 9. Find as many synonyms and antonyms as possible for each of the following words. Excess, rare, severe, beautiful, clear, happy, difference, care, skillful, involve, enmity, profit, absurd, evident, faint, friendly, harmony, hatred, honest, inherent, End of section 27. Chapter 28. Memory Training. Quote, Lulled in the countless chambers of the brain, our thoughts are linked by many a hidden chain. Awake but one, and lo, what myriads rise! Each stamps its image as the other flies. Hail, memory, hail, in thy exhaustless mine, from age to age unnumbered treasures shine. Thought and her shadowy brood thy call obey, and place and time a subject to thy sway. Unquote. Samuel Rogers, Pleasures of Memory. Many an orator, like Thackeray, has made the best part of his speech to himself on the way home from the lecture hall. Presence of mind, it remained for Mark Twain to observe, is greatly promoted by absence of body. A hole in the memory is no less a common complaint than a distressing one. Henry Ward Beecher was able to deliver one of the world's greatest addresses at Liverpool because of his excellent memory. In speaking of the occasion, Mr. Beecher said that all the events, arguments and appeals that he had ever heard or read or written seemed to pass before his mind as oratorical weapons and standing there he had but to reach forth his hand and, quote, seize the weapons as they went smoking by, unquote. Ben Jonson could repeat all he had written. Scaliger memorized the Iliad in three weeks. Locke says, quote, 
Without memory, man is a perpetual infant. Unquote. Quintilian and Aristotle regarded it as a measure of genius. Now all this is very good. We all agree that a reliable memory is an invaluable possession for the speaker. We never dissent for a moment when we are solemnly told that his memory should be a storehouse from which at pleasure he can draw facts, fancies, and illustrations. But can the memory be trained to act as the warder for all the truths that we have gained from thinking, reading, and experience? And if so, how? Let us see. Twenty years ago, a poor immigrant boy, employed as a dishwasher in New York, wandered into the Cooper Union and began to read a copy of Henry George's Progress and Poverty. His passion for knowledge was awakened, and he became a habitual reader. But he found that he was not able to remember what he read, so he began to train his naturally poor memory until he became the world's greatest memory expert. This man was the late Mr. Felix Beryl. Mr. Beryl could tell the population of any town in the world of more than 5,000 inhabitants. He could recall the names of 40 strangers who had just been introduced to him and was able to tell which had been presented 3rd, 8th, 17th, or in any order. He knew the date of every important event in history and could not only recall an endless array of facts but could correlate them perfectly. To what extent Mr. Beryl's remarkable memory was natural and required only attention for its development seems impossible to determine with exactness, but the evidence clearly indicates that, however useless were many of his memory feats, a highly retentive memory was developed where before only a good forgettery existed. The freak memory is not worth striving for, but a good working memory decidedly is. Your power as a speaker will depend to a large extent upon your ability to retain impressions and call them forth when occasion demands, and that sort of memory is like muscle, it responds to training. Heading. What not to do. It is sheer misdirected effort to begin to memorize by learning words by rote, for that is beginning to build a pyramid at the apex. For years our schools were cursed by this vicious system. Vicious not only because it is inefficient, but for the more important reason that it hurts the mind. True, some minds are natively endowed with a wonderful facility in remembering strings of words, facts, and figures. But such are rarely good reasoning minds. The normal person must belabor and force the memory to acquire in this artificial way. Again, it is hurtful to force the memory in hours of physical weakness or mental weariness. Health is the basis of the best mental action, and the operation of memory is no exception. Finally, do not become a slave to a system. Knowledge of a few simple facts of mind and memory will set you to work at the right end of the operation. Use these principles, whether included in a system or not, but do not bind yourself to a method that tends to lay more stress on the way to remember than on the development of memory itself. It is nothing short of ridiculous to memorize ten words in order to remember one fact. Heading The Natural Laws of Memory Concentrated attention at the time when you wish to store the mind is the first step in memorizing and the most important one by far. You forgot the fourth of the list of articles your wife asked you to bring home, chiefly because you allowed your attention to waver for an instant when she was telling you. Attention may not be concentrated attention. When a siphon is charged with gas, it is sufficiently filled with the carbonic acid vapor to make its influence felt. A mind charged with an idea is charged to a degree sufficient to hold it. Too much charging will make the siphon burst. Too much attention to trifles leads to insanity. Adequate attention, then, is the fundamental secret of remembering. Generally, we do not give a fact adequate attention when it does not seem important. Almost everyone has seen how the seeds in an apple point and has memorized the date of Washington's death. 
most of us have, perhaps wisely, forgotten both. The little nick in the bark of a tree is healed over and obliterated in a season, but the gashes in the trees around Gettysburg are still apparent after fifty years. Impressions that are gathered lightly are soon obliterated. Only deep impressions can be recalled at will. Henry Ward Beecher said, quote, One intense hour will do more than dreamy years. Unquote. To memorize ideas and words, concentrate on them until they are fixed firmly and deeply in your mind, and accord to them their true importance. Listen with the mind, and you will remember. How shall you concentrate? How would you increase the fighting effectiveness of a man of war? One vital way would be to increase the size and number of its guns. To strengthen your memory, increase both the number and the force of your mental impressions by attending to them intensely. Loose skimming reading and drifting habits of reading destroy memory power. However, as most books and newspapers do not warrant any other kind of attention, it will not do altogether to condemn this method of reading, but avoid it when you are trying to memorize. Environment has a strong influence upon concentration, until you have learned to be alone in a crowd and undisturbed by clamor. When you set out to memorize a fact or a speech, you may find the task easier away from all sounds and moving objects. All impressions foreign to the one you desire to fix in your mind must be eliminated. The next great step in memorizing is to pick out the essentials of the subject, arrange them in order, and dwell upon them intently. Think clearly of each essential, one after the other. Thinking a thing, not allowing the mind to wander to non-essentials, is really memorizing. Association of Ideas is universally recognized as an essential in memory work. Indeed, whole systems of memory training have been founded on this principle. Many speakers memorize only the outlines of their addresses, filling in the words at the moment of speaking. Some have found it helpful to remember an outline by associating the different points with objects in the room. Speaking on peace, you may wish to dwell on the cost, the cruelty, and the failure of war, and so lead to the justice of arbitration. Before going on the platform, if you will associate four divisions of your outline with four objects in the room, this association may help you to recall them. You may be prone to forget your third point, but you remember that once when you were speaking, the electric lights failed, so arbitrarily the electric light globe will help you to remember failure. Such associations, being unique, tend to stick in the mind. While recently speaking on the six kinds of imagination, the present writer formed them into an acrostic. Visual, auditory, motor, gustatory, olfactory, and tactile furnished the nonsense word vamgut, but the six points were easily remembered. In the same way that children are taught to remember the spelling of teasing words, separate comes from separ, and as an automobile driver remembers that two C's and then two H's lead him into Castor Road, Cotman Street, Haynes Street, and Henry Street, so important points in your address may be fixed in mind by arbitrary symbols invented by yourself. The very work of devising the scheme is a memory action. The psychological process is simple. It is one of noting intently the steps by which a fact, or a truth, or even a word has come to you. Take advantage of this tendency of the mind to remember by association. Repetition is a powerful aid to memory. Thurlow Weed, the journalist and political leader, was troubled because he so easily forgot the names of persons he met from day to day. He corrected the weakness, relates Professor William James, by forming the habit of attending carefully to names he had heard during the day, and then repeating them to his wife every evening. Doubtless Mrs. Weed was heroically long-suffering, but the device worked admirably. After reading a passage you would remember, 
Close the book, reflect, and repeat the contents, aloud if possible. Reading thoughtfully aloud has been found by many to be a helpful memory practice. Write what you wish to remember. This is simply one more way of increasing the number and strength of your mental impressions by utilizing all your avenues of impression. It will help to fix a speech in your mind if you speak it aloud, listen to it, write it out, and look at it intently. You have then impressed it on your mind by means of vocal, auditory, muscular, and visual impressions. Some folk have peculiarly distinct auditory memories. They are able to recall things heard much better than things seen. Others have the visual memory. They are best able to recall sight impressions. As you recall a walk you have taken, are you able to remember better the sights or the sounds? Find out what kinds of impressions your memory retains best and use them the most. To fix an idea in mind, use every possible kind of impression. Daily habit is a great memory cultivator. Learn a lesson from the marathon runner. Regular exercise, though never so little daily, will strengthen your memory in a surprising manner. Try to describe in detail the dress, looks, and manner of the people you pass on the street. Observe the room you are in. Close your eyes and describe its contents. View closely the landscape and write out a detailed description of it. How much did you miss? Notice the contents of the show windows on the street. How many features are you able to recall? Continual practice in this feat may develop in you as remarkable proficiency as it did in Robert Houdin and his son. The daily memorizing of a beautiful passage in literature will not only lend strength to the memory, but will store the mind with gems for quotations. But whether by little or much, add daily to your memory power by practice. Memorize out of doors, the buoyancy of the wood, the shore, or the stormy night on deserted streets may freshen your mind as it does the minds of countless others. Lastly, cast out fear. Tell yourself that you can, and will, and do remember. By pure exercise of selfism, assert your mastery. Be obsessed with the fear of forgetting, and you cannot remember. Practice the reverse. Throw aside your manuscript crutches. You may tumble once or twice, but what matters that, for you are going to learn to walk and leap and run. Heading. Memorizing a speech. Now let us try to put into practice the foregoing suggestions. First, reread this chapter, noting the nine ways by which memorizing may be helped. Then read over the following selection from Beecher, applying so many of the suggestions as are practicable. Get the spirit of the selection firmly in your mind. Make mental note of, write down if you must, the succession of ideas. Now memorize the thought. Then memorize the outline, the order in which the different ideas are expressed. Finally, memorize the exact wording. No, when you have done all this with the most faithful attention to directions, you will not find memorizing easy, unless you have previously trained your memory, or it is naturally retentive. Only by constant practice will memory become strong and only by continually observing these same principles will it remain strong. You will, however, have made a beginning, and that is no mean matter. Quote, Heading, The Reign of the Common People I do not suppose that if you were to go and look upon the experiment of self-government in America, you would have a very high opinion of it. I have not either, if I just look upon the surface of things. Why, men will say, it stands to reason that sixty million ignorant of law, ignorant of constitutional history, ignorant of jurisprudence, of finance and taxes and tariffs and forms of currency, sixty million people that never studied these things are not fit to rule. Your diplomacy is as complicated as ours, and is the most complicated on earth, for all things grow in complexity as they develop toward a higher condition. What fitness is there in these people? 
Well, it is not democracy merely. It is a representative democracy. Our people do not vote in mass for anything. They pick out captains of thought. They pick out the men that do know, and they send them to the legislature to think for them, and then the people afterwards ratify or disallow them. But when you come to the legislature, I am bound to confess that the thing does not look very much more cheering on the outside. Do they really select the best men? Yes, in times of danger they do very generally, but in ordinary time kissing goes by favour. You know what the duty of a regular Republican Democratic legislator is? It is to go back again next winter. His second duty is what? His second duty is to put himself under that extraordinary providence that takes care of legislators' salaries. The old miracle of the profit and the meal and the oil is outdone immeasurably in our days, for they go there poor one year and go home rich. In four years they become money-lenders, all by a trust in that gracious providence that takes care of legislators' salaries. Their next duty after that is to serve the party that sent them up, and then, if there is anything left of them, it belongs to the commonwealth. Someone has said very wisely that if a man travelling wishes to relish his dinner, he had better not go into the kitchen to see where it is cooked. If a man wishes to respect and obey the law, he had better not go to the legislature to see where that is cooked. Unquote. Henry Ward Beecher from a lecture delivered in Exeter Hall, London, 1886, when making his last tour of Great Britain. Heading, In Case of Trouble But what are you to do if, notwithstanding all your efforts, you should forget your points, and your mind for the minute becomes blank? This is a deplorable condition that sometimes arises, and must be dealt with. Obviously you can sit down and admit defeat, such a consummation is devoutly to be shunned. Walking slowly across the platform may give you time to grip yourself, compose your thoughts, and stave off disaster. Perhaps the surest and most practical method is to begin a new sentence with your last important word. This is not advocated as a method of composing a speech. It is merely an extreme measure which may save you in tight circumstances. It is like the fire department, the less you must use it the better. If this method is followed very long, you are likely to find yourself talking about plum pudding or Chinese Gordon in the most unexpected manner, so of course you will get back to your lines the earliest moment that your feet have hit the platform. Let us see how this plan works. Obviously your extemporized words will lack somewhat of polish. But in such a pass, crudity is better than failure. Now you have come to a dead wall after saying, quote, Joan of Arc fought for liberty, unquote. By this method you might get something like this, quote, Liberty is a sacred privilege for which mankind always had to fight. These struggles, platitude, but push on, fill the pages of history. History records the gradual triumph of the serf over the lord, the slave over the master. The master has continually tried to usurp unlimited powers. Power during the medieval ages accrued to the owner of the land with a spear and a strong castle. But the strong castle and spear were of little avail after the discovery of gunpowder. Gunpowder was the greatest boon that liberty had ever known." Unquote. Thus far you have linked one idea with another rather obviously, but you are getting your second wind now, and may venture to relax your grip on the too evident chain. And so you say, quote, With gunpowder the humblest serf in all the land could put an end to the life of the tyrannical baron behind the castle walls. The struggle for liberty, with gunpowder as its aid, wrecked empires, and built up a new era for all mankind. Unquote. In a moment more you have gotten back to your outline and the day is saved. Practicing exercises like the above will not only fortify you against the death of your speech when your memory misses fire, but will also provide an excellent training for fluency in speaking. Stock up with ideas. 
Heading, Questions and Exercises. 1. Pick out and state briefly the nine helps to memorizing suggested in this chapter. 2. Report on whatever success you may have had with any of the plans for memory culture suggested in this chapter. Have any been less successful than others? 3. Freely criticize any of the suggested methods. 4. Give an original example of memory by association of ideas. 5. List in order the chief ideas of any speech in this volume. 6. Repeat them from memory. 7. Expand them into a speech using your own words. 8. Illustrate practically what you would do if in the middle of a speech on progress your memory failed you and you stopped suddenly on the following sentence. Quote, the last century saw marvellous progress in varied lines of activity. Unquote. 9. How many quotations that fit well in the speaker's tall chest can you recall from memory? 10. Memorize the poem on page 42. How much time does it require? End of section 28. Chapter 29. Right Thinking and Personality. Quote, Whatever crushes individuality is despotism, by whatever name it may be called. Unquote. John Stuart Mill on Liberty. Quote, right thinking fits for complete living by developing the power to appreciate the beautiful in nature and art, power to think the true and to will the good, power to live the life of thought and faith and hope and love. N.C. Schaeffer, Thinking and Learning to Think. The speaker's most valuable possession is personality, that indefinable, imponderable something which sums up what we are and makes us different from others, that distinctive force of self which operates appreciably on those whose lives we touch. It is personality alone that makes us long for higher things, rob us of our sense of individual life with its gains and losses, its duties and joys, and we grovel. Quote, Few human creatures, said John Stuart Mill, will consent to be changed into any of the lower animals for a promise of the fullest allowance of a beast's pleasures. No intelligent human being would consent to be a fool. No instructed person would be an ignoramus. No person of feeling and conscience would be selfish and base, even though he should be persuaded that the fool, or the dunce, or the rascal is better satisfied with his lot than they with theirs. It is better to be a human being dissatisfied than a pig satisfied. Better to be a Socrates dissatisfied than a fool satisfied. And if the fool or the pig is of a different opinion, it is only because they know only their own side of the question. The other party to the comparison knows both sides. Unquote. Now, it is precisely because the Socrates type of person lives on the plan of right thinking and restrained feeling and willing that he prefers his state to that of the animal. All that a man is, all his happiness, his sorrow, his achievements, his failures, his magnetism, his weakness, all are in an amazingly large measure the direct results of his thinking. Thought and heart combine to produce right thinking. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. As he does not think in his heart, so he can never become. Since this is true, personality can be developed, and its latent powers brought out by careful cultivation. We have long since ceased to believe that we are living in a realm of chance. So clear and exact are nature's laws that we forecast, scores of years in advance, the appearance of a certain comet, and foretell to the minute an eclipse of the sun. And we understand this law of cause and effect in all our material realms. We do not plant potatoes and expect to pluck hyacinths. The law is universal. It applies to our mental powers, to morality, to personality, quite as much as to the heavenly bodies and the grain of the fields. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap, and nothing else. Character has always been regarded as one of the chief factors of the speaker's power. 
Cato defined the orator as Wibonus dicendi peritus, a good man skilled in speaking. Phillips Brooks says, quote, Nobody can truly stand as an utterer before the world unless he be profoundly living and earnestly thinking. Unquote. Quote, Character, says Emerson, is a natural power like light and heat, and all nature cooperates with it. The reason why we feel one man's presence and do not feel another's is as simple as gravity. Truth is the summit of being. Justice is the application of it to affairs. All individual natures stand in a scale, according to the purity of this element in them. The will of the pure runs down into other natures, as water runs down from the higher into a lower vessel. This natural force is no more to be withstood than any other natural force. Character is nature in the highest form. Unquote. It is absolutely impossible for impure, bestial, and selfish thoughts to blossom into loving and altruistic habits. Thistle seeds bring forth only the thistle. Contrariwise, it is entirely impossible for continual altruistic, sympathetic, and serviceful thoughts to bring forth a low and vicious character. Either thoughts or feelings proceed and determine all our actions. Actions develop into habits, habits constitute character, and character determines destiny. Therefore, to guard our thoughts and control our feelings is to shape our destinies. The syllogism is complete, and old as it is, it is still true. Since character is nature in the highest form, the development of character must proceed on natural lines. The garden left to itself will bring forth weeds and scrawny plants, but the flower beds nurtured carefully will blossom into fragrance and beauty. As the student entering college largely determines his vocation by choosing from the different courses of the curriculum, so do we choose our characters by choosing our thoughts. We are steadily going up toward that which we most wish for or steadily sinking to the level of our low desires. What we secretly cherish in our hearts is a symbol of what we shall receive. Our trains of thoughts are hurrying us on to our destiny. When you see the flag fluttering to the south, you know the wind is coming from the north. When you see the straws and papers being carried to the northward, you realize the wind is blowing out of the south. It is just as easy to ascertain a man's thoughts by observing the tendency of his character. Let it not be suspected for one moment that all this is merely a preachment on the question of morals. It is that, but much more, for it touches the whole man, his imaginative nature, his ability to control his feelings, the mastery of his thinking faculties, and, perhaps most largely, his power to will and to carry his volitions into effective action. Right thinking constantly assumes that the will sits enthroned to execute the dictates of mind, conscience, and heart. Never tolerate for an instant the suggestion that your will is not absolutely efficient. The way to will is to will, and the very first time you are tempted to break a worthy resolution, and you will be, you may be certain of that, make your fight, then and there. You cannot afford to lose that fight. You must win it. Don't swerve for an instant, but keep that resolution if it kills you. It will not, but you must fight, just as though life depended on the victory, and indeed your personality may actually lie in the balances. Your success or failure as a speaker will be determined very largely by your thoughts and your mental attitude. The present writer had a student of limited education enter one of his classes in public speaking. He proved to be a very poor speaker, and the instructor could conscientiously do little but point out faults. However, the young man was warned not to be discouraged. With sorrow in his voice, and the essence of earnestness beaming from his eyes, he replied, I will not be discouraged. I want so badly to know how to speak. It was warm, human, and from the very heart. And he did keep on trying, and developed into a creditable speaker. 
There is no power under the stars that can defeat a man with that attitude. He who down in the deeps of his heart earnestly longs to get facility in speaking and is willing to make the sacrifices necessary will reach his goal. Ask, and ye shall receive. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you, is indeed applicable to those who would acquire speech power. You will not realize the prize that you wish for languidly, but the goal that you start out to attain, with the spirit of the old guard that dies but never surrenders, you will surely reach. Your belief in your ability and your willingness to make sacrifices for that belief are the double index to your future achievements. Lincoln had a dream of his possibilities as a speaker. He transmuted that dream into life solely because he walked many miles to borrow books which he read by the log-fire glow at night. He sacrificed much to realize his vision. Livingston had a great faith in his ability to serve the benighted races of Africa. To actualize that faith, he gave up all. Leaving England for the interior of the dark continent, he struck the death blow to Europe's profits from the slave trade. Joan of Arc had great self-confidence, glorified by an infinite capacity for sacrifice. She drove the English beyond the Loire and stood beside Charles while he was crowned. These all realize their strongest desires. The law is universal. Desire greatly, and you shall achieve. Sacrifice much, and you shall obtain. Stanton Davis Kirkham has beautifully expressed this thought. Quote, you may be keeping accounts, and presently you shall walk out of the door that has for so long seemed to you the barrier of your ideals, and shall find yourself before an audience, the pen still behind your ear, the ink stains on your fingers, and then and there shall pour out the torrent of your inspiration. You may be driving sheep, and you shall wander to the city, bucolic and open-mouthed, shall wander under the intrepid guidance of the spirit into the studio of the master, and after a time he shall say, I have nothing more to teach you. And now you have become the master, who did so recently dream of great things while driving sheep. You shall lay down the saw and the plane to take upon yourself the regeneration of the world. Unquote. Questions and Exercises 1. What, in your own words, is personality? 2. How does personality in a speaker affect you as a listener? 3. In what ways does personality show itself in a speaker? 4. Deliver a short speech on The Power of Will in the Public Speaker. 5. Deliver a short address based on any sentence you choose from this chapter. End of section 29. Chapter 30. After Dinner and Other Occasional Speaking. Quote, the perception of the ludicrous is a pledge of sanity. Unquote. Ralph Waldo Emerson, Essays. Quote, and let him be sure to leave other men their turns to speak. Unquote. Francis Bacon, Essay on Civil and Moral Discourse. Perhaps the most brilliant and certainly the most entertaining of all speeches are those delivered on after dinner and other special occasions. The air of well-fed content in the former, and of expectancy well primed in the latter, furnishes an audience which, though not readily won, is prepared for the best, while the speaker himself is pretty sure to have been chosen for his gifts of oratory. The first essential of good occasional speaking is to study the occasion. Precisely what is the object of the meeting? How important is the occasion to the audience? How large will the audience be? What sort of people are they? How large is the auditorium? Who selects the speaker's themes? Who else is to speak? What are they to speak about? Precisely how long am I to speak? Who speaks before I do and who follows? If you want to hit the nail on the head, ask such questions as these. Footnote, see also page 205. No occasional address can succeed unless it fits the occasion to a T. 
many prominent men have lost prestige because they were too careless or too busy or too self-confident to respect the occasion and the audience by learning the exact conditions under which they were to speak leaving too much to the moment is taking a long chance and generally means a less effective speech if not a failure suitability is the big thing in an occasional speech when mark twain addressed the army of the tennessee in reunion at chicago in eighteen seventy seven he responded to the toast the babies two things in the after-dinner speech are remarkable the bright introduction by which he subtly claimed the interest of all and the humorous use of military terms throughout Quote, mr chairman and gentlemen the babies now that's something like we haven't all had the good fortune to be ladies we have not all been generals or poets or statesmen but when the toast works down to the babies we stand on common ground for we've all been babies it is a shame that for a thousand years the world's banquets have utterly ignored the baby as if he didn't amount to anything if you gentlemen will stop and think a minute if you'll go back fifty or a hundred years to your early married life and recontemplate your first baby you will remember that he amounted to a good deal and even something over Unquote. Quote, as a vessel is known by the sound whether it be cracked or not said demosthenes so men are proved by their speeches whether they be wise or foolish Unquote. Surely the occasional address furnishes a severe test of a speaker's wisdom. To be trivial on a serious occasion, to be funereal at a banquet, to be long-winded ever, these are the marks of nonsense. Some imprudent souls seem to select the most friendly of after-dinner occasions for the explosion of a bombshell of dispute around the dinner-table it is the custom of even political enemies to bury their hatchets anywhere rather than in some convenient skull it is the height of bad taste to raise questions that in hours consecrated to good will can only irritate occasional speeches offer good chances for humour particularly the funny story for humour with a genuine point is not trivial but do not spin a whole skein of humorous yarns with no more connection than the inane and threadbare and that reminds me an anecdote without bearing may be funny but one less funny that fits theme and occasion is far preferable there is no way short of sheer power of speech that so surely leads to the heart of an audience as rich appropriate humour the scattered diners in a great banqueting hall the after-dinner lethargy the anxiety over approaching last train time the overfull list of overfull speakers all throw out a challenge to the speaker to do his best to win an interested hearing and when success does come it is usually due to a happy mixture of seriousness and humour for humour alone rarely scores so heavily as the two combined, while the utterly grave speech never does on such occasions. If there is one place more than another where second-hand opinions and platitudes are unwelcome, it is in the after-dinner speech. Whether you are toastmaster or the last speaker to try to hold the waning crowd at midnight, be as original as you can how is it possible to summarize the qualities that go to make up the good after-dinner speech when we remember the inimitable serious drollery of mark twain the sweet southern eloquence of henry w grady the funereal gravity of the humorous charles Battelle loomis the charm of henry van dyke the geniality of f hopkinson smith and the all-round delightfulness of chauncey m depew america is literally rich in such gladsome speakers who punctuate real sense with nonsense and so make both effective commemorative occasions unveilings commencements dedications eulogies and all the train of special public gatherings offer rare opportunities for the display of tact and good sense in handling occasion theme and audience 
when to be dignified and when colloquial, when to soar and when to ramble arm in arm with your hearers, when to flame and when to soothe, when to instruct and when to amuse. In a word, the whole matter of appropriateness must constantly be in mind lest you write your speech on water. Finally, remember the beatitude. Blessed is the man that maketh short speeches, for he shall be invited to speak again. Heading Selections for Study Title Last Days of the Confederacy Extract Quote The Rapidan suggests another scene to which allusion has often been made since the war, but which, as illustrative also of the spirit of both armies, I may be permitted to recall in this connection. In the mellow twilight of an April day, the two armies were holding their dress parades on the opposite hills bordering the river. At the close of the parade, a magnificent brass band of the Union Army played with great spirit the patriotic airs Hail Columbia and Yankee Doodle, whereupon the Federal troops responded with a patriotic shout. The same band then played the soul-stirring strains of Dixie, to which a mighty response came from ten thousand southern troops. A few moments later, when the stars had come out as witnesses, and when all nature was in harmony, there came from the same band the old melody, Home Sweet Home. As its familiar and pathetic notes rolled over the water and thrilled through the spirits of the soldiers, the hills reverberated with a thundering response from the united voices of both armies. What was there in this old, old music to so touch the chords of sympathy, so thrill the spirits and cause the frames of brave men to tremble with emotion? It was the thought of home. To thousands, doubtless, it was the thought of that eternal home to which the next battle might be the gateway. To thousands of others, it was the thought of their dear earthly homes, where loved ones at that twilight hour were bowing round the family altar and asking God's care over the absent soldier boy. Unquote. General J. B. Gordon, CSA Title, Welcome to Kasuth Extract Quote, Let me ask you to imagine that the contest in which the United States asserted their independence of Great Britain had been unsuccessful, that our armies, through treason or a league of tyrants against us, had been broken and scattered, that the great men who led them and who swayed our councils, our Washington, our Franklin, and the venerable President of the American Congress, had been driven forth as exiles. If there had existed at that day, in any part of the civilized world, a powerful republic with institutions resting on the same foundations of liberty which our own countrymen sought to establish, would there have been in that republic any hospitality too cordial, any sympathy too deep, any zeal for their glorious but unfortunate cause too fervent or too active to be shown toward these illustrious fugitives? Gentlemen, the case I have supposed is before you. The Washingtons, the Franklins, the Hancocks of Hungary, driven out by a far worse tyranny than was ever endured here, are wanderers in foreign lands. Some of them have sought a refuge in our country. One sits with this company our guest tonight, and we must measure the duty we owe them by the same standard which we would have had history apply if our ancestors had met with a fate like theirs." Unquote. William Cullen Bryant Title, The Influence of Universities Extract Quote, when the excitement of party warfare presses dangerously near our national safeguards, I would have the intelligent conservatism of our universities and colleges warn the contestants in impressive tones against the perils of a breach impossible to repair. When popular discontent and passion are stimulated by the arts of designing partisans to a pitch perilously near to class hatred or sectional anger, I would have our universities and colleges sound the alarm in the name of American brotherhood and fraternal dependence. 
when the attempt is made to delude the people into the belief that their suffrages can change the operation of national laws i would have our universities and colleges proclaim that those laws are inexorable and far removed from political control when selfish interest seeks undue private benefits through governmental aid and public places are claimed as rewards of party service i would have our universities and colleges persuade the people to a relinquishment of the demand for party spoils and exhort them to a disinterested and patriotic love of their government whose unperverted operation secures to every citizen his just share of the safety and prosperity it holds in store for all i would have the influence of these institutions on the side of religion and morality i would have those they send out among the people not ashamed to acknowledge god and to proclaim his interposition in the affairs of men enjoining such obedience to his laws as makes manifest the path of national perpetuity and prosperity Unquote. Grover Cleveland, delivered at the Princeton Sesquicentennial, 1896. Title, Eulogy of Garfield. Extract. Quote, great in life, he was surpassingly great in death. For no cause, in the very frenzy of wantonness and wickedness, by the red hand of murder, he was thrust from the full tide of this world's interest, from its hopes, its aspirations, its victories, into the visible presence of death, and he did not quail. Not alone for the one short moment in which, stunned and dazed, he could give up life, hardly aware of its relinquishment, but through days of deadly languor, through weeks of agony, that was not less agony because silently borne, with clear sight and calm courage, he looked into his open grave. What blight and ruin met his anguished eyes, whose lips may tell what brilliant broken plans, what baffled high ambitions, what sundering of strong, warm manhood's friendships, what bitter rending of sweet household ties. Behind him a proud, expectant nation, a great host of sustaining friends, a cherished and happy mother, wearing the full, rich honours of her early toil and tears, the wife of his youth, whose whole life lay in his, the little boys not yet emerged from childhood's day of frolic, the fair young daughter, the sturdy sons just springing into closest companionship, claiming every day and every day rewarding a father's love and care, and in his heart the eager, rejoicing power to meet all demand. Before him desolation and great darkness, and his soul was not shaken. His countrymen were thrilled with instant, profound, and universal sympathy. Masterful in his mortal weakness, he became the centre of a nation's love, enshrined in the prayers of a world. But all the love and all the sympathy could not share with him his suffering. He trod the winepress alone. With unfaltering front, he faced death. With unfailing tenderness, he took leave of life. Above the demoniac hiss of the assassin's bullet, he heard the voice of God. With simple resignation, he bowed to the divine decree. James G. Blaine delivered at the memorial service held by the U.S. Senate and House of Representatives. Title, Eulogy of Lee, Extract At the bottom of all true heroism is unselfishness. Its crowning expression is sacrifice. The world is suspicious of vaunted heroes, but when the true hero has come, and we know that here he is in verity, ah, how the hearts of men leap forth to greet him! How worshipfully we welcome God's noblest work, the strong, honest, fearless, upright man! In Robert Lee was such a hero vouchsafed to us and to mankind, and whether we behold him declining command of the Federal Army to fight the battles and share the miseries of his own people, proclaiming on the heights in front of Gettysburg that the fault of the disaster was his own, leading charges in the crisis of combat, 
walking under the yoke of conquest without a murmur of complaint, or refusing fortune to come here and train the youth of his country in the paths of duty, he is ever the same meek, grand, self-sacrificing spirit. Here he exhibited qualities not less worthy and heroic than those displayed on the broad and open theatre of conflict, when the eyes of nations watched his every action. Here, in the calm repose of civil and domestic duties, and in the trying routine of incessant tasks, he lived a life as high as when, day by day, he marshalled and led his thin and wasting lines, and slept by night upon the field that was to be drenched again in blood upon the morrow. And now he has vanished from us for ever. And is this all that is left of him, this handful of dust beneath the marble stone? No, the ages answer as they rise from the gulfs of time, where lie the wrecks of kingdoms and estates, holding up in their hands as their only trophies the names of those who have wrought for man in the love and fear of God and in love, unfearing for their fellow men. No, the present answers, bending by his tomb. No, the future answers, as the breath of the morning fans its radiant brow, and its soul drinks in sweet inspirations from the lovely life of Lee. No, methinks the very heavens echo, as melt into their depths the words of reverent love that voice the hearts of men to the tingling stars. Come we then today in loyal love to sanctify our memories, to purify our hopes, to make strong all good intent by communion with the spirit of him who, being dead, yet speaketh. Come, child, in thy spotless innocence. Come, woman, in thy purity. Come, youth, in thy prime. Come, manhood, in thy strength. Come, age, in thy ripe wisdom. Come, citizen, come, soldier, let us strew the roses and lilies of June around his tomb, for he, like them, exhaled in his life nature's beneficence, and the grave has consecrated that life and given it to us all. Let us crown his tomb with the oak, the emblem of his strength, and, with the laurel, the emblem of his glory and let these guns whose voices he knew of old awake the echoes of the mountains that nature herself may join in his solemn requiem come for here he rests and on this green bank by this fair stream we set to-day a votive stone that memory may his deeds redeem when like our sires our sons are gone Unquote. john warwick daniel on the unveiling of Lee's statue at Washington and Lee University, Lexington, Virginia, 1883. Questions and Exercises 1. Why should humour find a place in after-dinner speaking? 2. Briefly give your impressions of any notable after-dinner address that you have heard. 3. Briefly outline an imaginary occasion of any sort and give three subjects appropriate for addresses. 4. Deliver one such address, not to exceed ten minutes in length. 5. What proportion of emotional ideas do you find in the extracts given in this chapter? 6. Humour was used in some of the foregoing addresses. In which others would it have been inappropriate? 7. Prepare and deliver an after-dinner speech suited to one of the following occasions, and be sure to use humour. A lodge banquet, a political party dinner, a church men's club dinner, a civic association banquet, a banquet in honour of a celebrity, a woman's club annual dinner, a business men's association dinner, a manufacturer's club dinner, an alumni banquet an old home week barbecue end of section 30 chapter 31 making conversation effective quote in conversation avoid the extremes of forwardness and reserve unquote cato quote conversation is the laboratory and workshop of the student unquote emerson essays circles 
The father of W. E. Gladstone considered conversation to be both an art and an accomplishment. Around the dinner table in his home, some topic of local or national interest, or some debated question, was constantly being discussed. In this way, a friendly rivalry for supremacy in conversation arose among the family, and an incident observed in the street, an idea gleaned from a book, a deduction from personal experience, was carefully stored as material for the family exchange. Thus his early years of practice in elegant conversation prepared the younger Gladstone for his career as a leader and speaker. There is a sense in which the ability to converse effectively is efficient public speaking, for our conversation is often heard by many, and occasionally decisions of great moment hinge upon the tone and quality of what we say in private. Indeed, conversation in the aggregate probably wields more power than press and platform combined. Socrates taught his great truths not from public rostrums, but in personal converse. Men made pilgrimages to Goethe's library and Coleridge's home to be charmed and instructed by their speech, and the culture of many nations was immeasurably influenced by the thoughts that streamed out from those rich wellsprings. Most of the world-moving speeches are made in the course of conversation. Conferences of diplomats, business-getting arguments, decisions by boards of directors, considerations of corporate policy, all of which influence the political, mercantile, and economic maps of the world, are usually the results of careful, though informal, conversation. And the man whose opinions weigh in such crises is he who has first carefully pondered the words of both antagonist and protagonist. However important it may be to attain self-control in light social converse or about the family table, it is undeniably vital to have oneself perfectly in hand while taking part in a momentous conference. Then the hints that we have given on poise, alertness, precision of word, clearness of statement, and force of utterance with respect to public speech are equally applicable to conversation. The form of nervous egotism, for it is both, that suddenly ends in flusters just when the vital words need to be uttered, is the sign of coming defeat, for a conversation is often a contest. If you feel this tendency embarrassing you, be sure to listen to Holmes's advice. Quote, and when you stick on conversational burrs, don't strew your pathway with those dreadful errs. Unquote. Here bring your will into action, for your trouble is a wandering attention. You must force your mind to persist along the chosen line of conversation, and resolutely refuse to be diverted by any subject or happening that may unexpectedly pop up to distract you. To fail here is to lose effectiveness utterly. Concentration is the keynote of conversational charm and efficiency. The haphazard habit of expression that uses birdshot when a bullet is needed ensures missing the game, for diplomacy of all sorts rests upon the precise application of precise words, particularly, if one may paraphrase Talleyrand, in those crises when language is no longer used to conceal thought. We may frequently gain new light on old subjects by looking at word derivations. Conversation signifies in the original a turnabout exchange of ideas, yet most people seem to regard it as a monologue. Bronson Alcott used to say that many could argue but few converse. The first thing to remember in conversation, then, is that listening, respectful, sympathetic, alert listening, is not only due to our fellow converser, but due to ourselves. Many a reply loses its point because the speaker is so much interested in what he is about to say that it is really no reply at all, but merely an irritating and humiliating irrelevancy. Self-expression is exhilarating. This explains the eternal impulse to decorate totem poles and paint pictures, write poetry and expound philosophy. One of the chief delights of conversation is the opportunity it affords for self-expression. 
a good conversationalist who monopolizes all the conversation will be voted a bore because he denies others the enjoyment of self-expression while a mediocre talker who listens interestedly may be considered a good conversationalist because he permits his companions to please themselves through self-expression they are praised who please they please who listen well the first step in remedying habits of confusion in manner awkward bearing vagueness in thought and lack of precision in utterance is to recognize your faults if you are serenely unconscious of them no one least of all yourself can help you but once diagnose your own weaknesses and you can overcome them by doing four things one will to overcome them and keep on willing two hold yourself in hand by assuring yourself that you know precisely what you ought to say if you cannot do that be quiet until you are clear on this vital point three having thus assured yourself cast out the fear of those who listen to you they are only human and will respect your words if you really have something to say and say it briefly simply and clearly four have the courage to study the english language until you are master of at least its simpler forms heading conversational hints choose some subject that will prove of general interest to the whole group do not explain the mechanism of a gas engine at an afternoon tea or the culture of hollyhocks at a stag party it is not considered good taste for a man to bear his arm in public and show scars or deformities it is equally bad form for him to flaunt his own woes or the deformity of someone else's character the public demands plays and stories that end happily all the world is seeking happiness they cannot long be interested in your ills and troubles george cohan made himself a millionaire before he was thirty by writing cheerful plays one of his rules is generally applicable to conversation always leave them laughing when you say good-bye dynamite the i out of your conversation not one man in nine hundred and seven can talk about himself without being a bore the man who can perform that feat can achieve marvels without talking about himself so the eternal eye is not permissible even in his talk if you habitually build your conversation around your own interests it may prove very tiresome to your listener he may be thinking of bird dogs or dry fly fishing while you are discussing the fourth dimension or the merits of a cucumber lotion the charming conversationalist is prepared to talk in terms of his listener's interest if his listener spends his spare time investigating guernsey cattle or agitating social reforms the discriminating conversationalist shapes his remarks accordingly richard washburn child says he knows a man of mediocre ability who can charm men much abler than himself when he discusses electric lighting the same man probably would bore and be bored if he were forced to converse about music or madagascar avoid platitudes and hackneyed phrases if you meet a friend from keokuk on state street or on pike's peak it is not necessary to observe how small this world is after all this observation was doubtless made prior to the formation of pike's peak this old world is getting better every day fanner's wives do not have to work as hard as formerly it is not so much the high cost of living as the cost of high living such observations as these excite about the same degree of admiration as is drawn out by the appearance of a 1903 model touring car if you have nothing fresh or interesting you can always remain silent how would you like to read a newspaper that flashed out in bold headlines nice weather we are having or daily gave columns to the same old material you had been reading week after week questions and exercises one give a short speech describing the conversational bore two in a few words give your idea of a charming converser three what qualities of the orator should not be used in conversation 
4. Give a short humorous delineation of the conversational oracle. 5. Give an account of your first day at observing conversation around you. 6. Give an account of one day's effort to improve your own conversation. 7. Give a list of subjects you heard discussed during any recent period you may select. 8. What is meant by elastic touch in conversation? 9. Make a list of bromides, as Galette Burgess called those threadbare expressions which bore us to extinction, itself a bromide. 10. What causes a phrase to become hackneyed? 11. Define the words A. Trite B. Solecism C. Colloquialism D. Slang E. Vulgarism F. Neologism 12. What constitutes pretentious talk? End of section 31. Appendix A. 50 questions for debate. 1. Has labor unionism justified its existence? 2. Should all church printing be brought out under the union label? 3. Is the open shop a benefit to the community? 4. Should arbitration of industrial disputes be made compulsory? 5. Is profit sharing a solution of the wage problem? 6. Is a minimum wage law desirable? 7. Should the eight-hour day be made universal in America? 8. Should the state compensate those who sustain irreparable business loss because of the enactment of laws prohibiting the manufacture and sale of intoxicating drinks? 9. Should public utilities be owned by the municipality? 10. Should marginal trading in stocks be prohibited? 11. Should the national government establish a compulsory system of old age insurance by taxing the incomes of those to be benefited? 12. Would the triumph of socialistic principles result in deadening personal ambition? 13. Is the presidential system a better form of government for the United States than the parliamental system? 14. Should our legislation be shaped toward the gradual abandonment of the protective tariff? 15. Should the government of the larger cities be vested solely in a commission of not more than nine men elected by the voters at large? 16. Should national banks be permitted to issue, subject to tax and government supervision, notes based on their general assets? 17. Should woman be given the ballot on the present basis of suffrage for men? 18. Should the present basis of suffrage be restricted? 19. Is the hope of permanent world peace a delusion? 20. Should the United States send a diplomatic representative to the Vatican? 21. Should the powers of the world substitute an international police for national standing armies? 22. Should the United States maintain the Monroe Doctrine? 23. Should the recall of judges be adopted? 24. Should the initiative and referendum be adopted as a national principle? 25. Is it desirable that the national government should own all railroads operating in interstate territory? 26. Is it desirable that the national government should own interstate telegraph and telephone systems? 27. Is the national prohibition of the liquor traffic an economic necessity? 28. Should the United States Army and Navy be greatly strengthened? 29. Should the same standards of altruism obtain in the relations of nations as in those of individuals? 30. Should our government be more highly centralized? 31. Should the United States continue its policy of opposing the combination of railroads?
32. In case of personal injury to a workman arising out of his employment, should his employer be liable for adequate compensation and be forbidden to set up as a defence a plea of contributory negligence on the part of the workman or the negligence of a fellow workman? 33. Should all corporations doing an interstate business be required to take out a federal license? 34. Should the amount of property that can be transferred by inheritance be limited by law? 35. Should equal compensation for equal labor between women and men universally prevail? 36. Does equal suffrage tend to lessen the interest of woman in her home? 37. Should the United States take advantage of the commercial and industrial weakness of foreign nations, brought about by the war, by trying to wrest from them their markets in Central and South America? 38. Should teachers of small children in the public schools be selected from among mothers? 39. Should football be restricted to colleges for the sake of physical safety? 40. Should college students who receive compensation for playing summer baseball be debarred from amateur standing? 41. Should daily school hours and school vacations both be shortened? 42. Should home study for pupils in grade schools be abolished and longer school hours substituted? 43. Should the honor system in examinations be adopted in public high schools? 44. Should all colleges adopt the self-government system for its students? 45. Should colleges be classified by national law and supervision and uniform entrance and graduation requirements maintained by each college in a particular class? 46. Should ministers be required to spend a term of years in some trade, business, or profession before becoming pastors? 47. Is the YMCA losing its spiritual power? 48. Is the church losing its hold on thinking people? 49. Are the people of the United States more devoted to religion than ever? 50. Does the reading of magazines contribute to intellectual shallowness? End of section 32. Section 33. Appendix B. 30 themes for speeches. With source references for material. 1. Kinship, a foundation stone of civilization. The State, Woodrow Wilson. 2. Initiative and Referendum. The Popular Initiative and Referendum, O. M. Barnes. 3. Reciprocity with Canada. Article in Independent, 53, 2874. Article in North American Review, 178, 205. 4. Is Mankind Progressing? Book of same title, M. M. Ballou. 5. Moses, the peerless leader. Lecture by John Lord in Beacon, Lights of History. Note, this set of books contains a vast store of material for speeches. 6. The Spoils System. Sermon by the Reverend Dr. Henry Van Dyke, reported in the New York Tribune, February 25, 1895. 7. The Negro in Business. Part 3. Annual Report of the Secretary of Internal Affairs, Pennsylvania, 1912. 8. Immigration and Degradation. Americans or Aliens? Howard B. Groves. 9. What is the theatre doing for America? The Drama Today, Charlton Andrews. 10. Superstition. Curiosities of Popular Custom, William S. Walsh. 11. The Problem of Old Age. Old Age Deferred, Arnold Lorand. 12. Who is the Tramp? Article in Century, 2841. 13. Two Men Inside, 
Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, R. L. Stevenson. 14. The Overthrow of Poverty. The Panacea for Poverty, Madison Peters. 15. Morals and Manners. A Christian's Habits, Robert E. Spear. 16. Jew and Christian. Jesus the Jew, Harold Weinstock. 17. Education and the Moving Picture. Article by J. Berg Asenwein in The Theatre of Science, Robert Grau. 18. Books as Food. Books and Reading, R. C. Cage and Alfred Harcourt. 19. What is a Novel? The Technique of the Novel, Charles F. Holm. 20. Modern Fiction and Modern Life. Article in Lippincott's, October 1907. 21. Our Problem in Mexico. The Real Mexico, Hamilton Fife. 22. The Joy of Receiving. Article in Woman's Home Companion, December 1914. 23. Physical Training versus College Athletics. Article in Literary Digest, November 28, 1914. 24. Cheer Up. The Science of Happiness, Jean Finot. 25. The Square Peg in the Round Hole. The Job, the Man and the Boss, Catherine Blackford and Arthur Newcomb. 26. The Decay of Acting. Article in Current Opinion, November 1914. 27. The Young Man and the Church. A Young Man's Religion, N. McGee Waters. 28. Inheriting Success. Article in Current Opinion, November 1914. 29. The Indian in Oklahoma. Article in Literary Digest, November 28, 1914. 30. Hate and the Nation. Article in Literary Digest, November 14, 1914. End of section 33. Section 34. Appendix C. Suggestive Subjects for Speeches. Footnote. It must be remembered that the phrasing of the subject will not necessarily serve for the title. With occasional hints on treatment. 1. Movies and Morals. 2. The Truth About Lying. The Essence of Truth-Telling and Lying. Lies that are not so considered. The subtleties of distinctions required. Examples of implied and acted lies. 3. Benefits that follow disasters. Benefits that have arisen out of floods, fires, earthquakes, wars, etc. 4. Haste for leisure. How the speed mania is born of a vain desire to enjoy a leisure that never comes, or, on the contrary, how the seeming haste of the world has given men shorter hours of labour and more time for rest, study, and pleasure. 5. St. Paul's Message to New York Truths from the Epistles pertinent to the great cities of today. 6. Education and Crime 7. Loss is the mother of gain. How many men have been content until, losing all, they exerted their best efforts to regain success and succeeded more largely than before? 8. Egoism versus Egotism. 9. Blunders of young fogeyism. 10. The waste of middlemen in charity systems. The cost of collecting funds for and administering help to the needy. The weakness of organized philanthropy as compared with the giving that gives itself. 11. The economy of organized charity. The other side of the picture. 12. Freedom of the press. The true forces that hurtfully control too many newspapers are not those of arbitrary governments, but the corrupting influences of moneyed and political interests, fear of the liquor power, and the desire to please sensation-loving readers. 
13. Helen Keller, Optimist. 14. Back to the Farm, A Study of the Reasons Underlying the Movement. 15. It Was Ever Thus, It Ridiculed the Pessimist Who Is Never Surprised at Seeing Failure. 16. The Vocational High Score. Value of direct training compared with the policy of laying broader foundations for later building. How the two theories work out in practice. Each plan can be especially applied in cases that seem to need special treatment. 17. All kinds of turning done here. A humorous yet serious discussion of the flopping windmill character. 18. The Egoistic Altruist. Herbert Spencer's theory is discussed in The Data of Ethics. 19. How the city menaces the nation. Economic perils in massed population. Show also the other side, signs of the problems being solved. 20. The robust note in modern poetry. A comparison of the work of Galsworthy, Macefield and Kipling with that of some earlier poets. 21. The Ideals of Socialism 22. The Future of the Small City How men are coming to see the economic advantages of smaller municipalities. 23. Censorship for the Theatre Its Relation to Morals and Art, Its Difficulties and Its Benefits 24. For Such a Time as This Mordecai's expression and its application to opportunities in modern woman's life. 25. Is the press venal? 26. Safety first. 27. Means and extremes. 28. Rubicons and pontoons. How great men not only made momentous decisions, but created means to carry them out. A speech full of historical examples. 29. Economy a revenue. 30. The patriotism of protest against popular idols. 31. Savonarola, the divine outcast. 32. The true politician. Revert to the original meaning of the word. Build the speech around one man as the chief example. 33. Colonels and Shells. Leadership and Cannon Fodder. A protest against war in its effect on the common people. 34. Why is a militant? A dispassionate examination of the claims of the British militant suffragette. 35. Art and Morals. The difference between the nude and the naked in art. 36. Can my country be wrong? False patriotism and true, with examples of popularly hated patriots. 37. Government by party. An analysis of our present political system and the movement toward reform. 38. The effects of fiction on history. 39. The effects of history on fiction. 40. The influence of war on literature. 41. Chinese Gordon, a eulogy. 42. Taxes and higher education. Should all men be compelled to contribute to the support of universities and professional schools? 43. Prize cattle versus prize babies. Is eugenics a science, and is it practicable? 44. Benevolent autocracy. Is a strongly paternal government better for the masses than a much larger freedom for the individual? 45. Second-hand opinions. The tendency to swallow reviews instead of forming one's own views. 46. Parentage or power? A study of which form of aristocracy must eventually prevail, that of blood or that of talent. 47. The blessing of discontent. Based on many examples of what has been accomplished by those who have not let well enough alone. 48. Corrupt and contented. 
a study of the relation of the apathetic voter to vicious government. 49. The Moloch of Child Labor 50. Every man has a right to work. 51. Charity that fosters pauperism. 52. Not in our stars, but in ourselves. Destiny versus choice. 53. Environment versus heredity. 54. The bravery of doubt. Doubt, not mere unbelief. True grounds for doubt. What doubt has led to. Examples. The weakness of mere doubt. The attitude of the wholesome doubter versus that of the wholesale doubter. 55. The Spirit of Monticello. A message from the life of Thomas Jefferson. 56. Narrowness in Specialism. The dangers of specializing without first possessing broad knowledge. The eye too close to one subject. Balance is a vital prerequisite for specialization. 57. Responsibility of labor unions to the law. 58. The future of Southern literature. What conditions in the history, temperament, and environment of our Southern people indicate a bright literary future? 59. Woman, the hope of idealism in America. 60. The value of debating clubs. 61. An army of 30 millions in praise of the Sunday school. 62. The baby. How the ever-new baby holds mankind in unselfish courses and saves us all from going lastingly wrong. 63. Lo, the poor capitalist, his trials and problems. 64. Honey and sting, a lesson from the bee. 65. Ungrateful republics, examples from history. 66. Every man has his price. Horace Walpole's cynical remark is not true now, nor is it true even in his own corrupt era. Of what sort are the men who cannot be bought? Examples. 67. The scholar in diplomacy. Examples in American life. 68. Locks and keys. There is a key for every lock. No difficulty so great, no truth so obscure, no problem so involved, but that there is a key to fit the lock. The search for the right key, the struggle to adjust it, the vigilance to retain it, these are some of the problems of success. 69. Right makes might. 70. Rooming with a ghost. Influence of the woman graduate of fifty years before on the college girl who lives in the room once occupied by the distinguished old grad. 71. No fact is a single fact. The importance of weighing facts relatively. 72. Is classical education dead to rise no more? 73. Invective against Nietzsche's philosophy. 74. Why have we bosses? A fair-minded examination of the uses and abuses of the political leader. 75. A plea for settlement work. 76. Credulity versus faith. 77. What is humor? 78. Use and abuse of the cartoon. 79. The pulpit in politics. 80. Are colleges growing too large? 81. The doom of absolutism. 82. Shall woman help keep house for town, city, state, and nation? 83. The educational test for suffrage. 84. The property test for suffrage. 85. The menace of the plutocrat. 86. The cost of high living. 87. The cost of conveniences. 88. Waste in American life. 89. The effect of the photoplay on the legitimate theatre. 90. Room for the kicker. 
There are no numbers 91 to 99. 100. The need for trained diplomats. 101. The shadow of the Iron Chancellor. 102. The tyranny of the crowd. 103. Is our trial by jury satisfactory? 104. The high cost of securing justice. 105. The need for speedier court trials. 106. Triumphs of the American engineer. 107. Girthels and Gorgers. 108. Public education makes service to the public a duty. 109. Man owes his life to the common good. End of section 34. Section 35, Appendix D, Speeches for Study and Practice. Newell Dwight Hillis, Brave Little Belgium. Delivered in Plymouth Church, Brooklyn, New York, October 18, 1914. Used by permission. Long ago, Plato made a distinction between the occasions of war and the causes of war. The occasions of war lie upon the surface and are known and read of all men, while the causes of war are embedded in racial antagonisms, in political and economic controversies. Narrative historians portray the occasions of war, philosophic historians the secret and hidden causes. Thus the spark of fire that falls is the occasion of an explosion, but the cause of the havoc is the relation between charcoal, nitre, and saltpetre. The occasion of the Civil War was the firing upon Fort Sumter. The cause was the collision between the ideals of the Union, presented by Daniel Webster, and the succession taught by Calhoun. The occasion of the American Revolution was the stamp tax. The cause was the conviction, on the part of our forefathers, that men who had freedom in worship carried also the capacity for self-government. The occasion of the French Revolution was the purchase of a diamond necklace for Queen Marie Antoinette at a time when the treasury was exhausted. The cause of the Revolution was feudalism, not otherwise the occasion of the great conflict that is now shaking our earth was the assassination of an Austrian boy and girl, but the cause is embedded in racial antagonisms and economic competition. As for Russia, the cause of the war was her desire to obtain the Bosphorus and an open seaport, which is the prize offered for her attack upon Germany. As for Austria, the cause of the war is her fear of the growing power of the Balkan states and the progressive slicing away of her territory. As for France, the cause of the war is the instinct of self-preservation that resists an invading host. As for Germany, the cause is her deep-seated conviction that every country has a moral right to the mouth of its greatest river unable to compete with england by roundabout sea routes and a keel canal she wants to use the route that nature digged for her through the mouth of the rhine as for england the motherland is fighting to recover her sense of security during the napoleonic wars the second william pitt explained the quadrupling of the taxes the increase of the navy and the sending of an english army against france by the statement that justification of this proposed war is the preservation of England's sense of security. Ten years ago, England lost her sense of security. Today she is not seeking to preserve, but to recover the lost sense of security. She proposes to do this by destroying Germany's ironclads, demobilizing her army, wiping out her forts and the partition of her provinces the occasions of the war vary with the color of the paper white and gray and blue but the causes of this war are embedded in racial antagonisms and economic and political differences why little belgium has the center of the stage 
Tonight, our study concerns little Belgium, her people, and their part in this conflict. Be the reasons what they may, this little land stands in the center of the stage and holds the limelight. Once more David, armed with a sling, has gone up against ten Goliaths. It is an amazing spectacle, this, one of the smallest of the states battling with the largest of the giants. Belgium has a standing army of 42,000 men, and Germany, with three reserves, perhaps seven million or eight million. Without waiting for any assistance, this little Belgian band went up against two million. It is as if a honey bee had decided to attack an eagle come to loot its honeycomb. It is as if an antelope had turned against a lion. Belgium has but 11,000 square miles of land, less than the states of Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Connecticut. Her population is 7,500,000, less than the single state of New York. You could put 22 Belgiums in our single state of Texas. Much of her soil is thin. Her handicaps are heavy. But the industry of her people has turned the whole land into one vast flower and vegetable garden. The soil of Minnesota and the Dakotas is new soil, and yet our farmers there average but 15 bushels of wheat to the acre. Belgium's soil has been used for centuries, but it averages 37 bushels of wheat to the acre. If we grow 24 bushels of barley on an acre of ground, Belgium grows 50. She produces 300 bushels of potatoes, where the main farmer harvests 90 bushels. Belgium's average population per square mile has risen to 645 people. If Americans practiced intensive farming, if the population of Texas were as dense as it is in Belgium, 100 million of the United States, Canada, and Central America could all move to Texas. While if our entire country was as densely populated as Belgium's, everybody in the world could live comfortably within the limits of our country. The life of the people. And yet little Belgium has no gold or silver mines, and all the treasures of copper and zinc and lead and anthracite and oil have been denied her. The gold is in the heart of her people. No other land holds a race more prudent, industrious, and thrifty. It is a land where everybody works. In the winter, when the sun does not shine until half-past seven, the Belgian cottages have lights in their windows at five, and the people are ready for an eleven-hour day. As a rule, all children work after twelve years of age. The exquisite pointed lace that has made Belgium famous is wrought by women who fulfill the tasks of the household fulfilled by American women, and then begins their task upon the exquisite lace that have sent their name and fame throughout the world. Their wages are low, their work hard, but their life is so peaceful and prosperous that few Belgians ever emigrate to foreign countries. Of late they have made their education compulsory, their schools free. It is doubtful whether any other country has made a greater success of their system of transportation. You will pay fifty cents to journey some twenty-odd miles out to Roslyn on our Long Island Railroad. But in Belgium, a commuter journeys twenty miles into the factory and back again every night and makes the six double daily journeys at an entire cost of thirty-seven and one-half cents per week, less than the amount that you pay for the journey one way for a like distance in this country. Out of this has come Belgium's prosperity. She has the money to buy goods from other countries, and she has the property to export to foreign lands. 
Last year, the United States, with its hundred millions of people, imported less than two thousand million dollars and exported two thousand five hundred million dollars if our people had been as prosperous per capita as belgium we would have purchased from other countries twelve thousand million dollars worth of goods and exported ten thousand million dollars so largely have we been dependent upon Belgium that many of the engines used in digging the Panama Canal came from the cockerel works that produce two thousands of these engines every year in Liège. It is often said that the Belgians have the best courts in existence. The Supreme Court of Little Belgium has but one justice. Without waiting for an appeal, just as soon as the decision has been reached by a lower court while the matters are still fresh in mind and all the witnesses and facts readily obtainable this supreme justice reviews all the objections raised on either side and without a motion from any one passes on the decision of the inferior court on the other hand, the lower courts are open to an immediate settlement of disputes between the wage earners, and newsboys and fishermen are almost daily seen going to the judge for a decision regarding a dispute over five or ten cents. When the judge has cross-questioned both sides, without the presence of attorneys, or the necessity of serving a process, or raising a dollar and a quarter, as here, the poorest of the poor have their wrongs righted it is said that not one decision out of one hundred is appealed thus calling for the existence of an attorney to all other institutions organized in the interest of the wage earner has been added the national savings bank system that makes loans to men of small means that enables the farmer and the working man to buy a little garden and build a house while at the same time insuring the working man against accident and sickness belgium is a poor man's country it has been said because institutions have been administered in the interest of the men of small affairs the great Belgian plain in history. But the institutions of Belgium and the industrial prosperity of her people alone are not equal to the explanation of her unique heroism. Long ago, in his commentaries, Julius Caesar said that Gaul was inhabited by three tribes, the Belgae, the Aquitani, the Celts, of whom the Belgae were the bravest, History will show that Belgians have courage as their native right, for only the brave could have survived. The southeastern part of Belgium is a series of rock plains, and if these plains have been her good fortune in times of peace, they have furnished the battlefields of Western Europe for 2,000 years. Northern France and Western Germany are rough, jagged, and wooded. But the Belgian plains were ideal battlefields. For this reason, the generals of Germany and of France have usually met and struggled for the mastery on these wide Belgian plains. On one of these grounds, Julius Caesar won the first battle that is recorded. Then came King Clovis and the French with their campaigns. Toward these plains also the Saracens were hurrying when assaulted by Charles Martel. On the Belgian plains the Dutch burghers and the Spanish armies, led by Bloody Alva, fought out their battle. Hither, too, came Napoleon, and the great mound of Waterloo is the monument to the Duke of Wellington's victory. It was to the Belgian plains also that the German general, last August, rushed his troops. Every college and every city searches for some level spot of land where the contest between opposing teams may be held, 
and for more than two thousand years the belgian plain has been the scene of the great battles between the warring nations of western europe now out of all these collisions there has come a hardy race inured to peril rich in fortitude loyalty patience thrift self-reliance and persevering faith for five hundred years the belgian children and youth have been brought up upon the deeds of noble renown achieved by their ancestors if julius caesar were here today he would wear belgium's bravery like a bright sword girded to his thigh and when this brave little people with a standing army of forty two thousand men single-handed defied two millions of germans it tells us that ajax has come back once more to defy the god of lightnings a thrilling chapter from Belgium's history. Perhaps one or two chapters torn from the pages of Belgium history will enable us to understand her present-day heroism, just as one golden bough plucked from the forest will explain the richness of the autumn. You remember that Venice was once the financial center of the world. Then, when the bankers lost confidence in the navy of Venice, they put their jewels and gold into saddlebags and moved the financial center of the world to Nuremberg because its walls were seven feet thick and twenty feet high. Later, about 1500 A.D., the discovery of the new world turned all the peoples into races of seagoing folk and the English and Dutch captains vied with the sailors of Spain and Portugal. No captains were more prosperous than the mariners of Antwerp. In 1568 there were 500 marble mansions in this city on the Meurs. Belgium became a casket filled with jewels. Then it was that Spain turned covetous eyes northward, sated with his pleasures broken by indulgence and passion the emperor charles v resigned his gold and throne to his son king philip finding his coffers depleted philip sent the duke of alva with ten thousand spanish soldiers out on a looting expedition their approach filled antwerp with consternation for her merchants were busy with commerce and not with war. The sack of Antwerp by the Spaniards makes up a revolting page in history. Within three days, 8,000 men, women, and children were massacred, and the Spanish soldiers, drunk with wine and blood, hacked, drowned, and burned like fiends that they were. The Belgian historian tells us that 500 marble residences were reduced to blackened ruins. One incident will make the event stand out. When the Spaniards approached the city, a wealthy burgher hastened the day of his son's marriage. During the ceremony, the soldiers broke down the gate of the city and crossed the threshold of the rich man's house when they had stripped the guests of their purses and gems unsatisfied they killed the bridegroom slew the men and carried the bride out into the night the next morning a young woman crazed and half clad was found in the street searching among the dead bodies at last she found a youth whose head she lifted upon her knees, over which she crooned her songs, as a young mother soothes her babe. A Spanish officer passing by, humiliated by the spectacle, ordered a soldier to use his dagger and put the girl out of her misery. The Horrors of the Inquisition Having looted Antwerp, the treasure chest of Belgium, the Spaniards set up the Inquisition as an organized means of securing property. 
It is the strange fact that the Spaniard has excelled in cruelty as other nations have excelled in art or science or invention. Spain's cruelty to the Moors and the rich Jews forms one of the blackest chapters in history. Inquisitors became fiends. Moors were starved, tortured, burned, flung in wells. Jewish bankers had their tongues thrust through little iron rings. Then the end of the tongue was seared that it might swell, and the banker was led by a string in the ring through the streets of the city. The women and the children were put on rafts that were pushed out into the Mediterranean Sea. When the swollen corpses drifted ashore, the plague broke out. And when that black plague spread over Spain, it seemed like the justice of outraged nature. The expulsion of the Moors was one of the deadliest blows ever struck at science, commerce, art, and literature. The historian tracks Spain across the continents by a trail of blood. Wherever Spain's hand has fallen, it has paralyzed. From the days of Cortes, wherever her captains have given a pledge, the tongue that spake has been mildewed with lies and treachery. The wildest beasts are not in the jungle. Man is the lion that rends. Man is the leopard that tears. Man's hate is the serpent that poisons. And the Spaniard entered Belgium to turn a garden into a wilderness. Within one year, 1568, Antwerp, that began with 125,000 people, ended it with 50,000. Many multitudes were put to death by the sword and stake, but many, many thousands fled to England to begin anew their lives as manufacturers and mariners. And for years, Belgium was one quaking peril an inferno whose torturers were Spaniards. The visitor in Antwerp is still shown the rack upon which they stretched the merchants that they might yield up their hidden gold. The painted lady may be seen. Opening her arms, she embraces the victim. The Spaniard, with his spear, forced the merchant into the deadly embrace as the iron arms concealed in velvet folded together, one spike passed through each eye, another through the mouth, another through the heart. The painted lady's lips were poisoned, so that a kiss was fatal. The dungeon whose sides were forced together by screws, so that each day the victim saw his cell growing less and less, and knew that soon he would be crushed to death, was another instrument of torture. Literally thousands of innocent men and women were burned alive in the marketplace. There is no more piteous tragedy in history than the story of the decline and ruin of this superbly prosperous literary and artistic country. And yet out of the ashes came new courage. Burned, broken, the Belgians and the Dutch were not beaten. Pushed at last into Holland, where they united their fortunes with the Dutch, they cut the dikes of Holland and let in the ocean and clinging to the dikes with their fingertips, fought their way back to the land. But no sooner had the last of the Spaniards gone than out of their rags and poverty they founded a university as a monument to the providence of God in delivering them out of the hands of their enemies. For the 16th century, in the form of a brave knight, wears little Belgium and Holland like a red rose upon his heart. The Death of Egmont But some of you will say that the Belgian people must have been rebels and guilty of some excess, 
and that had they remained quiescent and not fermented treason, then no such fate could have overtaken them at the hands of Spain. Very well. I will take a youth who, at the beginning, believed in Charles V, a man who was as true to his ideals as the needle to the pole. One day, the bloody council decreed the death of Egmont and Horn. Immediately afterward, the Duke of Alva sent an invitation to Egmont to be the guest of honor at a banquet in his own house. A servant from the palace that night delivered to the Count a slip of paper containing a warning to take the fleecest horse and flee the city, and from that moment not to eat or sleep without pistols at his hand. To all this, Egmont responded that no monster ever lived who could, with an invitation of hospitality, trick a patriot. Like a brave man, the Count went to the Duke's palace. He found the guests assembled, but when he had handed his hat and cloak to the servant, Alva gave a sign, and from behind the curtains came Spanish musketeers, who demanded his sword, for instead of a banquet hall, the Count was taken to a cellar, fitted up as a dungeon. Already Egmont had all but died for his country. He had used his ships, his trade, his gold for righting the people's wrongs. He was a man of a large family, a wife and eleven children, and people loved him as to idolatry. But Alva was inexorable. He had made up his mind that the merchants and burghers had still much hidden gold, and if he killed their bravest and best, terror would fall upon all alike, and that the gold he needed would be forthcoming. That all the people might witness the scene, he took his prisoners to Brussels and decided to behead them in the public square. In the evening, Egmont received the notice that his head would be chopped off the next day. A scaffold was erected in the public square. That evening, he wrote a letter that is a marvel of restraint. Sire, I have learned this evening the sentence which your majesty has been pleased to pronounce upon me. Although I have never had a thought and believe myself never to have done a deed which would tend to the prejudice of your service or to the detriment of true religion, nevertheless I take patience to bear that which it has pleased the good God to permit. Therefore I pray your majesty to have compassion on my poor wife, my children, and my servants, having regard to my past service in which hope I now commend myself to the mercy of God. From Brussels, ready to die, this 5th of June, 1568, La Morale d'Egmont. Thus died a man who did as much probably for Holland as John Eliot for England, or Lafayette for France, or Samuel Adams for this young republic. The Woe of Belgium. And now, out of all this glorious past, comes the Woe of Belgium. Desolation has come like the whirlwind, and destruction like a tornado. But ninety days ago, and Belgium was a hive of industry, and in the fields were heard the harvest songs. Suddenly, Germany struck Belgium. The whole world has but one voice. Belgium has innocent hands. She was led like a lamb to the slaughter. When the lover of Germany is asked to explain Germany's breaking of her solemn treaty upon the neutrality of Belgium, the German stands dumb and speechless. Merchants honor their written obligations. True citizens consider their word as good as their bond. Germany gave treaty, and in the presence of God and the civilized world, entered into a solemn covenant with Belgium. To the end of time, the German must expect this taunt as worthless as a German treaty. 
scarcely less black, the two or three known examples of cruelty wrought upon non-resisting Belgians. In Brooklyn lives a Belgian woman. She planned to return home in late July to visit a father who had suffered paralysis, an aged mother, and a sister who nursed both. When the Germans decided to burn that village in eastern Belgium, they did not wish to burn alive this old and helpless man, so they bayoneted to death the old man and woman, and the daughter that nursed them. Let us judge not that we be not judged. This is the one example of atrocity that you and I might be able personally to prove. But every loyal German in the country can make answer, these soldiers were drunk with wine and blood. Such an atrocity misrepresents Germany and her soldiers. The breaking of Germany's treaty with Belgium represents the dishonesty of a military ring, and not the perfidy of sixty-eight million of people. We ask that judgment be postponed until all the facts are in. But, meanwhile, the man who loves his fellows at midnight in his dreams walks across the fields of broken Belgium. All through the night air there comes the sob of Rachel, weeping for her children, because they are not. In moods of bitterness, of doubt and despair, the heart cries out, How could a just God permit such cruelty upon innocent Belgium? No man knows. Clouds and darkness are round about God's throne. The spirit of evil caused this war, but the spirit of God may bring good out of it, just as the summer can repair the ravages of winter. Meanwhile, the heart bleeds for Belgium, for Brussels, the third most beautiful city in Europe, for Louvain, once rich with its libraries, cathedrals, statues, paintings, missals, manuscripts, now a ruin. Alas for the ruined harvests and the smoking villages. Alas for the cathedral that is a heap and the library that is a ruin. Where the angel of happiness was there stalked famine and death. Gone the land of Grotius. Perish the paintings of Rubens. Ruined is Levain. Where the wheat waved, now the hillsides are billowy with graves. But let us believe that God reigns. Perchance Belgium is slain like the Saviour, that militarism may die like Satan. Without shedding of innocent blood, there is no remission of sins through tyranny and greed. There is no wine without the crushing of the grapes from the tree of life. Soon liberty, God's dear child, will stand within the scene and comfort the desolate. Falling upon the great world's altar stairs, in this hour when wisdom is ignorance and the strongest man clutches at dust and straw, let us believe with faith, victorious over tears, that some time God will gather broken-hearted little Belgium into his arms, and comfort her as a father comforteth his well-beloved child. End of section 35. Section 36, Appendix D, Speeches for Study and Practice. Henry Watterson, The New Americanism abridged. Eight years ago tonight there stood where I am standing now a young Georgian who, not without reason, recognized the significance of his presence here, and in words whose eloquence I cannot hope to recall, appealed from the New South to New England for a united country. He is gone now, but Short as his life was, its heaven-born mission was fulfilled. The dream of his childhood was realized, for he had been appointed by God to carry a message of peace on earth, goodwill to men, and, this done, 
he vanished from the sight of mortal eyes, even as the dove from the ark. Grady told us, and told us truly, of that typical American who, in Dr. Talmadge's mind's eye, was coming, but who, in Abraham Lincoln's actuality, had already come. In some recent studies into the career of that man, I have encountered many startling confirmations of this judgment, and from that rugged trunk, drawing its sustenance from gnarled roots, interlocked with cavalier sprays and Puritan branches deep beneath the soil, shall spring, is springing, a shapely tree, symmetric in all its parts, under whose sheltering boughs this nation shall have the new birth of freedom Lincoln promised it, and mankind the refuge which was sought by the forefathers when they fled from oppression. Thank God the axe, the gibbet, and the stake have had their day. They have gone, let us hope, to keep company with the lost arts. It has been demonstrated that great wrongs may be redressed and great reforms be achieved without the shedding of one drop of human blood, that vengeance does not purify but brutalizes, and that tolerance, which in private transactions is reckoned a virtue, becomes in public affairs a dogma of the most far-seeing statesmanship. So I appeal from the men in silken hose who danced to music made by slaves and called it freedom, from the men in bell-crowned hats who led Hester Prynne to her shame and called it religion, to that Americanism which reaches forth its arms to smite wrong with reason and truth, secure in the power of both. I appeal from the patriarchs of New England to the poets of New England, from Endicott to Lowell, from Winthrop to Longfellow, from Norton to Holmes. And I appeal in the name and by the rights of that common citizenship, of that common origin, back of both the Puritan and the Cavalier, to which all of us owe our being. Let the dead past, consecrated by the blood of its martyrs, not by its savage hatreds, darkened alike by kingcraft and priestcraft, let the dead past bury its dead. Let the present and the future ring with the song of the singers. Blessed be the lessons they teach, the laws they make. Blessed be the eye to see, the light to reveal. Blessed be tolerance, sitting ever on the right hand of God to guide the way with loving word, as blessed be all that brings us nearer the goal of true religion, true republicanism, and true patriotism, distrust of watchwords and labels, shams and heroes, belief in our country and ourselves. It was not Cotton Mather, but John Greenleaf Whittier, who cried, Dear God and Father of us all, forgive our faith in cruel lies, forgive the blindness that denies. Cast down our idols, overturn our bloody altars, make us see thyself in thy humanity. End of section 36. Section 37. Appendix D. Speeches for Study and Practice. John Morley, Founder's Day Address abridged. Carnegie Institute, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, November 3, 1904. What is so hard as a just estimate of the events of our own time? It is only now, a century and a half later, that we really perceive that a writer has something to say for himself when he calls Wolfe's exploit at Quebec the turning point in modern history. And today, it is hard to imagine any rational standard that would not make the American Revolution, an insurrection of 13 little colonies with a population of 3 millions scattered in a distant wilderness among savages, a mightier event in many of its aspects than the volcanic convulsion in France. Again, the upbuilding of your great West on this continent 
is reckoned by some the most important world movement of the last hundred years. But is it more important than the amazing, imposing, and perhaps disquieting apparition of Japan? One authority insists that when Russia descended into the Far East and pushed her frontier on the Pacific to the 43rd degree of latitude, that was one of the most far-reaching facts of modern history. Though it almost escaped the eyes of Europe, all her perceptions then monopolized by affairs in the Levant. Who can say? Many courses of the sun were needed before men could take the full historic measures of Luther, Calvin, Knox, the measure of Loyola, the Council of Trent, and all the Counter-Reformation. The center of gravity is forever shifting, the political axis of the world perpetually changing. But we are now far enough off to discern how stupendous a thing was done when, after two cycles of bitter war, one foreign, the other civil and intestine, Pitt and Washington, within a span of less than a score of years, planted the foundations of the American Republic. What Forbes's stockade at Fort Pitt has grown to be, you know better than I. The huge triumphs of Pittsburgh in material production, iron, steel, coke, glass, and all the rest of it, can only be told in colossal figures that are almost as hard to realize in our minds as the figures of astronomical distance or geologic time. It is not quite clear that all the founders of the Commonwealth would have surveyed the wonderful scene with the same exultation as their descendants. Some of them would have denied that these great centers of industrial democracy, either in the old world or in the new, always stand for progress. Jefferson said, I view great cities as pestilential to the morals, the health, and the liberties of man. I consider the class of artificers, he went on, as the panders of vice, and the instrument by which the liberties of a country are generally overthrown. In England, they reckon 70% of our population as dwellers in towns. With you, I read that only 25% of the population live in groups as large as 4,000 persons. If Jefferson was right, our outlook would be dark. Let us hope that he was wrong, and in fact toward the end of his time qualified his early view. Franklin, at any rate, would, I feel sure, have reveled in it all. That great man a name in the forefront among the practical intelligences of human history, once told a friend that when he dwelt upon the rapid progress that mankind was making in politics, morals, and the arts of living, and when he considered that each one improvement always begets another, he felt assured that the future progress of the race was likely to be quicker than it had ever been. He was never wearied of foretelling inventions yet to come, and he wished he could revisit the earth at the end of a century to see how mankind was getting on. With all my heart I share his wish. Of all the men who have built up great states, I do believe there is not one whose alacrity of sound sense and single-eyed beneficence of aim could be more safely trusted than Franklin to draw light from the clouds and pierce the economic and political confusions of our time. We can imagine the amazement and complacency of that shrewd, benignant mind if he could watch all the great marvels of your mills and furnaces, and all the apparatus devised by the wondrous inventive faculties of man, if he could have foreseen that his experiments with the kite in his garden at Philadelphia, his tubes, his laden jars, 
would end in the electrical appliances of today. The largest electric plant in all the world on the site of Fort Duquesne. If he could have heard of 5,000 millions of passengers carried in the United States by electric motor power in a year, if he could have realized all the rest of the magician's tale of our time. Still more would he have been astounded and elated could he have foreseen, beyond all advances in material production, the unbroken strength of that political structure which he had so grand a share in rearing. Into this very region where we are this afternoon swept wave after wave of immigration. English from Virginia flowed over the border, bringing English traits, literature, habits of mind. Scots or Scots-Irish, originally from Ulster, flowed in from central Pennsylvania. Catholics from southern Ireland, new hosts from southern and east central Europe. This is not the 4th of July, but people of every school would agree that it is no exuberance of rhetoric, it is only sober truth to say that the persevering absorption and incorporation of all this ceaseless torrent of heterogeneous elements into one united, stable, industrious, and pacific state is an achievement that neither the Roman Empire nor the Roman Church, neither Byzantine Empire nor Russian, not Charles the Great, nor Charles V, nor Napoleon ever rivaled or approached. We are usually apt to excuse the slower rate of liberal progress in our old world by contrasting the obstructive barriers of prejudice, survival, solecism, anachronism, convention, institution, all so obstinately rooted even when the branches seem bare and broken in an old world, with the open and disengaged ground of the new. Yet in fact your difficulties were at least as formidable as those of the older civilizations, into whose fruitful heritage you have entered. Unique was the necessity of this gigantic task of incorporation, the assimilation of peoples of diverse faiths and race. A second difficulty was more formidable still, how to erect and work a powerful and wealthy state on such a system as to combine the centralized concert of a federal system with local independence, and to unite collective energy with the encouragement of individual freedom this last difficulty that you have so successfully, up to now surmounted, at the present hour confronts the mother country and deeply perplexes her statesmen. Liberty and union have been called the twin ideas of America. So too they are the twin ideals of all responsible men in Great Britain. Although responsible men differ among themselves as to the safest path on which to travel toward the common goal, and the dividing ocean, in other ways so much our friend, interposes. For our case of an island state, or rather for a group of island states, obstacles from which a continental state like yours is happily altogether free. Nobody believes that no difficulties remain. Some of them are obvious, but the common sense, the mixture of patience and determination that has conquered risks and mischiefs in the past, may be trusted with the future. Strange and devious are the paths of history. Broad and shining channels get mysteriously silted up. How many a time what seemed a glorious high road proves no more than a mule track or mere cul-de-sac. Think of Canning's flashing boast when he insisted on the recognition of the Spanish republics in South America, 
that he had called a new world into existence to redress the balance of the old. This is one of the sayings of which sort many another might be found that make the fortune of a rhetorician, yet stand ill the wear and tear of time and circumstance. The new world that Canning called into existence has so far turned out a scene of singular disenchantment. They are not without glimpses on occasion of that heroism and courage and even wisdom that are the attributes of man almost at the worst. The tale has been too much a tale of anarchy and disaster, still leaving a host of perplexities for statesmen both in America and Europe. It has left also to students of a philosophic turn of mind one of the most interesting of all the problems to be found in the whole field of social, ecclesiastical, religious, and racial movement. Why is it that we do not find in the South, as we find in the North of this hemisphere, a powerful federation, a great Spanish-American people stretching from the Rio Grande to Cape Horn? To answer that question, would be to shed a flood of light upon many deep historic forces in the old world, of which, after all, these movements of the new are but a prolongation and more manifest extension. What more imposing phenomenon does history present to us than the rise of Spanish power to the pinnacle of greatness and glory in the 16th century? The Mohammedans, after centuries of fierce and stubborn war, driven back. The whole peninsula brought under a single rule with a single creed. Enormous acquisitions from the Netherlands of Naples, Sicily, the Canaries, France humbled, England menaced, settlements made in Asia and Northern Africa. Spain in America become possessed of a vast continent and of more than one archipelago of splendid islands. Yet, before a century was over, the sovereign majesty of Spain underwent a huge declension. The territory under her sway was contracted. The fabulous wealth of the mines of the New World had been wasted. Agriculture and industry were ruined. Her commerce passed into the hands of her rivals. Let me digress one further moment. We have a very sensible habit in the island whence I come, when our country misses fire, to say as little as we can, and sink the thing in patriotic oblivion. It is rather startling to recall that less than a century ago, England twice sent a military force to seize what is now Argentina. Pride of race and hostile creed vehemently resisting proved too much for us. The two expeditions ended in failure, and nothing remains for the historian today but to wonder what a difference it might have made to the temperate region of South America if the fortunes of war had gone the other way, if the region of the Plata had become British and a large British immigration had followed. Do not think me guilty of the heinous crime of forgetting the Monroe Doctrine. That momentous declaration was not made for a good many years after our General Whitelock was repulsed at Buenos Aires. Though Mr. Sumner and other people have always held that it was Canning who really first started the Monroe Doctrine when he invited the United States to join him against European intervention in South American affairs. The day is at hand, we are told, when four-fifths of the human race will trace their pedigree to English forefathers, as four-fifths of the white people in the United States trace their pedigree today. By the end of this century, they say, such nations as France and Germany, assuming that they stand apart from fresh consolidations, will only be able to claim the same relative position in the political world as Holland and Switzerland. 
these musings of the moon do not take us far. The important thing, as we all know, is not the exact fraction of the human race that will speak English. The important thing is that those who speak English, whether in old lands or new, shall strive in lofty, generous, and never-ceasing emulation with peoples of other tongues and other stock for the political, social, and intellectual primacy among mankind. In this noble strife for the service of our race, we need never fear that claimants for the prize will be too large a multitude. As an able scholar of your own has said, Jefferson was here using the old vernacular of English aspirations after a free, manly, and well-ordered political life, a vernacular rich in stately tradition and noble phrase, to be found in a score of a thousand of champions in many camps, in Buchanan, Milton, Hooker, Locke, Jeremy Taylor, Roger Williams, and many another humbler but not less strenuous pioneer and confessor of freedom. Ah, do not fail to count up, and count up often, what a different world it would have been but for that island in the distant northern sea. These were the tributary fountains that, as time went on, swelled into the broad confluence of modern time. What was new in 1776 was the transformation of thought into actual policy. What is progress? It is best to be slow in the complex art of politics in their widest sense and not to hurry to define. If you want a platitude, there is nothing for supplying it like a definition. Or shall we say that most definitions hang between platitude and paradox? There are said, though I have never counted, to be 10,000 definitions of religion. There must be about as many of poetry. There can hardly be fewer of liberty or even of happiness. I am not bold enough to try a definition. I will not try to gauge how far the advance of moral forces has kept pace with that extension of material forces in the world of which this continent, conspicuous before all others, bears such astounding evidence. This, of course, is the question of questions. Because as an illustrious English writer, to whom, by the way, I owe my friendship with your founder many long years ago, as Matthew Arnold said in America here, it is moral ideas that at bottom decide the standing or falling of states and nations. Without opening this vast discussion at large, many a sign of progress is beyond mistake. The practice of associated action, one of the master keys of progress, is a new force in a hundred fields and with immeasurable diversity of forms. There is less acquiescence in triumphant wrong. Toleration in religion has been called the best fruit of the last four centuries, and in spite of a few bigoted survivals, even in our United Kingdom, and some savage outbreaks of hatred, half religious, half racial, on the continent of Europe, this glorious gain of time may now be taken as secured. Perhaps of all the contributions of America to human civilization, this is greatest. The reign of force is not yet over, and at intervals it has its triumphant hours. But reason, justice, humanity fight with success their long and steady battle for a wider sway. Of all the points of social advance, in my country at least, during the last generation none is more marked than the change in the position of women in respect of rights of property, of education, of access to new callings. As for the improvement of material well-being and its diffusion among those whose labor is a prime factor in its creation, 
we might grow sated with the jubilant monotony of its figures if we did not take good care to remember in the excellent words of the president of harvard that those gains like the prosperous working of your institutions and the principles by which they are sustained are in essence moral contributions being principles of reason enterprise courage faith and justice over passion selfishness inertness timidity and distrust it is the moral impulses that matter where they are safe all is safe when this and the like is said nobody supposes that the last word has been spoken as to the condition of the people either in america or europe republicanism is not itself a panacea for economic difficulties of self it can neither stifle nor appease the accents of social discontent so long as it has no root in surveyed envy this discontent itself is a token of progress what cries the skeptic what has become of all the hopes of the time when france stood upon the top of golden hours do not let us fear the challenge much has come of them and over the old hopes time has brought a stratum of new liberalism is sometimes suspected of being called to these new hopes and you may often hear it said that liberalism is already superseded by socialism that a change is passing over party names in Europe is plain, but you can be sure that no change in name will extinguish these principles of society which are rooted in the nature of things and are accredited by their success. Twice America has saved liberalism in Great Britain. The war for independence in the 18th century was the defeat of usurping power no less in England than here. The war for union in the 19th century gave the decisive impulse to a critical extension of suffrage and an era of popular reform in the mother country. Any miscarriage of democracy here reacts against progress in Great Britain. If you seek the real meaning of most modern disparagement of popular or parliamentary government, it is no more than this and no politics will suffice of themselves to make a nation's soul. What could be more true? Who says it will? But we may depend upon it that the soul will be best kept alive in a nation where there is the highest proportion of those who, in the phrase of an old worthy of the 17th century, think it a part of a man's religion to see to it that his country be well governed. Democracy, they tell us, is afflicted by mediocrity and by sterility. But has not democracy in my country, as in yours, shown before now that it well knows how to choose rulers, neither mediocre nor sterile, men more than the equals in unselfishness, in rectitude, in clear sight, in force, of any absolute statesman, that ever in times past bore the scepter? If I live a few months, or it may be even a few weeks longer, I hope to have seen something of three elections, one in Canada, one in the United Kingdom, and the other here. With us, in respect of leadership, and apart from height of social prestige, the personage corresponding to the president is, as you know, the prime minister. Our general election this time, owing to personal accident of the passing hour, may not determine quite exactly who shall be the prime minister, but it will determine the party from which the prime minister shall be taken. On normal occasions, our election of a prime minister is as direct and personal as yours, and in choosing a member of parliament, people were really for a whole generation choosing whether Disraeli or Gladstone or Salisbury should be head of the government. The one central difference between your system and ours 
is that the American president is in for a fixed time, whereas the British prime minister depends upon the support of the House of Commons. If he loses that, his power may not endure a twelve-month. If, on the other hand, he keeps it, he may hold office for a dozen years. There are not many more interesting or important questions in political discussion than the question whether our cabinet government or your presidential system of government is the better. This is not the place to argue it. Between 1868 and now, a period of 36 years, we have had eight ministries. This would give us an average life of four and a half years. Of these eight governments, five lasted over five years. Broadly speaking, then, our executive governments have lasted about the length of your fixed term. As for ministers swept away by a gust of passion, I can only recall the overthrow of Lord Palmerston in 1858 for being thought too subservient to France. For my own part, I have always thought that by its free play, its comparative fluidity, its rapid flexibility of adaptation, our cabinet system has most to say for itself. Whether democracy will make for peace, we all have yet to see. So far, democracy has done little in Europe to protect us against the turbid whirlpools of a military age when the evils of rival states, antagonistic races, territorial claims, and all the other formulas of international conflict are felt to be unbearable, and the curse becomes too great to be any longer born, a school of teachers will perhaps arise to pick up again the thread of the best writers and wisest rulers on the eve of the revolution. Movement in this region of human things has not all been progressive. If we survey the European courts from the end of the Seven Years' War down to the French Revolution, we note the marked growth of a distinctly international and pacific spirit. At no era in the world's history can we find so many European statesmen after peace and the good government of which peace is the best ally. That sentiment came to violent end when Napoleon arose to scourge the world. End of section 37. Section 38. Appendix D. Speeches for study and practice. Robert Toombs on resigning from the Senate, 1861. Abridged. The success of the abolitionists and their allies under the name of the Republican Party has produced its logical results already. They have for long years been sowing dragon's teeth and have finally got a crop of armed men. The Union, sir, is dissolved. That is an accomplished fact in the path of this discussion that men may as well heed. One of your Confederates has already wisely, bravely, boldly confronted public danger and she is only ahead of many of her sisters because of her greater facility for speedy action. The greater majority of those sister states, under like circumstances, consider her cause as their cause. And I charge you in their name today, touch not Saguntum. It is not only their cause, but it is a cause which receives the sympathy and will receive the support of tens and hundreds of honest patriot men in the non-slaveholding states who have hitherto maintained constitutional rights and who respect their oaths, abide by compacts, and love justice. And while this Congress this Senate and this House of Representatives are debating the constitutionality and the expediency of seceding from the Union, and while the perfidious authors of this mischief are showering down denunciations upon a large portion of the patriotic men of this country, those brave men are coolly and calmly voting what you call revolution. I, sir, doing better than that, arming to defend it. 
They appealed to the Constitution, they appealed to justice, they appealed to fraternity, until the Constitution, justice, and fraternity were no longer listened to in the legislative halls of their country. And then, sir, they prepared for the arbitrament of the sword. And now you see the glittering bayonet, and you hear the tramp of armed men from your capital to the Rio Grande. It is a sight that gladdens the eyes and cheers the hearts of other millions ready to second them. Inasmuch, sir, as I have labored earnestly, honestly, sincerely with these men to avert this necessity so long as I deemed it possible, and inasmuch as I heartily approve their present conduct of resistance, I deem it my duty to state their case to the Senate, to the country, and to the civilized world. Senators, my countrymen have demanded no new government. They have demanded no new constitution. Look to their records at home and from here from the beginning of this national strife until its consummation in the disruption of the empire. And they have not demanded a single thing except that you shall abide by the Constitution of the United States, that constitutional rights shall be respected, and that justice shall be done. Sirs, they have stood by your Constitution they have stood by all its requirements. They have performed all its duties unselfishly, uncalculatingly, disinterestedly, until a party sprang up in this country which endangered their social system, a party which they arraign and which they charge before the American people and all mankind with having made proclamation of outlawry against 4,000 millions of their property in the territories of the United States, with having put them under the ban of the empire in all the states in which their institutions exist outside the protection of federal laws with having aided and abetted insurrection from within and invasion from without with the view of subverting those institutions and desolating their homes and their firesides for these causes they have taken up arms I have stated that the discontented states of this Union have demanded nothing but clear, distinct, unequivocal, well-acknowledged constitutional rights, rights affirmed by the highest judicial tribunals of their country, rights older than the Constitution, rights which are planted upon the immutable principles of natural justice, rights which have been affirmed by the good and the wise of all countries and of all centuries. We demand no power to injure any man. We demand no power to injure our Confederate states. We demand no right to interfere with their institutions, either by word or deed. We have no right to disturb their peace, their tranquility, their security. We have demanded of them simply, solely, nothing else to give us equality, security, and tranquility. Give us these, and peace restores itself. Refuse them, and take what you can get. What do the rebels demand? First, that the people of the United States shall have an equal right to emigrate and settle in the present or any future acquired territories with whatever property they may possess, including slaves, and be securely protected in its peaceable enjoyment until such territory may be admitted as a state into the Union, with or without slavery, as she may determine on an equality with all existing states. That is our territorial demand. We have fought for this territory when blood was its price. We have paid for it when gold was its price. We have not proposed to exclude you, though you have contributed very little of blood or money. I refer especially to New England. 
We demand only to go into those territories upon terms of equality with you, as equals in this great confederacy, to enjoy the common property of the whole Union, and receive the protection of the common government until the territory is capable of coming into the Union as a sovereign state, when it may fix its own institutions to suit itself. The second proposition is that property in slaves shall be entitled to the same protection from the government of the United States in all of its departments everywhere, which the Constitution confers the power upon it to extend to any other property, provided nothing herein contained shall be construed to limit or restrain the right now belonging to every state to prohibit, abolish, or establish and protect slavery within its limits. We demand of the common government to use its granted powers to protect our property as well as yours. For this protection we pay as much as you do. This very property is subject to taxation. It has been taxed by you and sold by you for taxes. The title to thousands and tens of thousands of slaves is derived from the United States. We claim that the government, while the Constitution recognizes our property for the purposes of taxation, shall give it the same protection that it gives yours. Ought it not to be so? You say no. Every one of you upon the committee said no. Your senators say no. Your House of Representatives says no. Throughout the length and breadth of your conspiracy against the Constitution, there is but one shout of no. This recognition of this right is the price of my allegiance. Withhold it, and you do not get my obedience. This is the philosophy of the armed men who have sprung up in this country. Do you ask me to support a government that will tax my property, that will plunder me, that will demand my blood, and will not protect me? I would rather see the population of my native state laid six feet beneath her sod than they should support for one hour such a government. Protection is the price of obedience everywhere, in all countries. It is the only thing that makes government respectable. Deny it, and you cannot have free subjects or citizens. You may have slaves. We demand, in the next place, that persons committing crimes against slave property in one state and freeing to another shall be delivered up in the same manner as persons committing crimes against other property, and that the laws of the state from which such persons flee shall be the test of criminality. That is another one of the demands of an extremist and a rebel. But the non-slaveholding states, treacherous to their oaths and compacts, have steadily refused, if the criminal only stole a negro and that negro was a slave, to deliver him up. It was refused twice on the requisition of my own state as long as 22 years ago. It was refused by Kent and by Fairfield, governors of Maine, and representing, I believe, each of the then federal parties. We appealed then to fraternity, but we submitted. And this constitutional right has been practically a dead letter from that day to this. The next case came up between us and the state of New York, when the present senior senator, Mr. Seward, was the governor of that state, and he refused it. Why? He said it was not against the laws of New York to steal a Negro, and therefore he would not comply with the demand. He made a similar refusal to Virginia. Yet these are our confederates. These are our sister states. There is the bargain. There is the compact. You have sworn to it. Both these governors swore to it. The senator from New York swore to it. The governor of Ohio swore to it when he was inaugurated. You cannot bind them by oaths. Yet they talk to us of treason, and I suppose they expect to whip freemen into loving such brethren. They will have a good time in doing it.
It is natural we would want this provision of the Constitution carried out. The Constitution says slaves are property. The Supreme Court says so. The Constitution says so. The theft of slaves is a crime. They are a subject matter of felonious asportation. By the text and letter of the Constitution, you agreed to give them up. You have sworn to do it, and you have broken your oaths. Of course, those who have done so look out for pretext. Nobody expected them to do otherwise. I do not think I ever saw a perjurer, however bald and naked, who could not invent some pretext to palliate his crime, or who could not for 15 shillings hire an old Bailey lawyer to invent some for him. Yet this requirement of the Constitution is another one of the extreme demands of an extremist and a rebel. The next stipulation is that fugitive slaves shall be surrendered under the provisions of the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 without being entitled either to a writ of habeas corpus or trial by jury or other similar obstructions of legislation in the state to which he may flee. Here is the Constitution. No person held to service or labor in one state under the laws thereof, escaping into another, shall, in consequence of any law or regulation therein, be discharged from such service or labor, but shall be delivered up on claim of the party to whom such service or labor may be due. This language is plain, and everybody understood it the same way for the first forty years of your government. In 1793, in Washington's time, an act was passed to carry out this provision. It was adopted unanimously in the Senate of the United States and nearly so in the House of Representatives. Nobody then had invented pretexts to show that the Constitution did not mean a Negro slave. It was clear, it was plain, not only in the federal courts, but all the local courts in all the states decided that this was a constitutional obligation. How is it now? The North sought to evade it, following the instincts of their natural character. They commenced with the fraudulent fiction that fugitives were entitled to habeas corpus, entitled to trial by jury in the state to which they fled. They pretended to believe that our fugitive slaves were entitled to more rights than their white citizens. Perhaps they were right. They know one another better than I do. You may charge a white man with treason or felony or other crime, and you do not require any trial by jury before he is given up. There is nothing to determine but that he is legally charged with a crime and that he fled and then he is to be delivered up upon demand. White people are delivered up every day in this way, but not slaves. Slaves, black people, you say, are entitled to trial by jury, and in this way schemes have been invented to defeat your plain constitutional obligations. Senators, the Constitution is a compact. It contains all our obligations and the duties of the federal government. I am content and have ever been content to sustain it. While I doubt its perfection, while I do not believe it was a good compact, and while I never saw the day that I would have voted for it as a proposition de novo, yet I am bound to it by oath and by that common prudence which would induce men to abide by established forms rather than to rush into unknown dangers. I have given to it, and intend to give to it, unfaltering support and allegiance. But I choose to put that allegiance on the true ground, not on the false idea that anybody's blood was shed for it. I say that the Constitution is the whole compact. All the obligations, all the chains that fetter the limbs of my people are nominated in the bond, and they wisely excluded any conclusion against them by declaring that the powers not granted by the Constitution to the United States or forbidden by it to the states belong to the states respectively or the people. Now I will try it by that standard. I will subject it to that test.
the law of nature, the law of justice would say, and it is so expounded by the publicists, that equal rights in the common property should be enjoyed. Even in a monarchy, the king cannot prevent the subjects from enjoying equality in the disposition of the public property. Even in a despotic government, this principle is recognized. It was the blood and the money of the whole people, says the learned Grotius and say all the publicists, which acquired the public property, and therefore it is not the property of the sovereign. This right of equality being then, according to justice and natural equity, a right belonging to all states, when did we give it up? You say Congress has a right to pass rules and regulations concerning the territory and other property of the United States. Very well. Does that exclude those whose blood and money paid for it? Does dispose of mean to rob the rightful owners? You must show a better title than that, or a better sword than we have. What, then, will you take? You will take nothing but your own judgment. That is, you will not only judge for yourselves, not only discard the court, discard our construction, discard the practice of the government, but you will drive us out simply because you will it. Come and do it. You have sapped the foundations of society. You have destroyed almost all hope of peace. In a compact where there is no common arbiter, where the parties finally decide for themselves, the sword alone at last becomes the real, if not the constitutional, arbiter. Your party says that you will not take the decision of the Supreme Court. You said so at Chicago. You said so in committee. Every man of you in both houses says so. What are you going to do? You say we shall submit to your construction. We shall do it if you can make us, but not otherwise, or in any other manner. That is settled. You may call it secession, or you may call it revolution, but there is a big fact standing before you, ready to oppose you. That fact is... Freemen with arms in their hands. End of section 38. Section 39. Appendix D. Speeches for Study and Practice. Theodore Roosevelt. Inaugural Address, 1905. My fellow citizens, no people on earth have more cause to be thankful than ours, and this is said reverently in no spirit of boastfulness in our own strength, but with gratitude to the giver of good, who has blessed us with the conditions which have enabled us to achieve so large a measure of well-being and happiness. To us as a people it has been granted to lay the foundations of our national life in a new continent. We are the heirs of the ages, and yet we have had to pay few of the penalties which in old countries are exacted by the dead hand of a bygone civilization. We have not been obliged to fight for our existence against any alien race, and yet our life has called for the vigor and effort without which the manlier and hardier virtues wither away. Under such conditions it would be our own fault if we failed and the success which we have had in the past, the success which we confidently believe the future will bring, should cause in us no feeling of vain glory, but rather a deep and abiding realization of all that life has offered us, a full acknowledgement of the responsibility which is ours, and a fixed determination to show that under a free government a mighty people can thrive best, alike as regard the things of the body and the things of the soul. Much has been given to us, and much will rightfully be expected from us. We have duties to others and duties to ourselves, and we can shirk neither. We have become a great nation, forced by the fact of its greatness into relation to the other nations of the earth, and we must behave as beseems a people with such responsibilities. Toward all other nations, large and small, our attitude must be one of cordial and sincere friendship. 
we must show not only in our words, but in our deeds, that we are earnestly desirous of securing their good will by acting toward them in a spirit of just and generous recognition of all their rights. But justice and generosity in a nation, as in an individual, count most when shown not by the weak, but by the strong. While ever careful to refrain from wronging others, we must be no less insistent that we are not wronged ourselves. We wish peace, but we wish the peace of justice, the peace of righteousness. We wish it because we think it is right, and not because we are afraid. No weak nation that acts rightly and justly should ever have cause to fear, and no strong power should ever be able to single us out as a subject for insolent aggression. Our relations with the other powers of the world are important, but still more important are our relations among ourselves. Such growth in wealth, in population, and in power, as a nation has seen during a century and a quarter of its national life, is inevitably accompanied by a like growth in the problems which are ever before every nation that rises to greatness. Power invariably means both responsibility and danger. Our forefathers faced certain perils which we have outgrown. We now face other perils, the very existence of which it was impossible that they should foresee. Modern life is both complex and intense, and the tremendous changes wrought by the extraordinary industrial development of the half-century are felt in every fiber of our social and political being. Never before have men tried so vast and formidable an experiment as that of administering the affairs of a continent under the forms of a democratic republic. The conditions which have told for our marvelous material well-being, which have developed to a very high degree our energy, self-reliance, and individual initiative, also have brought the care and anxiety inseparable from the accumulation of great wealth in industrial centers. Upon the success of our experiment much depends, not only as regards our own welfare, but as regards the welfare of mankind. If we fail, the cause of free self-government throughout the world will rock to its foundations and therefore our responsibility is heavy to ourselves, to the world as it is today, and to the generations yet unborn. There is no good reason why we should fear the future, but there is every reason why we should face it seriously, neither hiding from ourselves the gravity of the problems before us, nor fearing to approach these problems with the unbending, unflinching purpose to solve them aright. Yet after all, though the problems are new, though the tasks set before us differ from the tasks set before our fathers who founded and preserved this republic, the spirit in which these tasks must be undertaken and these problems faced, if our duty is to be well done, remains essentially unchanged. We know that self-government is difficult. We know that no people needs such high traits of character as that people which seeks to govern its affairs aright through the freely expressed will of the free men who compose it. But we have faith that we shall not prove false to memories of the men of the mighty past. They did their work. They left us the splendid heritage we now enjoy. We in turn have an assured confidence that we shall be able to leave this heritage unwasted and enlarged to our children's children. To do so, we must show, not merely in great crises, but in the everyday affairs of life, the qualities of practical intelligence, of courage, of hardihood and endurance, and, above all, the power of devotion to a lofty ideal which made great the men who founded this republic in the days of Washington, which made great the men who preserved this republic in the days of Abraham Lincoln. On American Motherhood, 1905. 
Footnote. From his speech in Washington on March 13, 1905, before the National Congress of Mothers, printed from a copy furnished by the President for this collection, in response to a request. In our modern industrial civilization, there are many and grave dangers to counterbalance the splendors and the triumphs. It is not a good thing to see cities grow at disproportionate speed relatively to the country, for the small landowners, the men who own their little homes, and therefore to a very large extent the men who till farms, the men of the soil, have hitherto made the foundation of lasting national life in every state, and, if the foundation becomes either too weak or too narrow, the superstructure, no matter how attractive, is in imminent danger of falling. But far more important than the question of the occupation of our citizens is the question of how their family life is conducted. No matter what that occupation may be, as long as there is a real home, and as long as those who make up that home do their duty to one another, to their neighbors, and to the state, it is of minor consequence whether the man's trade is plied in the country or in the city, whether it calls for the work of the hands or for the work of the head. No piled-up worth, no splendor of material growth, no brilliance of artistic development will permanently avail any people unless its home life is healthy, unless the average man possesses honesty, courage, common sense, and decency, unless he works hard and is willing at need to fight hard, and unless the average woman is a good wife, a good mother, able and willing to perform the first and greatest duty of womanhood, able and willing to bear and to bring up, as they should be brought up, healthy children, sound in body, mind, and character, and numerous enough so that the race shall increase and not decrease. There are certain old truths which will be true as long as this world endures, and which no amount of progress can alter. One of these is the truth that the primary duty of the husband is to be the homemaker, the breadwinner for his wife and children, and that the primary duty of the woman is to be the helpmate, the housewife, and mother. The woman should have ample educational advantages, but save in exceptional cases, the man must be, and she need not be, and generally ought not to be, trained for a lifelong career as the family breadwinner. And therefore, after a certain point, the training of the two must normally be different, because the duties of the two are normally different. This does not mean inequality of function, but it does mean that normally there must be dissimilarity of function. On the whole, I think the duty of the woman the more important, the more difficult, and the more honorable of the two. On the whole, I respect the woman who does her duty even more than I respect the man who does his. No ordinary work done by a man is either as hard or as responsible as the work of a woman who is bringing up a family of small children for upon her time and strength demands are made not only every hour of the day, but often every hour of the night. She may have to get up night after night to take care of a sick child, and yet must, by day, continue to do all her household duties as well. And if the family means are scant, she must usually enjoy even her rare holidays taking a whole brood of children with her. The birth pangs make all men the debtors of all women. Above all, our sympathy and regard are due to the struggling wives amongst those whom Abraham Lincoln called the plain people, and whom he so loved and trusted. For the lives of these women are often led on the lonely heights of quiet, self-sacrificing heroism. Just as the happiness and most honorable and most useful task that can be set any man is to earn enough for the support of his wife and family, for the bringing up and starting in life of his children, 
so the most important, the most honorable and desirable task which can be set any woman is to be a good and wise mother in a home marked by self-respect and mutual forbearance, by willingness to perform duty, and by refusal to sink into self-indulgence or avoid that which entails effort and self-sacrifice. Of course there are exceptional men and exceptional women who can do and ought to do much more than this, who can lead and ought to lead great careers of outside usefulness in addition to, not as substitutes for, their home work. But I am not speaking of exceptions. I am speaking of the primary duties. I am speaking of the average citizens, the average men and women who make up the nation. Inasmuch as I am speaking to an assemblage of mothers, I shall have nothing whatsoever to say in praise of an easy life. Yours is the work which is never ended. No mother has an easy time. The most mothers have very hard times. And yet what true mother would barter her experience of joy and sorrow in exchange for a life of cold selfishness? which insists upon perpetual amusement and the avoidance of care, and which often finds its fit dwelling place in some flat designed to furnish, with the least possible expenditure of effort, the maximum of comfort and of luxury, but in which there is literally no place for children. The woman who is a good wife, a good mother, is entitled to our respect as is no one else but she is entitled to it only because, and so long as, she is worthy of it. Effort and self-sacrifice are the law of worthy life for the man as for the woman, though neither the effort nor the self-sacrifice may be the same for the one as for the other. I do not in the least believe in the patient Griselda type of woman, in the woman who submits to gross and long continued ill treatment, any more than I believe in a man who tamely submits to wrongful aggression. No wrongdoing is so abhorrent as wrongdoing by a man toward the wife and the children who should arouse every tender feeling in his nature selfishness toward them, lack of tenderness toward them, lack of consideration for them, above all brutality in any form toward them, should arouse the heartiest scorn and indignation in every upright soul. I believe in the woman keeping her self-respect just as I believe in the man doing so. I believe in her rights just as much as I believe in the man's, and indeed a little more, and I regard marriage as a partnership in which each partner is in honor, bound to think of the rights of the other as well as of his or her own. But I think that the duties are even more important than the rights, and in the long run I think that the reward is ampler and greater for duty well done than for the insistence upon individual rights necessary though this too must often be. Your duty is hard, your responsibility great, but greatest of all is your reward. I do not pity you in the least. On the contrary, I feel respect and admiration for you. Into the woman's keeping is committed the destiny of the generations to come after us. In bringing up your children, you mothers must remember that while it is essential to be loving and tender, it is no less essential to be wise and firm. Foolishness and affection must not be treated as interchangeable terms. And besides training your sons and daughters in the softer and milder virtues, you must seek to give them those stern and hardy qualities which in after life they will surely need. Some children will go wrong in spite of the best training, and some will go right even when their surroundings are most unfortunate. Nevertheless, an immense amount depends upon the family training. If you mothers through weakness bring up your sons to be selfish and to think only of themselves, you will be responsible for much sadness among the women who are to be their wives in the future. 
if you let your daughters grow up idle perhaps under the mistaken impression that as you yourselves have had to work hard they should know only enjoyment you are preparing them to be useless to others and burdens to themselves teach boys and girls alike that they are not to look forward to lives spent in avoiding difficulties but to lives spent in overcoming difficulties teach them that work for themselves and also for others is not curse but a blessing seek to make them happy to make them enjoy life but seek also to make them face life with a steadfast resolution to wrest success from labor and adversity and to do their whole duty before god and to man surely she who can thus train her sons and her daughters is thrice fortunate among women there are many good people who are denied the supreme blessing of children and for these we have the respect and sympathy always due to those who from no fault of their own are denied any of the other great blessings of life but a man or woman who deliberately foregoes these blessings whether from viciousness coldness shallow-heartedness self-indulgence or mere failure to appreciate aright the difference between the all-important and the unimportant why such a creature merits contempt as hearty as any visited upon the soldier who runs away in battle or upon the man who refuses to work for the support of those dependent upon him and who though able-bodied is yet content to eat in idleness the bread which others provide the existence of women of this type forms one of the most unpleasant and unwholesome features of modern life if any one is so dim of vision as to fail to see what a thoroughly unlovely creature such a woman is, I wish they would read Judge Robert Grant's novel Unleavened Bread, ponder seriously the character of Selma, and think of the fate that would surely overcome any nation which developed its average and typical woman along such lines unfortunately it would be untrue to say that this type exists only in american novels that it also exists in american life is made unpleasantly evident by the statistics as to the dwindling families in some localities it is made evident in equally sinister fashion by the census statistics as to divorce which are fairly appalling for easy divorce is now as it ever has been a bane to any nation a curse to society a menace to the home an incitement to married unhappiness and to immorality an evil thing for men and a still more hideous evil for women these unpleasant tendencies in our american life are made evident by articles such as those which i actually read not long ago in a certain paper where a clergyman was quoted seemingly with approval as expressing the general american attitude when he said that the ambition of any save a very rich man should be to rear two children only so as to give his children an opportunity to taste a few of the good things of life. This man, whose profession and calling should have made him a moral teacher, actually set before others the ideal not of training children to do their duty, not of sending them forth with stout hearts and ready minds to win triumphs for themselves and their country, not of allowing them the opportunity and giving them the privilege of making their own place in the world but forsooth of keeping the number of children so limited that they might taste a few good things the way to give a child a fair chance in life is not to bring it up in luxury but to see that it has the kind of training that will give it strength of character even apart from the vital question of national life and regarding only the individual interest of the children themselves 
Happiness in the true sense is a hundredfold more apt to come to any given member of a healthy family of healthy-minded children, well brought up, well educated, but taught that they must shift for themselves, must win their own way, and by their own exertions make their own positions of usefulness, than it is apt to come to those whose parents themselves have acted on and have trained their children to act on the selfish and sordid theory that the whole end of life is to taste a few good things. The intelligence of the remark is on a par with its morality for the most rudimentary mental process would have shown the speaker that if the average family in which there are children contained but two children, the nation as a whole would decrease in population so rapidly that in two or three generations it would very deservedly be on the point of extinction so that the people who had acted on this base and selfish doctrine would be giving place to others with braver and more robust ideals. Nor would such a result be in any way regrettable, for a race that practiced such doctrine, that is, a race that practiced race suicide, would thereby conclusively show that it was unfit to exist and that it had better give place to people who had not forgotten the primary laws of their being. To sum up, then, the whole matter is simple enough. If either a race or an individual prefers the pleasure of more effortless ease, of self-indulgence, to the infinitely deeper, the infinitely higher pleasures that come to those who know the toil and the weariness, but also the joy of hard duty well done, why, that race or that individual must inevitably in the end pay the penalty of leading a life both vapid and ignoble. No man and no woman really worthy of the name can care for the life spent solely or chiefly in the avoidance of risk and trouble and labor. Save in exceptional cases, the prizes worth having in life must be paid for, and the life worth living must be a life of work for a worthy end, and ordinarily of work more for others than for one's self. The woman's task is not easy. No task worth doing is easy. But in doing it, and when she has done it, there shall come to her the highest and holiest joy known to mankind. And having done it, she shall have the reward prophesied in Scripture. For her husband and her children, yes, and all people who realize that her work lies at the foundation of all national happiness and greatness, shall rise up and call her blessed. End of section 39, section 40. Appendix D, Speeches for Study and Practice, Alton B. Parker, The Call to Democrats. From a speech opening the National Democratic Convention at Baltimore, Maryland, June 1912. It is not the wild and cruel methods of revolution and violence that are needed to correct the abuses incident to our government as to all things human. Neither material nor moral progress lies that way. We have made our government and our complicated institutions by appeals to reason, seeking to educate all our people that day after day, year after year, century after century, they may see more clearly, act more justly, become more and more attached to the fundamental ideas that underlie our society. If we are to preserve undiminished the heritage bequeathed us and add to it those accretions without which society would perish, we shall need all the powers that the school, the church, the court, the deliberative assembly, and the quiet thought of our people can bring to bear. We're called upon to do battle against the unfaithful guardians of our constitution and liberties and the hordes of ignorance which are pushing forward only to the ruin of our social and governmental fabric. 
Too long has the country endured the offenses of the leaders of a party which once knew greatness. Too long have we been blind to the bacchanal of corruption. Too long have we listlessly watched the assembling of the forces that threaten our country and our firesides. The time has come when the salvation of the country demands the restoration to place and power of men of high ideals who will wage unceasing war against corruption in politics, who will enforce the law against both rich and poor, and who will treat guilt as personal and punish it accordingly. What is our duty? To think alike as to men and measures? Impossible, even for our great party. There is not a reactionary among us. All Democrats are progressives. But it is inevitably human that we shall not all agree that in a single highway is found the only road to progress, or each make the same man of all our worthy candidates his first choice. It is possible, however, and it is our duty to put aside all selfishness, to consent cheerfully that the majority shall speak for each of us, and to march out of this convention shoulder to shoulder, intoning the praises of our chosen leader. And that will be his due, whichever of the honorable and able men now claiming our attention shall be chosen. End of section 40. Section 41. Appendix D. Speeches for study and practice. John W. Westcott nominating Woodrow Wilson. At the National Democratic Convention, Baltimore, Maryland, June 1912. The New Jersey delegation is commissioned to represent the great cause of democracy and to offer you, as its militant and triumphant leader, a scholar, not a charlatan, a statesman, not a doctrinaire, a profound lawyer, not a splitter of legal hairs, a political economist, not an egotistical theorist, a practical politician who constructs, modifies, restrains, without disturbance and destruction, a resistless debater and consummate master of statement, not a mere sophist, a humanitarian, not a defamer of characters and lives, a man whose mind is at once cosmopolitan and composite of America, a gentleman of unpretentious habits with the fear of God in his heart, and the love of mankind exhibited in every act of his life. Above all, a public servant who has been tried to the uttermost and never found wanting, matchless, unconquerable, the ultimate Democrat, Woodrow Wilson. New Jersey has reasons for her course. Let us not be deceived in our premises. Campaigns of vilification, corruption, and false pretense have lost their usefulness. The evolution of national energy is towards a more intelligent morality in politics and in all other relations. The situation admits of no compromise. The temper and purpose of the American public will tolerate no other view. The indifference of the American people to politics has disappeared. Any platform and any candidate not conforming to this vast social and commercial behest will go down to ignominious defeat at the polls. Men are known by what they say and do. They are known by those who hate and oppose them. Many years ago, Woodrow Wilson said, No man is great who thinks himself so. And no man is good who does not try to secure the happiness and comfort of others. This is the secret of his life. The deeds of this moral and intellectual giant are known to all men. 
they accord not with the shams and false pretenses of politics, but make national harmony with the millions of patriots determined to correct the wrongs of plutocracy and reestablish the maxims of American liberty in all their regnant beauty and practical effectiveness. New Jersey loves Woodrow Wilson, not for the enemies he has made. New Jersey loves him for what he is. New Jersey argues that Woodrow Wilson is the only candidate who can not only make democratic success a certainty, but secure the electoral vote of almost every state in the Union. New Jersey will endorse his nomination by a majority of 100,000 of the liberated citizens. We're not building for a day or even a generation, but for all time. New Jersey believes that there is an omniscience in national instinct. That instinct centers in Woodrow Wilson. He has been in political life less than two years. He has had no organization, only a practical ideal, the reestablishment of equal opportunity. Not his deeds alone, not his immortal words alone, not his personality alone, not his matchless powers alone, but all combined compel national faith and confidence in him. Every crisis evolves its master. Time and circumstance have evolved Woodrow Wilson. The North, the South, the East, and the West unite in him. New Jersey appeals to this convention to give the nation Woodrow Wilson, that he may open the gates of opportunity to every man, woman, and child under our flag. By reforming abuses and thereby teaching them, in his matchless words, to release their energies intelligently, that peace, justice, and prosperity may reign. New Jersey rejoices through her freely chosen representatives to name for the presidency of the United States the Princeton schoolmaster Woodrow Wilson. End of section 41. Section 42. Appendix D, Speeches for Study and Practice. Henry W. Grady, The Race Problem. Delivered at the annual banquet of the Boston Merchants Association at Boston, Massachusetts, December 12, 1889. Mr. President, bidden by your invitation to a discussion of the race problem, forbidden by occasion to make a political speech, I appreciate, in trying to reconcile orders with propriety, the perplexity of the little maid who, bidden to learn to swim, was yet adjured now go my darling hang your clothes on a hickory limb and don't go near the water the stoutest apostle of the church they say is the missionary and the missionary wherever he unfurls his flag will never find himself in deeper need of unction and address than i bidden tonight to plant the standard of a southern democrat in boston's banquet hall and to discuss the problem of the races in the home of Phillips and of Sumner. But, Mr. President, if a purpose to speak in perfect frankness and sincerity, if earnest understanding of the vast interests involved, if a consecrating sense of what disaster may follow, further misunderstanding and estrangement, if these may be counted upon to steady undisciplined speech and to strengthen an untried arm, then, sir, I shall find the courage to proceed. Happy am I that this mission has brought my feet at last to press New England's historic soil, and my eyes to the knowledge of her beauty and her thrift. Here, within touch of Plymouth Rock and Bunker Hill, where Webster thundered and Longfellow sang, Emerson thought and Channing preached, here, in the cradle of American letters and almost of American liberty, I hasten to make the obeisance that every American owes New England when first he stands uncovered in her mighty presence. Strange apparition! This stern and unique figure, carved from the ocean and the wilderness, its majesty kindling and growing amid the storms of winter and of wars, 
until at last the gloom was broken, its beauty disclosed in the sunshine, and the heroic workers rested at its base, while startled kings and emperors gazed and marveled that from the rude touch of this handful cast on a bleak and unknown shore should have come the embodied genius of human government and the perfected model of human liberty god bless the memory of those immortal workers and prosper the fortunes of their living sons and perpetuate the inspiration of their handiwork Two years ago, sir, I spoke some words in New York that caught the attention of the North. As I stand here to reiterate, as I have done everywhere, every word I then uttered, to declare that the sentiments I then avowed were universally approved in the South, I realize that the confidence begotten by that speech is largely responsible for my presence here tonight. I should dishonor myself if I betrayed that confidence by uttering one insincere word, or by withholding one essential element of the truth. Apropos of this last, let me confess, Mr. President, before the praise of New England has died on my lips, that I believe the best product of her present life is the procession of 17,000 Vermont Democrats that for 22 years, undiminished by death, unrecruited by birth or conversion, have marched over their rugged hills, cast their Democratic ballots, and gone back home to pray for their unregenerate neighbors and awake to read the record of 26,000 Republican majority. May the God of the helpless and the heroic help them, and may their sturdy tribe increase. Far to the south, Mr. President, separated from this section by a line, once defined in irrepressible difference, once traced in fratricidal blood, and now, thank God, but a vanishing shadow, lies the fairest and richest domain of this earth. It is the home of a brave and hospitable people. There is centered all that can please or prosper humankind. A perfect climate above a fertile soil yields to the husbandman every product of the temperate zone. There by night the cotton whitens beneath the stars, and by day the wheat locks the sunshine in its bearded sheaf. In the same field the clover steals the fragrance of the wind, and tobacco catches the quick aroma of the rains. There are mountains stored with exhaustless treasures, forests vast and primeval, and rivers that, tumbling or loitering, run wanton to the sea. Of the three essential items of all industries, cotton, iron, and wood, that region has easy control. In cotton, a fixed monopoly. In iron, proven supremacy. In timber, the reserve supply of the Republic. From this assured and permanent advantage, against which artificial conditions cannot much longer prevail, has grown an amazing system of industries. Not maintained by human contrivance of tariff or capital, are far off from the fullest and cheapest source of supply but resting in divine assurance within touch of field and mine and forest not set amid costly farms from which competition has driven the farmer in despair but amid cheap and sunny lands rich with agriculture to which neither season nor soil has set a limit this system of industries is mounting to a splendor that shall dazzle and illumine the world that sir is the picture and the promise of my home a land better and fairer than i have told you and yet but fit setting in its material excellence for the loyal and gentle quality of its citizenship against that sir we have new england recruiting the republic from its sturdy loins shaking from its overcrowded hives new swarms of workers and touching this land all over with its energy and its courage and yet while in the el dorado of which i have told you but fifteen per cent of its lands are cultivated its mines scarcely touched and its population so scant that were it set equidistant 
the sound of the human voice could not be heard from Virginia to Texas, while on the threshold of nearly every house in New England stands a son, seeking, with troubled eyes, some new land in which to carry his modest patrimony. The strange fact remains that in 1880 the South had fewer northern-born citizens than she had in 1870, few in 70 than in 60. Why is this? Why is it, sir, though the section line be now but a mist that the breath may dispel? Fewer men of the north have crossed it over to the south than when it was crimson with the best blood of the republic, or even when the slaveholders stood guard every inch of its way. There can be but one answer. It is the very problem we are now to consider. The key that opens that problem will unlock to the world the fairest half of this republic, and free the halted feet of thousands whose eyes are already kindling with its beauty. Better than this, it will open the hearts of brothers for thirty years estranged, and clasp in lasting comradeship a million hands now withheld in doubt. Nothing, sir, but this problem and the suspicions it breeds hinders a clear understanding and a perfect union. Nothing else stands between us and such love as bound Georgia and Massachusetts at Valley Forge and Yorktown, chastened by the sacrifices of Manassas and Gettysburg, and illumined with the coming of better work and a nobler destiny than was ever wrought with the sword or sought at the cannon's mouth. If this does not invite your patient hearing tonight, hear one thing more. My people, your brothers in the South, brothers in blood, in destiny, in all that is best in our past and future, are so beset with this problem that their very existence depends on its right solution. Nor are they wholly to blame for its presence. The slave ships of the Republic sailed from your ports, the slaves worked in our fields. You will not defend the traffic, nor I the institution. But I do here declare that in its wise and humane administration, in lifting the slave to heights of which he has not dreamed in his savage home, and giving him a happiness he has not yet found in freedom, our fathers left their sons a saving and excellent heritage. In the storm of war, this institution was lost. I thank God as heartily as you do that human slavery is gone forever from American soil. But the freedman remains, with him a problem without precedent or parallel. Note its appalling conditions. Two utterly dissimilar races on the same soil, with equal political and civil rights, almost equal in numbers, but terribly unequal in intelligence and responsibility. Each pledged against fusion, one for a century in servitude to the other, and freed at last by a desolating war, the experiment sought by neither but approached by both with doubt. These are the conditions. Under these, adverse at every point, we are required to carry these two races in peace and honor to the end. Never, sir, has such a task been given to mortal stewardship. Never before in this republic has the white race divided on the rights of an alien race. The red man was cut down as a weed because he hindered the way of the American citizen. The yellow man was shut out of this republic because he is an alien and inferior. The red man was owner of the land. The yellow man was highly civilized and assimilable. But they hindered both sections and are gone. But the black man, affecting but one section, is clothed with every privilege of government and pinned to the soil and my people commanded to make good at any hazard and at any cost his full and equal heirship of American privilege and prosperity. It matters not that every other race has been routed or excluded without rhyme or reason. It matters not that wherever the whites and the blacks have touched, in any era or in any clime, there has been an irreconcilable violence. 
It matters not that no two races, however similar, have lived anywhere, at any time, on the same soil, with equal rights, in peace. In spite of these things, we are commanded to make good this change of American policy, which has not perhaps changed American prejudice, to make certain here what has elsewhere been impossible between whites and blacks, and to reverse, under the very worst conditions, the universal verdict of racial history. And driven, sir, to this superhuman task with an impatience that brooks no delay, a rigor that accepts no excuse, and a suspicion that discourages frankness and sincerity. We do not shrink from this trial. It is so interwoven with our industrial fabric that we cannot disentangle it if we would so bound up in our honorable obligation to the world that we would not if we could. Can we solve it? The God who gave it into our hands, he alone can know. But this the weakest and wisest of us do know. We cannot solve it with less than your tolerant and patient sympathy, with less than the knowledge that the blood that runs in your veins is our blood, and that when we have done our best, whether the issue be lost or won, we shall feel your strong arms about us and hear the beating of your approving hearts. The resolute, clear-headed, broad-minded men of the South, the men whose genius made glorious every page of the first seventy years of American history, whose courage and fortitude you tested in five years of the fiercest war, whose energy has made bricks without straw and spread splendor amid the ashes of their war-wasted homes, these men wear this problem in their hearts and brains by day and by night. They realize, as you cannot, what this problem means, what they owe to this kindly and dependent race, the measure of their debt to the world, in whose despite they defended and maintained slavery. And though their feet are hindered in its undergrowth, and their march cumbered with its burdens, they have lost neither the patience from which comes clearness, nor the faith from which comes courage. Nor, sir, when in passionate moments is disclosed to them that vague and awful shadow, with its lurid abysses and its crimson stains, into which I pray God they may never go. Are they struck with more of apprehension than is needed to complete their consecration? Such is the temper of my people. But what of the problem itself? Mr. President, we need not go one step further unless you concede right here that the people I speak for are as honest, as sensible, and as just as your people seeking as earnestly as you would in their place to rightly solve the problem that touches them at every vital point. If you insist that they are ruffians, blindly striving with bludgeon and shotgun to plunder and oppress a race, then I shall sacrifice my self-respect and tax your patience in vain. But admit that they are men of common sense and common honesty, wisely modifying an environment they cannot wholly disregard, guiding and controlling as best they can the vicious and irresponsible of either race, compensating error with frankness and retrieving in patience what they lost in passion, and conscious all the time that wrong means ruin? Admit this, and we may reach an understanding tonight. The President of the United States, in his late message to Congress, discussing the plea that the South should be left to solve this problem, asks, Are they at work upon it? What solution do they offer? When will the black man cast a free ballot? When will he have the civil rights that are his? I shall not here protest against a partisanry that, for the first time in our history, in time of peace, has stamped with the great seal of our government a stigma upon the people of a great and loyal section. Though I gratefully remember that the great dead soldier who held the helm of state for the eight stormiest years of Reconstruction, 
never found need for such a step and though there is no personal sacrifice i would not make to remove this cruel and unjust imputation on my people from the archives of my country but sir backed by a record on every page of which is progress i venture to make earnest and respectful answer to the questions that are asked we give to the world this year a crop of seven million five hundred thousand bales of cotton worth four hundred and fifty million dollars and its cash equivalent in grain grasses and fruit this enormous crop could not have come from the hands of sullen and discontented labor it comes from peaceful fields in which laughter and gossip rise above the hum of industry and contentment runs with a singing plough it is claimed that this ignorant labor is defrauded of its just hire i present the tax books of georgia which show that the negro twenty-five years ago a slave has in georgia alone ten million dollars of assessed property worth twice that much does not that record honor him and vindicate his neighbors what people penniless illiterate has done so well for every afro-american agitator stirring the strife in which alone he prospers i can show you a thousand negroes happy in their cabin homes tilling their own land by day and at night taking from the lips of their children the helpful message their state sends them from the schoolhouse door and the schoolhouse itself bears testimony in georgia we added last year two hundred and fifty thousand dollars to the school fund making a total of more than one million dollars and this in the face of prejudice not yet conquered of the fact that the whites are assessed for three hundred and sixty eight million dollars the blacks for ten million dollars and yet forty nine per cent of the beneficiaries are black children and in the doubt of many wise men if education helps or can help our problem charleston with her taxable values cut half in two since eighteen sixty pays more in proportion for public schools than boston although it is easier to give much out of much than little out of little the south with one-seventh of the taxable property of the country with relatively larger debt having received only one-twelfth as much of public lands and having back of its tax books none of the five hundred million dollars of bonds that enrich the north and though it pays annually twenty six million dollars to your section as pensions yet gives nearly one-sixth to the public school fund the south since eighteen sixty five has spent one hundred and twenty two million dollars in education and this year is pledged to spend thirty two million dollars more for state and city schools although the blacks paying one thirtieth of the taxes get nearly one half of the fund go into our fields and see whites and blacks working side by side on our buildings in the same squad in our shops at the same forge often the blacks crowd the whites from work or lower wages by their greater need and simpler habits and yet are permitted because we want to bar them from no avenue in which their feet are fitted to tread they could not there be elected orators of white universities as they have been here but they do enter there a hundred useful trades that are closed against them here we hold it better and wiser to tend the weeds in the garden than to water the exotic in the window in the south there are negro lawyers teachers editors dentists doctors preachers multiplying with the increased ability of their race to support them in villages and towns they have their military companies equipped from the armories of the state their churches and societies built and supported largely by their neighbors what is the testimony of the courts in penal legislation we have steadily reduced felonies to misdemeanors and have led the world in mitigating punishment for crime that we might save as far as possible this dependent race from its own weakness 
In our penitentiary record, 60% of the prosecutions are Negroes, and in every court the Negro criminal strikes the colored juror that white men may judge his case. In the North, one Negro in every 185 is in jail. In the South, only one in 446. In the North, the percentage of Negro prisoners is six times as great as that of native whites. In the South, only four times as great. If prejudice wrongs him in Southern courts, the record shows it to be deeper in Northern courts. I assert here, and a bar as intelligent and upright as the bar of Massachusetts will solemnly endorse my assertion that in the southern courts, from highest to lowest, pleading for life, liberty, or property, the Negro has distinct advantage because he is a Negro, apt to be overreached, oppressed, and that this advantage reaches from the juror in making his verdict to the judge in measuring his sentence. Now, Mr. President, can it be seriously maintained that we are terrorizing the people from whose willing hands comes every year one thousand million dollars of farm crops? Or have robbed a people who, twenty-five years from unrewarded slavery, have amassed in one state twenty million dollars of property? Or that we intend to oppress the people we are arming every day? Or deceive them? when we are educating them to the utmost limit of our ability, or outlaw them when we work side by side with them, or re-enslave them under legal forms, when for their benefit we have even imprudently narrowed the limit of felonies and mitigated the severity of law? My fellow countrymen, as you yourselves may sometimes have to appeal at the bar of human judgment for justice and for right, Give to my people tonight the fair and unanswerable conclusion of these incontestable facts. But it is claimed that under this fair seeming there is disorder and violence. This I admit, and there will be until there is one ideal community on earth after which we may pattern. But how widely is it misjudged? It is hard to measure with exactness whatever touches the Negro, his helplessness, his isolation, his century of servitude. These dispose us to emphasize and magnify his wrongs. This disposition, inflamed by prejudice and partisanry, has led to injustice and delusion. Lawless men may ravage a county in Iowa, and it is accepted as an incident. In the South, a drunken row is declared to be the fixed habit of the community. Regulators may whip vagabonds in Indiana by platoons, and it scarcely arrests attention. A chance collision in the South among relatively the same classes is gravely accepted as evidence that one race is destroying the other. We might as well claim that the Union was ungrateful to the colored soldier who followed its flag because a Grand Army post in Connecticut closed its door to a Negro veteran, as for you to give racial significance to every incident in the South, or to accept exceptional grounds as the rule of our society. I am not one of those who becloud American honor with the parade of the outrages of either section and belie American character by declaring them to be significant and representative. I prefer to maintain that they are neither and stand for nothing but the passion and sin of our poor fallen humanity. If society, like a machine, were no stronger than its weakest part, I should despair of both sections. But knowing that society, sentient and responsible in every fiber, can mend and repair until the whole has the strength of the best, I despair of neither. These gentlemen who come with me here, knit into Georgia's busy life as they are, never saw, I dare assert, an outrage committed on a Negro. And if they did, no one of you would be swifter to prevent or punish. It is through them and the men and women who think with them, making nine-tenths of every southern community, 
that these two races have been carried thus far with less of violence than would have been possible anywhere else on earth and in their fairness and courage and steadfastness more than in all the laws that can be passed or all the bayonets that can be mustered is the hope of our future when will the blacks cast a free ballot when ignorance anywhere is not dominated by the will of the intelligent when the laborer anywhere casts a vote unhindered by his boss when the vote of the poor anywhere is not influenced by the power of the rich when the strong and the steadfast do not everywhere control the suffrage of the weak and shiftless then and not till then will the ballot of the negro be free the white people of the South abandoned Mr. President, not in prejudice against the blacks, not in sectional estrangement, not in the hope of political dominion, but in a deep and abiding necessity. Here is this vast, ignorant, and purchasable vote, clannish, credulous, impulsive, and passionate, tempting every art of the demagogue, but insensible to the appeal of the statesman wrongly started in that it was led into alienation from its neighbor and taught to rely on the protection of an outside force it cannot be merged and lost in the two great parties through logical currents for it lacks political conviction and even that information on which conviction must be based it must remain a faction strong enough in every community to control on the slightest division of the whites under that division it becomes the prey of the cunning and unscrupulous of both parties its credulity is imposed upon its patience inflamed its cupidity tempted its impulses misdirected and even its superstition made to play its part in a campaign in which every interest of society is jeopardized and every approach to the ballot box debauched it is against such campaigns as this the folly and the bitterness and the danger of which every southern community has drunk deeply that the white people of the south are banded together just as you in massachusetts would be banded if three hundred thousand men not one in a hundred able to read his ballot banded in race instinct holding against you the memory of a century of slavery taught by your late conquerors to distrust and oppose you had already travested legislation from your state house and in every species of folly or villainy had wasted your substance and exhausted your credit but admitting the right of the whites to unite against this tremendous menace we are challenged with the smallness of our vote this has long been flippantly charged to be evidence and has now been solemnly and efficiently declared to be proof of political turpitude and baseness on our part let us see virginia a state now under fierce assault for this alleged crime cast in eighteen eighty eight seventy five per cent of her vote massachusetts the state in which i speak sixty per cent of her vote was it suppression in Virginia and natural causes in Massachusetts? Last month, Virginia cast 69% of her vote, and Massachusetts, fighting in every district, cast only 49% of hers. If Virginia is condemned because 31% of her vote was silent, how shall this state escape, in which 51% was dumb? Let us enlarge this comparison the sixteen southern states in eighty eight cast sixty seven per cent of their total vote the six new england states but sixty three per cent of theirs by what fair rule shall the stigma be put upon one section while the other escapes a congressional election in new york last week with the polling place in touch of every voter brought out only six thousand votes of twenty eight thousand and the lack of opposition is assigned as the natural cause. In a district in my state, in which an opposition speech has not been heard in ten years, and the polling places are miles apart, 
under the unfair reasoning of which my section has been a constant victim, the small vote is charged to be proof of forcible suppression. In Virginia, an average majority of 12,000, a less hopeless division of the minority, was raised to 42,000. In Iowa, in the same election, a majority of 32,000 was wiped out and an opposition majority of 8,000 was established. The change of 40,000 votes in Iowa is accepted as political revolution. In Virginia, an increase of 30,000 on a safe majority is declared to be proof of political fraud. It is deplorable, sir, that in both sections a larger percentage of the vote is not regularly cast but more inexplicable that this should be so in new england than in the south what invites the negro to the ballot box he knows that of all men it has promised him most and yielded him least his first appeal to suffrage was the promise of forty acres and a mule his second the threat that democratic success meant his reenslavement. both have been proved false in his experience he looked for a home and he got the Freedman's Bank. He fought under promise of the loaf, and in victory was denied the crumbs. Discouraged and deceived, he has realized at last that his best friends were his neighbors, with whom his lot is cast, and whose prosperity is bound up in his, and that he has gained nothing in politics to compensate the loss of their confidence and sympathy. That is at last his best and enduring hope. And so, without leaders or organization, and lacking the resolute heroism of my party friends in Vermont that make their hopeless march over the hills a high and inspiring pilgrimage, he shrewdly measures the occasional agitator, balances his little account with politics, touches up his mule, and jogs down the furrow, letting the mad world wag as it will. The Negro voter can never control in the South, and it would be well if partisans at the North would understand this. I have seen the white people of a state set about by black hosts until their fate seemed sealed. But, sir, some brave men, banding them together, would rise as Elisha rose in beleaguered Samaria, and, touching their eyes with faith, bid them look abroad to see the very air filled with the chariots of Israel and the horsemen thereof. If there is any human force that cannot be withstood, it is the power of the banded intelligence and responsibility of a free community. Against it, numbers and corruption cannot prevail. It cannot be forbidden in the law or divorced in force. It is the inalienable right of every free community, the just and righteous safeguard against an ignorant or corrupt suffrage. It is on this, sir, that we rely in the South not the cowardly menace of mask or shotgun but the peaceful majesty of intelligence and responsibility massed and unified for the protection of its homes and the preservation of its liberty that sir is our reliance and our hope and against it all the powers of earth shall not prevail it is just as certain that virginia would come back to the unchallenged control of a white race that before the moral and material power of her people once more unified opposition would crumble until its last desperate leader was left alone vainly striving to rally his disordered hosts as that night should fade in the kindling glory of the sun you may pass forced bills but they will not avail you may surrender your own liberties to federal election law you may submit in fear of a necessity that does not exist that the very form of this government may be changed you may invite federal interference with the new england town meeting that has been for a hundred years the guarantee of local government in america this old state which holds in its charter the boast that it is a free and independent commonwealth may deliver its election machinery into the hands of the government it helped to create but never sir will a single state of this union north or south be delivered again to the control of an ignorant and inferior race 
We wrested our state governments from Negro supremacy when the federal drumbeat rolled closer to the ballot box and federal bayonets hedged it deeper about than will ever again be permitted in this free government. But, sir, though the cannon of this republic thundered in every voting district in the South, we still should find in the mercy of God the means and the courage to prevent its re-establishment. I regret, sir, that my section, hindered with this problem, stands in seeming estrangement to the North, if, sir, any man will point out to me a path down which the white people of the South, divided, may walk in peace and honor, I will take that path, though I take it alone, for at its end, and nowhere else I fear, is to be found the full prosperity of my section and the full restoration of this union. But, sir, if the Negro had not been enfranchised, the South would have been divided and the Republic united. His enfranchisement, against which I enter no protest, holds the South united and compact. What solution then can we offer for the problem? Time alone can disclose it to us. We simply report progress and ask your patience. If the problem be solved at all, and I firmly believe it will, though nowhere else has it been, it will be solved by the people most deeply bound in interest, most deeply pledged in honor to its solution. I had rather see my people render back this question rightly solved than to see them gather all the spoils over which faction has contended since Catiline conspired and Caesar fought. Meantime, we treat the Negro fairly, measuring to him justice in the fullness the strong should give to the weak and leading him in the steadfast ways of citizenship that he may no longer be the prey of the unscrupulous and the sport of the thoughtless we open to him every pursuit in which he can prosper and seek to broaden his training and capacity we seek to hold his confidence and friendship and to pin him to the soil with ownership that he may catch in the fire of his own hearthstone that sense of responsibility the shiftless can never know and we gather him into that alliance of intelligence and responsibility that though it now runs close to racial lines welcomes the responsible and intelligent of any race by this course confirmed in our judgment and justified in the progress already made we hope to progress slowly but surely to the end the love we feel for that race you cannot measure nor comprehend as i attested here the spirit of my old black mammy from her home up there looks down to bless and through the tumult of this night steals the sweet music of her croonings as thirty years ago she held me in her black arms and led me smiling to sleep this scene vanishes as i speak and I catch a vision of an old southern home with its lofty pillars and its white pigeons fluttering down through the golden air. I see women with strained and anxious faces and children alert yet helpless. I see night come down with its dangers and its apprehensions, and in a big homely room I feel on my tired head the touch of loving hands now worn and wrinkled but fairer to me yet than the hands of mortal woman and stronger yet to lead me than the hands of mortal man as they lay a mother's blessing there while at her knees the truest auto i yet have found i thank god that she is safe in her sanctuary because her slaves sentinel in the silent cabin or guard at her chamber door put a black man's loyalty between her and danger i catch another vision the crisis of battle a soldier struck staggering fallen i see a slave scuffing through the smoke winding his black arms about the fallen form reckless of hurtling death bending his trusty face to catch the words that tremble on the stricken lips so wrestling meantime with agony that he would lay down his life in his master's stead 
I see him by the weary bedside, ministering with uncomplaining patience, praying with all his humble heart that God will lift his master up until death comes in mercy and in honor to still the soldier's agony and seal the soldier's life. I see him by the open grave, mute, motionless, uncovered, suffering for the death of him who in life fought against his freedom. I see him when the mold is heaped and the great drama of his life is closed, turn away and with downcast eyes and uncertain step start out into new and strange fields, faltering, struggling, but moving on until his shambling figure is lost in the light of this better and brighter day. And from the grave comes a voice saying, Follow him, put your arms about him in his need, even as he put his about me. Be his friend as he was mine. And out into this new world, strange to me as to him, dazzling, bewildering both, I follow. And may God forget my people when they forget these. Whatever the future may hold for them, whether they plod along in the servitude from which they have never been lifted since the Cyrenian was laid hold upon by the Roman soldiers and made to bear the cross of the fainting Christ, whether they find homes again in Africa and thus hasten the prophecy of the psalmist who said, And suddenly Ethiopia shall hold out her hands unto God, whether forever dislocated and separate, they remain a weak people, beset by stronger, and exist, as the Turk, who lives in the jealousy, rather than in the conscience of Europe, or whether in this miraculous republic they break through the cast of twenty centuries and, belying universal history, reach the full stature of citizenship, and in peace maintain it, we shall give them uttermost justice, and abiding friendship. And whatever we do, unto whatever seeming estrangement we may be driven, nothing shall disturb the love we bear this republic, or mitigate our consecration to its service. I stand here, Mr. President, to profess no new loyalty. When General Lee, whose heart was the temple of our hopes, and whose arm was clothed with our strength, renewed his allegiance to this government at Appomattox. He spoke from a heart too great to be false, and he spoke for every honest man from Maryland to Texas. From that day to this, Hamilcar has nowhere in the South sworn young Hannibal to hatred and vengeance, but everywhere to loyalty and to love. Witness the veteran standing at the base of a Confederate monument, above the graves of his comrades, his empty sleeve tossing in the April wind, adjuring the young men about him to serve as earnest and loyal citizens the government against which their fathers fought. This message, delivered from that sacred presence, has gone home to the hearts of my fellows. And, sir, I declare here, if physical courage be always equal to human aspiration, that they would die, sir, if need be, to restore this republic their fathers fought to dissolve. Such, Mr. President, is this problem as we see it. Such is the temper in which we approach it. Such the progress made. What do we ask of you? First, patience. Out of this alone can come perfect work. Second, confidence. In this alone can you judge fairly. Third, sympathy. In this you can help us best. Fourth, give us your sons as hostages. When you plant your capital in millions, send your sons that they may know how true are our hearts and may help to swell the Caucasian current until it can carry without danger this black infusion. Fifth, loyalty to the Republic, for there is sectionalism in loyalty as in estrangement. This hour little needs the loyalty that is loyal to one section and yet holds the other in enduring suspicion and estrangement. 
Give us the broad and perfect loyalty that loves and trusts Georgia alike with Massachusetts, that knows no South, no North, no East, no West, but endears with equal and patriotic love every foot of our soil, every state of our Union. A mighty duty, sir, and a mighty inspiration impels every one of us tonight to lose in patriotic consecration whatever estranges, whatever divides. We, sir, are Americans, and we stand for human liberty. The uplifting force of the American idea is under every throne on earth. France, Brazil, these are our victories. To redeem the earth from kingcraft and oppression, this is our mission, and we shall not fail. God has sown in our soil the seed of his millennial harvest, and he will not lay the sickle to the ripening crop until his full and perfect day has come. Our history, sir, has been a constant and expanding miracle from Plymouth Rock and Jamestown all the way, aye, even from the hour when from the voiceless and traceless ocean a new world rose to the sight of the inspired sailor. As we approach the fourth centennial of that stupendous day when the old world will come to marvel and to learn amid our gathered treasures, let us resolve to crown the miracles of our past with the spectacle of a republic, compact, united, indissoluble in the bonds of love, loving from the lakes to the gulf, the wounds of war healed in every heart as on every hill, serene and resplendent at the summit of human achievement and earthly glory, blazing out the path and making clear the way up which all the nations of the earth must come in God's appointed time. End of section 42. Section 43, Appendix D, Speeches for Study and Practice. William McKinley, Last Speech, delivered at the World's Fair, Buffalo, New York, on September 5, 1901, the day before he was assassinated. I am glad again to be in the city of Buffalo and exchange greetings with her people, to whose generous hospitality I am not a stranger, and with whose good will I have been repeatedly and signally honored. Today, I have additional satisfaction in meeting and giving welcome to the foreign representatives assembled here, whose presence and participation in this exposition have contributed in so marked a degree to its interest and success. To the Commissioners of the Dominion of Canada and the British Colonies, the French Colonies, the Republics of Mexico and of Central and South America, and the Commissioners of Cuba and Puerto Rico, who share with us in this undertaking, we give the hand of fellowship and felicitate with them upon the triumphs of art, science, education and manufacture which the old has bequeathed to the new century. Expositions are the timekeepers of progress. They record the world's advancement. They stimulate the energy, enterprise, and intellect of the people, and quicken human genius. They go into the home. They broaden and brighten the daily life of the people. They open mighty storehouses of information to the student. Every exposition, great or small, has helped to some onward step. Comparison of ideas is always educational and, as such, instructs the brain and hand of man. Friendly rivalry follows, which is the spur to industrial improvement, the inspiration to useful invention, and to high endeavor in all departments of human activity. It exacts a study of the wants, comforts, and even the whims of the people, and recognizes the efficacy of high quality and low prices to win their favor. The quest for trade is an incentive to men of business to devise, invent, improve, and economize in the cost of production. Business life, whether among ourselves or with other peoples, is ever a sharp struggle for success. It will be none the less in the future. 
Without competition, we would be clinging to the clumsy and antiquated process of farming and manufacture and the methods of business of long ago, and the 20th would be no further advanced than the 18th century. But though commercial competitors we are, commercial enemies we must not be. The Pan-American Exposition has done its work thoroughly, presenting in its exhibits evidences of the highest skill and illustrating the progress of the human family in the Western Hemisphere. This portion of the earth has no cause for humiliation for the part it has performed in the march of civilization. It has not accomplished everything, far from it. It has simply done its best and without vanity or boastfulness, and recognizing the manifold achievements of others, it invites the friendly rivalry of all the powers in the peaceful pursuits of trade and commerce, and will cooperate with all in advancing the highest and best interests of humanity. The wisdom and energy of all the nations are none too great for the world work. The success of art, science, industry, and invention is an international asset and a common glory. After all, how near one to the other is every part of the world. Modern inventions have brought into close relation widely separated peoples and make them better acquainted. Geographic and political divisions will continue to exist, but distances have been effaced. Swift ships and fast trains are becoming cosmopolitan. They invade fields which a few years ago were impenetrable. The world's products are exchanged as never before, and with increasing transportation facilities come increasing knowledge and larger trade. Prices are fixed with mathematical precision by supply and demand. The world's selling prices are regulated by market and crop reports. We travel greater distances in a shorter space of time and with more ease than was ever dreamed of by the fathers. Isolation is no longer possible or desirable. The same important news is read though in different languages, the same day in all Christendom. The telegraph keeps us advised of what is occurring everywhere, and the press foreshadows, with more or less accuracy, the plans and purposes of the nations. Market prices of products and of securities are hourly known in every commercial mart, and the investments of the people extend beyond their own national boundaries into the remotest parts of the earth. Vast transactions are conducted, and international exchanges are made by the tick of the cable. Every event of interest is immediately bulletined. The quick gathering and transmission of news, like rapid transit, are of recent origin and are only made possible by the genius of the inventor and the courage of the investor. It took a special messenger of the government, with every facility known at the time for rapid travel, 19 days to go from the city of Washington to New Orleans with a message to General Jackson that the war with England had ceased and a treaty of peace had been signed. How different now! We reached General Miles in Puerto Rico, and he was able through the military telegraph to stop his army on the firing line with the message that the United States and Spain had signed a protocol suspending hostilities. We knew almost instanter of the first shots fired at Santiago, and the subsequent surrender of the Spanish forces was known at Washington within less than an hour of its consummation. The first ship of Severus' fleet had hardly emerged from that historic harbor when the fact was flashed to our capital, and the swift destruction that followed was announced immediately through the wonderful medium of telegraphy. So accustomed are we to safe and easy communication with distant lands that its temporary interruption, even in ordinary times, results in loss and inconvenience. 
we shall never forget the days of anxious waiting and suspense when no information was permitted to be sent from pekin and the diplomatic representatives of the nations in china cut off from all communication inside and outside of the walled capital were surrounded by an angry and misguided mob that threatened their lives nor the joy that thrilled the world when a single message from the government of the united states brought through our minister the first news of the safety of the besieged diplomats at the beginning of the nineteenth century there was not a mile of steam railroad on the globe now there are enough miles to make its circuit many times then there was not a line of electric telegraph now we have a vast mileage traversing all lands and seas god and man have linked the nations together no nation can longer be indifferent to any other and as we are brought more and more in touch with each other the less occasion is there for misunderstandings and the stronger the disposition when we have differences to adjust them in the court of arbitration which is the noblest forum for the settlement of international disputes my fellow citizens trade statistics indicate that this country is in a state of unexampled prosperity the figures are almost appalling they show that we are utilizing our fields and forests and mines and that we are furnishing profitable employment to the millions of working men throughout the united states bringing comfort and happiness to their homes and making it possible to lay by savings for old age and disability that all the people are participating in this great prosperity is seen in every American community and shown by the enormous, unprecedented deposits in our savings banks. Our duty in the care and security of these deposits and their safe investment demands the highest integrity and the best business capacity of those in charge of these depositories of the people's earnings. We have a vast and intricate business built up through years of toil and struggle in which every part of the country has its stake, which will not permit of either neglect or of undue selfishness. No narrow, sordid policy will subserve it. The greatest skill and wisdom on the part of manufacturers and producers will be required to hold and increase it our industrial enterprises which have grown to such great proportions affect the homes and occupations of the people and the welfare of the country our capacity to produce has developed so enormously and our products have so multiplied that the problem of more markets requires our urgent and immediate attention only a broad and enlightened policy will keep what we have no other policy will get more. In these times of marvelous business energy and gain, we ought to be looking to the future, strengthening the weak places in our industrial and commercial systems, that we may be ready for any storm or strain. By sensible trade arrangements, which will not interrupt our home production, we shall extend the outlets for our increasing surplus. A system which provides a mutual exchange of commodities is manifestly essential to the continued and healthful growth of our export trade. We must not repose in the fancied security that we can forever sell everything and buy little or nothing. If such a thing were possible, it would not be best for us or for those with whom we deal we should take from our customers such of their products as we can use without harm to our industries and labor reciprocity is the natural outgrowth of our wonderful industrial development under the domestic policy now firmly established what we produce beyond our domestic consumption must have a vent abroad the excess must be relieved through a foreign outlet and we should sell everywhere we can and buy wherever the buying will enlarge our sales and productions and thereby make a greater demand for home labor the period of exclusiveness is past the expansion of our trade and commerce is the pressing problem 
Commercial wars are unprofitable. A policy of goodwill and friendly trade relations will prevent reprisals. Reciprocity treaties are in harmony with the spirit of the times. Measures of retaliation are not. If, perchance, some of our tariffs are no longer needed for revenue or to encourage and protect our industries at home, why should they not be employed to extend and promote our markets abroad? Then, too, we have inadequate steamship service. New lines of steamships have already been put in commission between the Pacific coast ports of the United States and those on the western coasts of Mexico and Central and South America. These should be followed up with direct steamship lines between the western coast of the United States and South American ports. One of the needs of the times is direct commercial lines from our vast fields of production to the fields of consumption that we have but barely touched. Next in advantage to having the thing to sell is to have the conveyance to carry it to the buyer. We must encourage our merchant marine. We must have more ships. They must be under the American flag, built and manned and owned by Americans. These will not only be profitable in a commercial sense, they will be messengers of peace and amity wherever they go. We must build the Isthmian Canal, which will unite the two oceans and give a straight line of water communication with the western coasts of Central and South America and Mexico. The construction of a Pacific cable cannot be longer postponed. In the furtherance of these objects of national interest and concern, you are performing an important part. This exposition would have touched the heart of that American statesman whose mind was ever alert and thought ever constant for a larger commerce and a truer fraternity of the republics of the new world. His broad American spirit is felt and manifested here. He needs no identification to an assemblage of Americans anywhere, for the name of Blaine is inseparably associated with the Pan-American movement which finds here practical and substantial expression, and which we all hope will be firmly advanced by the Pan-American Congress that assembles this autumn in the capital of Mexico. The good work will go on. It cannot be stopped. Those buildings will disappear. This creation of art and beauty and industry will perish from sight. But their influence will remain to make it live beyond its too short living with praises and thanksgiving. Who can tell the new thoughts that have been awakened, the ambitions fired, and the high achievements that will be wrought through this exposition? Gentlemen, let us ever remember that our interest is in concord, not conflict, and that our real eminence rests in the victories of peace, not those of war. We hope that all who are represented here may be moved to higher and nobler efforts for their own and the world's good and that out of this city may come not only greater commerce and trade for us all, but, more essential than these, relations of mutual respect, confidence, and friendship, which will deepen and endure. Our earnest prayer is that God will graciously vouchsafe prosperity, happiness, and peace to all our neighbors, and like blessings to all the peoples and powers of earth. End of section 43. Section 44, Appendix D, Speeches for Study and Practice. John Hay, Tribute to McKinley. From his memorial address at a joint session of the Senate and House of Representatives on February 27, 1903. For the third time, the Congress of the United States are assembled to commemorate the life and the death of a president slain by the hand of an assassin. The attention of the future historian will be attracted to the features which reappear with startling sameness in all three of these awful crimes. The uselessness, the utter lack of consequence of the act, the obscurity, the insignificance of the criminal, 
the blamelessness so far as in our sphere of existence the best of men may be held blameless of the victim not one of our murdered presidents had an enemy in the world they were all of such preeminent purity of life that no pretext could be given for the attack of passional crime they were all men of democratic instincts who could never have offended the most jealous advocates of equity they were of kindly and generous nature to whom wrong or injustice was impossible of moderate fortune whose slender means nobody could envy they were men of austere virtue of tender heart of eminent abilities which they had devoted with single minds to the good of the republic if ever men walked before god and man without blame it was these three rulers of our people the only temptation to attack their lives offered was their gentle radiance to eyes hating the light that was a fence enough. The stupid uselessness of such an infamy affronts the common sense of the world. One can conceive how the death of a dictator may change the political conditions of an empire, how the extinction of a narrowing line of kings may bring in an alien dynasty. But in a well-ordered republic like ours, the ruler may fall, but the state feels no tremor. Our beloved and revered leader is gone, but the natural process of our laws provides us a successor, identical in purpose and ideals, nourished by the same teachings, inspired by the same principles, pledged by tender affection as well as by high loyalty to carry to completion the immense task committed to his hands and to smite with iron severity every manifestation of that hideous crime which his mild predecessor with his dying breath forgave the sayings of celestial wisdom have no date the words that reach us over two thousand years out of the darkest hour of gloom the world has ever known are true to life today they know not what they do the blow struck at our dear friend and ruler was as deadly as blind hate could make it but the blow struck at anarchy was deadlier still how many countries can join with us in the community of a kindred sorrow i will not speak of those distant regions where assassination enters into the daily life of government but among the nations bound to us by the ties of familiar intercourse who can forget that wise and mild autocrat who had earned the proud title of the liberator that enlightened and magnanimous citizen whom france still mourns that brave and chivalrous king of italy who only lived for his people and saddest of all that lovely and sorrowing empress whose harmless life could hardly have excited the animosity of a demon against that devilish spirit nothing avails neither virtue nor patriotism nor age nor youth nor conscience nor pity we cannot even say that education is a sufficient safeguard against this baleful evil for most of the wretches whose crimes have so shocked humanity in recent years were men not unlettered who have gone from the common schools through murder to the scaffold the life of william mckinsey was from his birth to his death typically american there is no environment i should say anywhere else in the world which could produce just such a character he was born into that way of life which elsewhere is called the middle class but which in this country is so nearly universal as to make of other classes an almost negligible quantity he was neither rich nor poor neither proud nor humble he knew no hunger he was not sure of satisfying no luxury which could enervate mind or body his parents were sober god-fearing people intelligent and upright without pretension and without humility he grew up in the company of boys like himself 
wholesome, honest, self-respecting. They looked down on nobody. They never felt it possible they could be looked down upon. Their houses were the homes of probity, piety, patriotism. They learned in the admirable school readers of fifty years ago the lessons of heroic and splendid life which have come down from the past. They read in their weekly newspapers the story of the world's progress, in which they were eager to take part, and of the sins and wrongs of civilization with which they burned to do battle. It was a serious and thoughtful time. The boys of that day felt dimly, but deeply, that days of sharp struggle and high achievement were before them. They looked at life with the wondering yet resolute eyes of a young esquire in his vigil of arms. They felt a time was coming when to them should be addressed the stern admonition of the apostle, Quit you like men, be strong. The men who are living today and were young in 1860 will never forget the glory and glamour that filled the earth and the sky when the long twilight of doubt and uncertainty was ending and the time for action had come. A speech by Abraham Lincoln was an event not only of high moral significance but of far-reaching importance. The drilling of a militia company by Ellsworth attracted national attention. The fluttering of the flag in the clear sky drew tears from the eyes of young men. Patriotism, which had been a rhetorical expression, became a passionate emotion in which instinct, logic, and feeling were fused. The country was worth saving. It could be saved only by fire. No sacrifice was too great. The young men of the country were ready for the sacrifice. Come weal, come woe, they were ready. At 17 years of age, William McKinley heard the summons of his country. He was the sort of youth to whom a military life in ordinary times would possess no attractions. His nature was far different from that of the ordinary soldier. He had other dreams of life, its prizes and pleasures, than that of marches and battles. But to his mind there was no choice or question. The banner floating in the morning breeze was the beckoning gesture of his country. The thrilling note of the trumpet called him, him and none other, into the ranks. His portrait in his first uniform is familiar to you all. The short, stocky figure, the quiet, thoughtful face, the deep, dark eyes. It is the face of a lad who could not stay at home when he thought he was needed in the field. He was of the stuff of which good soldiers are made. Had he been ten years older, he would have entered at the head of a company and come out at the head of a division. But he did what he could. He enlisted as a private. He learned to obey. His serious, sensible ways, his prompt, alert efficiency soon attracted the attention of his superiors. He was so faithful in little things that they gave him more and more to do. He was untiring in camp and on the march, swift, cool, and fearless in fight. He left the army with field rank when the war ended, breveted by President Lincoln for gallantry in battle. In coming years, when men seek to draw the moral of our great civil war, nothing will seem to them so admirable in all the history of our two magnificent armies as the way in which the war came to a close. When the Confederate army saw the time had come, they acknowledged the pitiless logic of facts and ceased fighting. When the army of the Union saw it was no longer needed, without a murmur or question, making no terms, asking no return, in the flush of victory and fullness of might, it laid down its arms and melted back into the mass of peaceful citizens. There is no event since the nation was born which has so proved its solid capacity for self-government. Both sections share equally in that crown of glory. They had held a debate of incomparable importance and had fought it out with equal energy. 
a conclusion had been reached and it is to the everlasting honor of both sides that they each knew when the war was over and the hour of a lasting peace had struck we may admire the desperate daring of others who prefer annihilation to compromise but the palm of common sense and i will say of enlightened patriotism belongs to the men like grant and lee who knew when they had fought enough for honor and for country so it came naturally about that in 1876 the beginning of the second century of the republic he began by an election to congress his political career thereafter for fourteen years this chamber was his home i use the word advisedly nowhere in the world was he so in harmony with his environment as here nowhere else did his mind work with such full consciousness of its powers the air of debate was native to him here he drank delight of battle with his peers in after days when he drove by this stately pile or when on rare occasions his duty called him here he greeted his old haunts with the affectionate zest of a child of the house during all the last ten years of his life filled as they were with activity and glory he never ceased to be homesick for this hall when he came to the presidency there was not a day when his congressional service was not of use to him probably no other president has been in such full and cordial communion with congress if we may accept lincoln alone mckinley knew the legislative body thoroughly its composition its methods its habit of thought he had the profoundest respect for its authority and an inflexible belief in the ultimate rectitude of its purposes our history shows how surely an executive court's disaster and ruin by assuming an attitude of hostility or distrust to the legislature and on the other hand mckinley's frank and sincere trust and confidence in congress were repaid by prompt and loyal support and cooperation during his entire term of office this mutual trust and regard so essential to the public welfare was never shadowed by a single cloud when he came to the presidency he confronted a situation of the utmost difficulty which might well have appalled a man of less serene and tranquil self-confidence there had been a state of profound commercial and industrial depression from which his friends had said his election would relieve the country our relations with the outside world left much to be desired the feeling between the northern and southern sections of the union was lacking in the cordiality which was necessary to the welfare of both hawaii had asked for annexation and had been rejected by the preceding administration there was a state of things in the caribbean which could not permanently endure our neighbor's house was on fire and there were grave doubts as to our rights and duties in the premises a man either weak or rash either irresolute or headstrong might have brought ruin on himself and incalculable harm to the country the least desirable form of glory to a man of his habitual mood and temper that of successful war was nevertheless conferred upon him by uncontrollable events he felt it must come he deplored its necessity he strained almost a breaking his relations with his friends in order first to prevent and then to postpone it to the latest possible moment but when the die was cast he labored with the utmost energy and ardor and with an intelligence in military matters which showed how much of the soldier still survived in the mature statesman to push forward the war to a decisive close war was an anguish to him he wanted it short and conclusive his merciful zeal communicated itself to his subordinates and the war so long dreaded whose consequences were so momentous ended in a hundred days mr mckinley was re-elected by an overwhelming majority 
There had been little doubt of the result among well-informed people, but when it was known, a profound feeling of relief and renewal of trust were evident among the leaders of capital and industry, not only in this country, but everywhere. They felt that the immediate future was secure, and that trade and commerce might safely push forward in every field of effort and enterprise. He felt that the harvest time was come to garner in the fruits of so much planting and culture, and he was determined that nothing he might do or say should be liable to the reproach of a personal interest. Let us say frankly he was a party man. He believed the policies advocated by him and his friends counted for much in the country's progress and prosperity. He hoped in his second term to accomplish substantial results in the development and affirmation of those policies. I spent a day with him shortly before he started on his fateful journey to Buffalo. Never had I seen him higher in hope and patriotic confidence. He was gratified to the heart that we had arranged a treaty which gave us a free hand in the isthmus. In fancy, he saw the canal already built and the argosies of the world passing through it in peace and amity. He saw in the immense evolution of American trade the fulfillment of all his dreams, the reward of all his labors. He was, I need not say, an ardent protectionist, never more sincere and devoted than during those last days of his life. He regarded reciprocity as the bulwark of protection, not a breach, but a fulfillment of the law. The treaties which for four years had been preparing under his personal supervision, he regarded as ancillary to the general scheme. He was opposed to any revolutionary plan of change in the existing legislation. He was careful to point out that everything he had done was in faithful compliance with the law itself. In that mood of high hope, of generous expectation, he went to Buffalo, and there, on the threshold of eternity, he delivered that memorable speech, worthy for its loftiness of tone, its blameless morality, its breadth of view, to be regarded as his testament to the nation. Through all his pride of country and his joy of its success runs the note of solemn warning, as in Kipling's noble hymn, Lest We Forget. The next day sped the bolt of doom, and for a week after, in an agony of dread, broken by elusive glimpses of hope that our prayers might be answered, the nation waited for the end. Nothing in the glorious life we saw gradually waning was more admirable and exemplary than its close. The gentle humanity of his words when he saw his assailant in danger of summary vengeance. Do not let them hurt him. His chivalrous care that the news should be broken gently to his wife. The fine courtesy with which he apologized for the damage which his death would bring to the great exhibition. And the heroic resignation of his final words. It is God's way, his will not ours, be done, were all the instinctive expressions of a nature so lofty and so pure that pride in its nobility at once softened and enhanced the nation's sense of loss. The Republic grieved over such a son, but is proud forever of having produced him. After all, in spite of its tragic ending, his life was extraordinarily happy. He had all his days troops of friends, the cheer of fame and fruitful labor, and he became at last on fortune's crowning slope, the pillar of a people's hope, the center of a world's desire. End of section 44. Section 45, Appendix D, Speeches for Study and Practice. William Jennings Bryan, The Prince of Peace, 1894. I offer no apology for speaking upon a religious theme, for it is the most universal of all themes. I am interested in the science of government, 
but I am interested more in religion than in government. I enjoy making a political speech. I have made a good many and shall make more, but I would rather speak on religion than on politics. I commenced speaking on the stump when I was only twenty, but I commenced speaking in the church six years earlier, and I shall be in the church even after I am put out of politics. I feel sure of my ground when I make a political speech, but I feel even more certain of my ground when I make a religious speech. If I address you upon the subject of law, I might interest the lawyers. If I discuss the science of medicine, I might interest the physicians. In like manner, merchants might be interested in comments on commerce, and farmers in matters pertaining to agriculture. But no one of these subjects appeals to all. Even the science of government, though broader than any profession or occupation, does not embrace the whole sum of life, and those who think upon it differ so among themselves that I could not speak upon the subject so as to please a part of the audience without displeasing others. While to me the science of government is intensely absorbing, I recognize that the most important things in life lie outside of the realm of government and that more depends upon what the individual does for himself than upon what the government does or can do for him. Men can be miserable under the best government, and they can be happy under the worst government. Government affects but a part of the life which we live here, and does not deal at all with the life beyond, while religion touches the infinite circle of existence, as well as the small arc of that circle which we spend on earth. No greater theme, therefore, can engage our attention. If I discuss questions of government, I must secure the cooperation of a majority before I can put my ideas into practice. But if, in speaking on religion, I can touch one human heart for good, I have not spoken in vain, no matter how large the majority may be against me. Man is a religious being. The heart instinctively seeks for a god. Whether he worships on the banks of the Ganges, prays with his face upturned to the sun, kneels toward Mecca, or, regarding all space as a temple, communes with the Heavenly Father according to the Christian creed, man is essentially devout. There are honest doubters whose sincerity we recognize and respect, but occasionally I find young men who think it smart to be skeptical. They talk as if it were an evidence of larger intelligence to scoff at creeds and to refuse to connect themselves with churches. They call themselves liberal, as if a Christian were narrow-minded. Some go so far as to assert that the advanced thought of the world has discarded the idea that there is a God. To these young men I desire to address myself. Even some older people profess to regard religion as a superstition, pardonable in the ignorant but unworthy of the educated. Those who hold this view look down with mild contempt upon such as give to religion a definite place in their thoughts and lives. They assume an intellectual superiority and often take little pains to conceal the assumption. Tolstoy administers to the cultured crowd, the words quoted are his, a severe rebuke when he declares that the religious sentiment rests not upon a superstitious fear of the invisible forces of nature, but upon man's consciousness of his finiteness amid an infinite universe and of his sinfulness. And this consciousness, the great philosopher adds, man can never outgrow. Tolstoy is right. Man recognizes how limited are his own powers and how vast is the universe, and he leans upon the arm that is stronger than his. Man feels the weight of his sins and looks for one who is sinless. Religion has been defined by Tolstoy as the relation which man fixes between himself and his God, and morality as the outward manifestation of this inward relation. 
Every one, by the time he reaches maturity, has fixed some relation between himself and God, and no material change in this relation can take place without a revolution in the man, for this relation is the most potent influence that acts upon a human life. Religion is the foundation of morality in the individual and in the group of individuals. Materialists have attempted to build up a system of morality upon the basis of enlightened self-interest. They would have man figure out by mathematics that it pays him to abstain from wrongdoing. They would even inject an element of selfishness into altruism. But the moral system elaborated by the materialists has several defects. First, its virtues are borrowed from moral systems based upon religion. All those who are intelligent enough to discuss a system of morality are so saturated with the morals derived from systems resting upon religion that they cannot frame a system resting upon reason alone. Second, as it rests upon argument rather than upon authority, the young are not in a position to accept or reject. Our laws do not permit a young man to dispose of real estate until he is twenty-one. Why this restraint? Because his reason is not mature. And yet a young man's life is largely moulded by the environment of his youth. Third, one never knows just how much of his decision is due to reason and how much is due to passion or to selfish interest. Passion can dethrone the reason. We recognize this in our criminal laws. We also recognize the bias of self-interest when we exclude from the jury every man, no matter how reasonable or upright he may be, who has a pecuniary interest in the result of the trial. And fourth, one whose morality rests upon a nice calculation of benefits to be secured, spends time figuring that he should spend in action. Those who keep a book account of their good deeds seldom do enough good to justify keeping books. A noble life cannot be built upon an arithmetic. It must be rather like the spring that pours forth constantly of that which refreshes and invigorates. Morality is the power of endurance in man, and a religion which teaches personal responsibility to God gives strength to morality. There is a powerful restraining influence in the belief that an all-seeing eye scrutinizes every thought and word and act of the individual. There is wide difference between the man who is trying to conform his life to a standard of morality about him and the man who seeks to make his life approximate to a divine standard. The former attempts to live up to the standard if it is above him, and down to it if it is below him, and if he is doing right only when others are looking, he is sure to find a time when he thinks he is unobserved, and then he takes a vacation and falls. One needs the inner strength which comes with the conscious presence of a personal God. If those who are thus fortified sometimes yield to temptation, how helpless and hopeless must those be who rely upon their own strength alone! There are difficulties to be encountered in religion, but there are difficulties to be encountered everywhere. If Christians sometimes have doubts and fears, unbelievers have more doubts and greater fears. I passed through a period of skepticism when I was in college, and I have been glad ever since that I became a member of the church before I left home for college, for it helped me during those trying days. And the college days cover the dangerous period in the young man's life. He is just coming into possession of his powers and feels stronger than he ever feels afterward, and he thinks he knows more than he ever does know. It was at this period that I became confused by the different theories of creation, but I examined these theories and found that they all assumed something to begin with. You can test this for yourselves. The nebula hypothesis, for instance, assumes that matter and force existed, matter in particles infinitely fine, and each particle separated from every other particle by space infinitely great. Beginning with this assumption, force working on matter, according to this hypothesis, created a universe. Well, I have a right to assume. 
and I prefer to assume a designer back of the design, a creator back of the creation. And no matter how long you draw out the process of creation, so long as God stands back of it, you cannot shake my faith in Jehovah. In Genesis it is written that, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and I can stand on that proposition until I find some theory of creation that goes farther back than the beginning. We must begin with something, we must start somewhere, and the Christian begins with God. I do not carry the doctrine of evolution as far as some do. I am not yet convinced that man is a lineal descendant of the lower animals. I do not mean to find fault with you if you want to accept the theory. All I mean to say is that while you may trace your ancestry back to the monkey, if you find pleasure or pride in doing so, you shall not connect me with your family tree without more evidence than has yet been produced. I object to the theory for several reasons. First, it is a dangerous theory. If a man links himself in generations with the monkey, it then becomes an important question whether he is going toward him or coming from him, and I have seen them going in both directions. I do not know of any argument that can be used to prove that man is an improved monkey that may not be used just as well to prove that the monkey is a degenerate man, and the latter theory is more plausible than the former. It is true that man, in some physical characteristics, resembles the beast, but man has a mind as well as a body, and a soul as well as a mind. The mind is greater than the body, and the soul is greater than the mind, and I object to having man's pedigree traced on one-third of him only, and that the lowest third. Fairburn, in his Philosophy of Christianity, lays down a sound proposition when he says that it is not sufficient to explain man as an animal, that it is necessary to explain man in history, and the Darwinian theory does not do this. The ape, according to this theory, is older than man, and yet the ape is still an ape, while man is the author of the marvelous civilization which we see about us. One does not escape from mystery, however, by accepting this theory, for it does not explain the origin of life. When a follower of Darwin has traced the germ of life back to the lowest form in which it appears, and to follow him one must exercise more faith than religion calls for, he finds that scientists differ. Those who reject the idea of creation are divided into two schools, some believing that the first germ of life came from another planet, and others holding that it was the result of spontaneous generation. Each school answers the arguments advanced by the other, and as they cannot agree with each other, I am not compelled to agree with either. If I were compelled to accept one of these theories, I would prefer the first, for if we can chase the germ of life off this planet and get it out into space, we can guess the rest of the way and no one can contradict us. But if we accept the doctrine of spontaneous generation, we cannot explain why spontaneous generation ceased to act after the first germ was created. Go back as far as we may, we cannot escape from the creative act, and it is just as easy for me to believe that God created man as he is, as to believe that, millions of years ago, he created a germ of life and endowed it with power to develop into all that we see today. I object to the Darwinian theory until more conclusive proof is produced, because I fear we shall lose the consciousness of God's presence in our daily life if we must accept the theory that through all the ages no spiritual force has touched the life of man or shaped the destiny of nations. But there is another objection. The Darwinian theory represents man as reaching his present perfection by the operation of the law of hate, the merciless law by which the strong crowd out and kill off the weak. If this is the law of our development, then, if there is any logic that can bind the human mind, we shall turn backward toward the beast in proportion as we substitute the law of love. I prefer to believe that love, rather than hatred, is the law of development. 
How can hatred be the law of development when nations have advanced in proportion as they have departed from that law and adopted the law of love? But, I repeat, while I do not accept the Darwinian theory, I shall not quarrel with you about it. I only refer to it to remind you that it does not solve the mystery of life or explain human progress. I fear that some have accepted it in the hope of escaping from the miracle. But why should the miracle frighten us? And yet I am inclined to think that it is one of the test questions with the Christian. Christ cannot be separated from the miraculous. His birth, his ministrations, and his resurrection all involve the miraculous, and the change which his religion works in the human heart is a continuing miracle. Eliminate the miracles, and Christ becomes merely a human being, and his gospel is stripped of divine authority. The miracle raises two questions. Can God perform a miracle? And would he want to? The first is easy to answer. A God who can make a world can do anything he wants to do with it. The power to perform miracles is necessarily implied in the power to create. But would God want to perform a miracle? This is the question which has given most of the trouble. The more I have considered it, the less inclined I am to answer in the negative. To say that God would not perform a miracle is to assume a more intimate knowledge of God's plans and purposes than I can claim to have. I will not deny that God does perform a miracle, or may perform one, merely because I do not know how or why he does it. I find it so difficult to decide each day what God wants done now, that I am not presumptuous enough to attempt to declare what God might have wanted to do thousands of years ago. The fact that we are constantly learning of the existence of new forces suggests the possibility that God may operate through forces yet unknown to us, and the mysteries with which we deal every day warn me that faith is as necessary as sight. Who would have credited a century ago the stories that are now told of the wonder-working electricity? For ages man had known the lightning, but only to fear it. Now this invisible current is generated by a man-made machine, imprisoned in a man-made wire and made to do the bidding of man. We're even able to dispense with the wire and hurl words through space, and the X-ray has enabled us to look through substances which were supposed until recently to exclude all light. The miracle is not more mysterious than many of the things with which man now deals. It is simply different. The miraculous birth of Christ is not more mysterious than any other conception. It is simply unlike it. Nor is the resurrection of Christ more mysterious than the myriad resurrections which mark each annual seed time. It is sometimes said that God could not suspend one of his laws without stopping the universe. But do we not suspend or overcome the law of gravitation every day? Every time we move a foot or lift a weight, we temporarily overcome one of the most universal of natural laws, and yet the world is not disturbed. Science has taught us so many things that we are tempted to conclude that we know everything. But there is really a great unknown, which is still unexplored, and that which we have learned ought to increase our reverence rather than our egotism. Science has disclosed some of the machinery of the universe, but science has not yet revealed to us the great secret, the secret of life. It is to be found in every blade of grass, in every insect, in every bird and in every animal, as well as in man. Six thousand years of recorded history, and yet we know no more about the secret of life than they knew in the beginning. We live, we plan, we have our hopes, our fears, and yet in a moment a change may come over any one of us, and this body will become a mass of lifeless clay. What is it that having, we live, and having not, we are as the clod? The progress of the race and the civilization which we now behold are the work of men and women who have not yet solved the mystery of their own lives. 
and our food must we understand it before we eat it if we refused to eat anything until we could understand the mystery of its growth we would die of starvation but mystery does not bother us in the dining room it is only in the church that it is a stumbling block i was eating a piece of watermelon some months ago and was struck with its beauty i took some of the seeds and dried them and weighed them and found that it would require some five thousand seeds to weigh a pound and then i applied mathematics to that forty pound melon one of these seeds put into the ground when warmed by the sun and moistened by the rain takes off its coat and goes to work it gathers from somewhere two hundred thousand times its own weight and forcing this raw material through a tiny stem constructs a watermelon it ornaments the outside with a covering of green inside the green it puts a layer of white and within the white a core of red and all through the red it scatters seeds each one capable of continuing the work of reproduction where does that little seed get its tremendous power where does it find its coloring matter how does it collect its flavoring extract how does it build a watermelon until you can explain a watermelon do not be too sure that you can set limits to the power of the almighty and say just what he would do or how he would do it i cannot explain the watermelon but i eat it and enjoy it the egg is the most universal of foods and its use dates from the beginning but what is more mysterious than an egg when an egg is fresh it is an important article of merchandise a hen can destroy its market value in a week's time but in two weeks more she can bring forth from it what man could not find in it we eat eggs but we cannot explain an egg water has been used from the birth of man we learned after it has been used for ages that it is merely a mixture of gases but it is far more important that we have water to drink than that we know that it is not water everything that grows tells a like story of infinite power why should i deny that a divine hand fed a multitude with a few loaves and fishes when i see hundreds of millions fed every year by a hand which converts the seeds scattered over the field into an abundant harvest we know that food can be multiplied in a few months time shall we deny the power of the creator to eliminate the element of time when we have gone so far in eliminating the element of space who am i that i should attempt to measure the arm of the almighty with my puny arm or to measure the brain of the infinite with my finite mind who am i that i should attempt to put meets and bounds to the power of the creator but there is something even more wonderful still the mysterious change that takes place in the human heart when a man begins to hate the things he loved and to love the things he hated the marvelous transformation that takes place in the man who before the change would have sacrificed a world for his own advancement but who after the change would give his life for a principle and esteem it a privilege to make sacrifice for his convictions what greater miracle than this that converts a selfish self-centered human being into a center from which good influences flow out in every direction and yet this miracle has been wrought in the heart of each one of us or may be wrought and we have seen it wrought in the hearts and lives of those about us no living a life that is a mystery and living in the midst of mystery and miracles i shall not allow either to deprive me of the benefits of the christian religion if you ask me if i understand everything in the bible i answer no but if we will try to live up to what we do understand we will be kept so busy doing good that we will not have time to worry about the passages which we do not understand some of those who question the miracle also question the theory of atonement they assert that it does not accord with their idea of justice for one to die for all let each one bear his own sins and the punishment due for them they say the doctrine of vicarious suffering is not a new one it is as old as the race 
that one should suffer for others is one of the most familiar of principles, and we see the principle illustrated every day of our lives. Take the family, for instance. From the day the mother's first child is born, for twenty or thirty years, her children are scarcely out of her waking thoughts. Her life trembles in the balance at each child's birth. She sacrifices for them. She surrenders herself to them. Is it because she expects them to pay her back? Fortunate for the parent and fortunate for the child if the latter has an opportunity to repay in part the debt it owes. But no child can compensate a parent for a parent's care. In the course of nature, the debt is paid, not to the parent, but to the next generation, and the next, each generation suffering, sacrificing for, and surrendering itself to the generation that follows. This is the law of our lives. Nor is this confined to the family. Every step in civilization has been made possible by those who have been willing to sacrifice for posterity. Freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of conscience, and free government have all been won for the world by those who were willing to labor unselfishly for their fellows. So well established is this doctrine that we do not regard anyone as great unless he recognizes how important his life is in comparison with the problems with which he deals. I find proof that man was made in the image of his creator, in the fact that, throughout the centuries, man has been willing to die, if necessary, that blessings denied to him might be enjoyed by his children, his children's children, and the world. The seeming paradox, he that saveth his life shall lose it, and he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it, has an application wider than that usually given to it. It is an epitome of history. Those who live only for themselves live little lives, but those who stand ready to give themselves for the advancement of things greater than themselves find a larger life than the one they would have surrendered. Wendell Phillips gave expression to the same idea when he said, What imprudent men the benefactors of the race have been! How prudently most men sink into nameless graves, while now and then a few forget themselves into immortality! We win immortality, not by remembering ourselves, but by forgetting ourselves in devotion to things larger than ourselves. Instead of being an unnatural plan, the plan of salvation is in perfect harmony with human nature as we understand it. Sacrifice is the language of love, and Christ, in suffering for the world, adopted the only means of reaching the heart. This can be demonstrated not only by theory, but by experience, for the story of his life, his teachings, his sufferings, and his death has been translated into every language and everywhere it has touched the heart. But if I were going to present an argument in favor of the divinity of Christ, I would not begin with miracles or mystery or with the theory of atonement. I would begin as Carnegie Simpson does in his book entitled The Fact of Christ. Commencing with the undisputed fact that Christ lived, he points out that one cannot contemplate this fact without feeling that in some way it is related to those now living. He says that one can read of Alexander, of Caesar, or of Napoleon, and not feel that it is a matter of personal concern, but that when one reads that Christ lived, and how he lived, and how he died, he feels that somehow there is a cord that stretches from that life to his. As he studies the character of Christ, he becomes conscious of certain virtues which stand out in bold relief his purity, his forgiving spirit, and his unfathomable love. The author is correct. Christ presents an example of purity in thought and life, and man, conscious of his own imperfections and grieved over his shortcomings, finds inspiration in the fact that he was tempted in all points like as we are, and yet without sin. I am not sure but that each can find just here a way of determining for himself whether he possesses the true spirit of a Christian. 
if the sinlessness of christ inspires within him an earnest desire to conform his life more nearly to the perfect example he is indeed a follower if on the other hand he resents the reproof which the purity of christ offers and refuses to mend his ways he has yet to be born again the most difficult of all the virtues to cultivate is the forgiving spirit revenge seems to be natural with man it is human to want to get even with an enemy it has even been popular to boast of vindictiveness it was once inscribed on a man's monument that he had repaid both friends and enemies more than he had received this was not the spirit of christ he taught forgiveness and in that incomparable prayer which he left as model for our petitions he made our willingness to forgive the measure by which we may claim forgiveness he not only taught forgiveness but he exemplified his teachings in his life when those who persecuted him brought him to the most disgraceful of all deaths his spirit of forgiveness rose above his sufferings and he prayed father forgive them for they know not what they do but love is the foundation of christ's creed the world had known love before parents had loved their children and children their parents husbands had loved their wives and wives their husbands and friend had loved friend but jesus gave a new definition of love his love was as wide as the sea its limits were so far flung that even an enemy could not travel beyond its bounds other teachers sought to regulate the lives of their followers by rule and formula but christ's plan was to purify the heart and then to leave love to direct the footsteps what conclusion is to be drawn from the life the teachings and the death of this historic figure reared in a carpenter's shop with no knowledge of literature save bible literature with no acquaintance with philosophers living or with the writings of sages dead when only about thirty years old he gathered disciples about him promulgated a higher code of morals than the world had ever known before and proclaimed himself the messiah he taught and performed miracles for a few brief months and then was crucified his disciples were scattered and many of them put to death his claims were disputed his resurrection denied and his followers persecuted and yet from this beginning his religion spread until hundreds of millions have taken his name with reverence upon their lips and millions have been willing to die rather than surrender the faith which he put within their hearts how should we account for him here is the greatest fact of history here is one who has with increasing power for nineteen hundred years molded the hearts the thoughts and the lives of men and he exerts more influence today than ever before what think ye of christ it is easier to believe him divine than to explain in any other way what he said and did and was and i have greater faith even than before since i visited the orient and witnessed the successful contest which christianity is waging against the religions and philosophies of the east i was thinking a few years ago of the christmas which was then approaching and of him in whose honor the day is celebrated i recalled the message peace on earth good will to men and then my thoughts ran back to the prophecy uttered centuries before his birth in which he was described as the prince of peace to reinforce my memory i reread the prophecy and i found immediately following a verse which i had forgotten a verse which declares that of the increase of his peace and government there shall be no end and isaiah adds that he shall judge his people with justice and with judgment i had been reading of the rise and fall of nations and occasionally i had met a gloomy philosopher who preached the doctrine that nations like individuals must of necessity have their birth their infancy their maturity and finally their decay and death but here i read of a government that is to be perpetual a government of increasing peace and blessedness the government of the prince of peace 
and it is to rest on justice. I have thought of this prophecy many times during the last few years, and I have selected this theme that I might present some of the reasons which lead me to believe that Christ has fully earned the right to be called the Prince of Peace, a title that will in the years to come be more and more applied to him. If he can bring peace to each individual heart, and if his creed, when applied, will bring peace throughout the earth, who will deny his right to be called the Prince of Peace? All the world is in search of peace. Every heart that ever beat has sought for peace, and many have been the methods employed to secure it. Some have thought to purchase it with riches, and have labored to secure wealth, hoping to find peace when they were able to go where they pleased and buy what they liked. Of those who have endeavored to purchase peace with money, the large majority have failed to secure the money. But what has been the experience of those who have been eminently successful in finance? They all tell the same story, namely, that they spent the first half of their lives trying to get money from others, and the last half trying to keep others from getting their money, and that they found peace in neither half. Some have even reached the point where they find difficulty in getting people to accept their money, and I know of no better indication of the ethical awakening in this country than the increasing tendency to scrutinize the methods of money-making. I am sanguine enough to believe that the time will yet come when respectability will no longer be sold to great criminals by helping them to spend their ill-gotten gains. A long step in advance will have been taken when religious, educational, and charitable institutions refuse to condone conscienceless methods in business and leave the possessor of illegitimate accumulations to learn how lonely life is when one prefers money to morals. Some have sought peace in social distinction. But whether they had been within the charmed circle, and fearful lest they might fall out, or outside, and hopeful that they might get in, they have not found peace. Some have thought, vain thought, to find peace in political prominence. But whether office comes by birth, as in monarchies, or by election, as in republics, it does not bring peace. An office is not considered a high one if all can occupy it. Only when few in a generation can hope to enjoy an honor do we call it a great honor. I am glad that our Heavenly Father did not make the peace of the human heart to depend upon our ability to buy it with money, secure it in society, or win it at the polls, for in either case but few could have obtained it. But when he made peace the reward of a conscience, void of offense toward God and man, he put it within the reach of all. The poor can secure it as easily as the rich, the social outcast as freely as the leader of society, and the humblest citizen equally with those who wield political power. To those who have grown gray in the church, I need not speak of the peace to be found in faith in God and trust in an overruling providence. Christ taught that our lives are precious in the sight of God, and poets have taken up the thought and woven it into immortal verse. No uninspired writer has expressed it more beautifully than William Cullen Bryant in his Ode to a Waterfowl. After following the wanderings of the bird of passage as it seeks first its southern and then its northern home, he concludes, Thou art gone, the abyss of heaven, hath swallowed up thy form, but on my heart deeply hath sunk the lesson thou hast given, and shall not soon depart. He who, from zone to zone, guides through the boundless sky thy certain flight, in the long way that I must tread alone, will lead my steps aright. Christ promoted peace by giving us assurance that a line of communication can be established between the Father above and the child below. And who will measure the consolations of the hour of prayer? an immortality who will estimate the peace which a belief in the future life has brought to the sorrowing hearts of the sons of men 
You may talk to the young about death ending all, for life is full and hope is strong, but preach not this doctrine to the mother who stands by the deathbed of a babe, or to one who is within the shadow of a great affliction. When I was a young man, I wrote to Colonel Ingersoll and asked him for his views on God and immortality. His secretary answered that the great infidel was not at home, but enclosed a copy of a speech of Colonel Ingersoll's which covered my question. I scanned it with eagerness and found that he had expressed himself about as follows. I do not say that there is no God. I simply say I do not know. I do not say that there is no life beyond the grave. I simply say I do not know. And from that day to this, I have asked myself the question, and have been unable to answer it to my own satisfaction. How could any one find pleasure in taking from a human heart a living faith, and substituting therefore the cold and cheerless doctrine? I do not know. Christ gave us proof of immortality, and it was a welcome assurance, although it would hardly seem necessary that one should rise from the dead to convince us that the grave is not the end. To every created thing God has given a tongue that proclaims a future life. If the Father deigns to touch with divine power the cold and pulseless heart of the buried acorn, and to make it burst forth from its prison walls, Will he leave neglected in the earth the soul of man made in the image of his creator? If he stoops to give to the rose bush, whose withered blossoms float upon the autumn breeze, the sweet assurance of another springtime? Will he refuse the words of hope to the sons of men when the frosts of winter come? If matter, mute and inanimate, though changed by the forces of nature into a multitude of forms, can never die? Will the imperial spirit of man suffer annihilation when it has paid a brief visit, like a royal guest, to this tenement of clay? No, I am sure that he, who, notwithstanding his apparent prodigality, created nothing without a purpose, and wasted not a single atom in all his creation, has made provision for a future life in which man's universal longing for immortality will find its realization i am as sure that we live again as i am sure that we live today in cairo i secured a few grains of wheat that had slumbered for more than thirty centuries in an egyptian tomb as i looked at them this thought came into my mind if one of those grains had been planted on the banks of the nile the year after it grew and all its lineal descendants had been planted and replanted from that time until now its progeny would today be sufficiently numerous to feed the teeming millions of the world an unbroken chain of life connects the earliest grains of wheat with the grains that we sow and reap there isn't the grains of wheat an invisible something which has power to discard the body that we see, and from earth and air fashion a new body, so much like the old one that we cannot tell the one from the other. If this invisible germ of life in the grain of wheat can thus pass unimpaired through three thousand resurrections, I shall not doubt that my soul has power to clothe itself with a body suited to its new existence when this earthly frame has crumbled into dust. A belief in immortality not only consoles the individual, but it exerts a powerful influence in bringing peace between individuals. If one actually thinks that man dies as the brute dies, he will yield more easily to the temptation to do injustice to his neighbor when the circumstances are such as to promise security from detection. But if one really expects to meet again and live eternally with those whom he knows today, he is restrained from evil deeds by the fear of endless remorse. We do not know what rewards are in store for us or what punishments may be reserved, but if there were no other, it would be some punishment for one who deliberately and consciously wrongs another to have to live forever 
in the company of the person wronged and have his littleness and selfishness laid bare i repeat a belief in immortality must exert a powerful influence in establishing justice between men and thus laying the foundation for peace again christ deserves to be called the prince of peace because he has given us a message of greatness which promotes peace when his disciples quarreled among themselves as to which should be greatest in the kingdom of heaven he rebuked them and said let him who would be chiefest among you be the servant of all service is the measure of greatness it always has been true it is true today and it always will be true that he is greatest who does the most of good and how this old world will be transformed when this standard of greatness becomes the standard of every life nearly all of our controversies and combats grow out of the fact that we're trying to get something from each other there will be peace when our aim is to do something for each other our enmities and animosities arise largely from our efforts to get as much as possible out of the world there will be peace when our endeavor is to put as much as possible into the world the human measure of a human life is its income the divine measure of a life is its outgo its overflow its contribution to the welfare of all christ also led the way to peace by giving us a formula for the propagation of truth not all of those who have really desired to do good have employed the christian method not all christians even in the history of the human race but two methods have been used the first is the forcible method and it has been employed most frequently a man has an idea which he thinks is good he tells his neighbors about it and they do not like it this makes him angry he thinks it would be so much better for them if they would like it and seizing a club he attempts to make them like it but one trouble about this rule is that it works both ways when a man starts out to compel his neighbors to think as he does he generally finds them willing to accept the challenge and they spend so much time in trying to coerce each other that they have no time left to do each other good the other is the bible plan be not overcome of evil but overcome evil with good and there is no other way of overcoming evil i am not much of a farmer i get more credit for my farming than i deserve and my little farm receives more advertising than it is entitled to but i am farmer enough to know that if i cut down weeds they will spring up again and farmer enough to know that if i plant something there which has more vitality than the weeds i shall not only get rid of the constant cutting but have the benefit of the crop besides in order that there might be no mistake in his plan of propagating the truth christ went into detail and laid emphasis upon the value of example so live that others seeing your good works may be constrained to glorify your father which is in heaven there is no human influence so potent for good as that which goes out from an upright life a sermon may be answered the arguments presented and the speech may be disputed but no one can answer a christian life it is the unanswerable argument in favor of our religion it may be a slow process this conversion of the world by the silent influence of a noble example but it is the only sure one and the doctrine applies to nations as well as to individuals the gospel of the prince of peace gives us the only hope that the world has and it is an increasing hope of the substitution of reason for the arbitrament of force in the settlement of international disputes and our nation ought not to wait for other nations it ought to take the lead and prove its faith in the omnipotence of truth but christ has given us a platform so fundamental that it can be applied successfully to all controversies 
We are interested in platforms. We attend conventions, sometimes traveling long distances. We have wordy wars over the phraseology of various planks, and then we wage earnest campaigns to secure the endorsement of these platforms at the polls. The platform given to the world by the Prince of Peace is more far-reaching and more comprehensive than any platform ever written by the convention of any party in any country. When he condensed into one commandment those of the ten which relate to man's duty toward his fellows and enjoined upon us the rule, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. He presented a plan for the solution of all the problems that now vex society or may hereafter arise. Other remedies may palliate or postpone the day of settlement, but this is all sufficient, and the reconciliation which it effects is a permanent one. My faith in the future, and I have faith, and my optimism, for I am an optimist, my faith and my optimism rest upon the belief that Christ's teachings are being more studied today than ever before, and that with this larger study will come a larger application of those teachings to the everyday life of the world and to the questions with which we deal. In former times, when men read that Christ came to bring life and immortality to light, they placed the emphasis upon immortality. Now they are studying Christ's relation to human life. People used to read the Bible to find out what it said of heaven. Now they read it more to find out what light it throws upon the pathway of today. In former years, many thought to prepare themselves for future bliss by a life of seclusion here. We are learning that to follow in the footsteps of the Master, we must go about doing good. Christ declared that he came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. The world is learning that Christ came not to narrow life, but to enlarge it, not to rub it of its joy, but to fill it to overflowing with purpose, earnestness, and happiness. But this Prince of Peace promises not only peace, but strength. Some have thought his teachings fit only for the weak and the timid, and unsuited to men of vigor, energy, and ambition. Nothing could be farther from the truth. Only the man of faith can be courageous, confident that he fights on the side of Jehovah. He doubts not the success of his cause. What matters it whether he shares in the shouts of triumph? If every word spoken in behalf of truth has its influence, and every deed done for the right weighs in the final account, it is immaterial to the Christian whether his eyes behold victory or whether he dies in the midst of the conflict. Yea, though thou lie upon the dust, when they who helped thee flee in fear die full of hope and manly trust like those who fell in battle here. Another hand thy sword shall wield, another hand the standard wave, till from the trumpet's mouth is pealed the blast of triumph o'er thy grave. Only those who believe attempt the seemingly impossible, and by attempting prove that one with God can chase a thousand, and that two can put ten thousand to flight. I can imagine that the early Christians who were carried into the Colosseum to make a spectacle for those more savage than the beasts were entreated by their doubting companions not to endanger their lives. But, kneeling in the center of the arena, they prayed and sang until they were devoured. How helpless they seemed, and measured by every human rule, how hopeless was their cause. And yet, within a few decades, the power which they invoked proved mightier than the legions of the emperor, and the faith in which they died was triumphant o'er all the land. It is said that those who went to mock at their sufferings returned asking themselves, What is it that can enter into the heart of man and make him die as these die? 
they were greater conquerors in their death than they could have been had they purchased life by a surrender of their faith. What would have been the fate of the church if the early Christians had had as little faith as many of our Christians of today? And if the Christians of today had the faith of the martyrs, how long would it be before the fulfillment of the prophecy that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess? I am glad that he who is called the Prince of Peace, who can bring peace to every troubled heart, and whose teachings, exemplified in life, will bring peace between man and man, between community and community, between state and state, between nation and nation throughout the world. I am glad that he brings courage as well as peace so that those who follow him may take up and each day bravely do the duties that to that day fall. As the Christian grows older, he appreciates more and more the completeness with which Christ satisfies the longings of the heart, and, grateful for the peace which he enjoys and the strength which he has received, he repeats the words of the great scholar Sir William Jones. Before thy mystic altar, heavenly truth i kneel in manhood as i knelt in youth thus let me kneel till this dull form decay and life's last shade be brightened by thy ray end of section 45 section 46 appendix d speeches for study and practice rufus coat eulogy of webster delivered at dartmouth college july 27 1853 Webster possessed the element of an impressive character, inspiring regard, trust, and admiration, not unmingled with love. It had, I think, intrinsically a charm such as belongs only to a good, noble, and beautiful nature. In its combination with so much fame, so much force of will, and so much intellect, it filled and fascinated the imagination and heart. It was affectionate in childhood and youth, and it was more than ever so in the few last months of his long life. It is the universal testimony that he gave to his parents in largest measure honor, love, obedience, that he eagerly appropriated the first means which he could command to relieve the father from the debts contracted to educate his brother and himself that he selected his first place of professional practice that he might soothe the coming on of his old age equally beautiful was his love of all his kindred and of all his friends when i hear him accused of selfishness and a cold bad nature i recall him lying sleepless all night not without tears of boyhood conferring with ezekiel how the darling desire of both hearts should be compassed and he too admitted to the precious privileges of education courageously pleading the cause of both brothers in the morning prevailing by the wise and discerning affection of the mother suspending his studies of the law and registering deeds and teaching school to earn the means for both of availing themselves of the opportunity which the parental self-sacrifice had placed within their reach loving him through life mourning him when dead with a love and a sorrow very wonderful passing the sorrow of woman i recall the husband the father of the living and of the early departed the friend the counsellor of many years and my heart grows too full and liquid for the refutation of words his affectionate nature, craving ever friendship, as well as the presence of kindred blood, diffused itself through all of his private life, gave sincerity to all his hospitalities, kindness to his eye, warmth to the pressure of his hand, made his greatness and genius unbend themselves to the playfulness of childhood, flowed out in graceful memories indulged of the past or the dead, of incidents when life was young and promised to be happy, gave generous sketches of his rivals, the high contention now hidden by the handful of earth. 
Hours passed fifty years ago with great authors, recalled for the vernal emotions which then they made to live and revel in the soul. And from these conversations of friendship, no man, no man, old or young, went away to remember one word of profaneness, one illusion of indelicacy, one impure thought, one unbelieving suggestion, one doubt cast on the reality of virtue, of patriotism, of enthusiasm, of the progress of man, one doubt cast on righteousness, or temperance, or judgment to come. I have learned by evidence the most direct and satisfactory that in the last months of his life the whole affectionateness of his nature, his consideration of others, his gentleness, his desire to make them happy and to see them happy, seemed to come out in more and more beautiful and habitual expressions than ever before. The long day's public tasks were felt to be done. The cares, the uncertainties, the mental conflicts of high place were ended. And he came home to recover himself for the few years which he might still expect would be his before he should go hence to be here no more. And there, I am assured and duly believe, no unbecoming regrets pursued him no discontent as for injustice suffered or expectations unfulfilled no self-reproach for anything done or anything omitted by himself no irritation no peevishness unworthy of his noble nature but instead love and hope for his country when she became the subject of conversation and for all around him the dearest and most indifferent for all breathing things about him the overflow of the kindest heart growing in gentleness and benevolence paternal patriarchal affections seeming to become more natural warm and communicative every hour Softer and yet brighter grew the tints on the sky of parting day, and the last lingering rays, more even than the glories of noon, announced how divine was the source from which they proceeded, how incapable to be quenched, how certain to rise on a morning which no night should follow. Such a character was made to be loved. It was loved. Those who knew and saw it in its hour of calm, those who could repose on that soft green, loved him. His plain neighbors loved him, and one said, when he was laid in his grave, how lonesome the world seems. Educated young men loved him the ministers of the gospel the general intelligence of the country the masses afar off loved him true they had not found in his speeches read by millions so much adulation of the people so much of the music which robs the public reason of itself so many phrases of humanity and philanthropy and some had told them he was lofty and cold solitary in his greatness but every year they came nearer and nearer to him and as they came nearer they loved him better they heard how tender the son had been the husband the brother the father the friend and neighbor that he was plain simple natural generous hospitable the heart larger than the brain that he loved little children and reverenced god the scriptures the sabbath day the constitution and the law and their hearts clave unto him more truly of him than even of the great naval darling of england might it be said that his presence would set the church bells ringing and give schoolboys a holiday would bring children from school and old men from the chimney corner to gaze on him ere he died the great and unavailing lamentations first revealed the deep place he had in the hearts of his countrymen. You are now to add to this his extraordinary power of influencing the convictions of others by speech, and you have completed the survey of the means of his greatness.
and here again i begin by admiring an aggregate made up of excellences and triumphs ordinarily deemed incompatible he spoke with consummate ability to the bench and yet exactly as according to every sound canon of taste and ethics the bench ought to be addressed he spoke with consummate ability to the jury and yet exactly as according to every sound canon that totally different tribunal ought to be addressed in the halls of congress before the people assembled for political discussions in masses before audiences smaller and more select assembled for some solemn commemoration of the past or of the dead in each of these again his speech of the first form of ability was exactly adapted also to the critical properties of the place each achieved when delivered the most instant and specific success of eloquence some of them in a splendid and remarkable degree and yet stranger still when reduced to writing as they fell from his lips they compose a body of reading in many volumes solid clear rich and full of harmony a classical and permanent political literature and yet all of these modes of his eloquence exactly adapted each to its stage and its end were stamped with his image and superscription identified by characteristics incapable to be counterfeited and impossible to be mistaken the same high power of reason intent in every one to explore and display some truth some truth of judicial or historical or biographical fact some truth of law deduced by construction perhaps or by elation some truth of policy for want whereof a nation generations may be the worse reason seeking and unfolding truth the same tone in all of deep earnestness expressive of strong desire that what he felt to be important should be accepted as true and spring up to action the same transparent plain forcible and direct speech conveying his exact thought to the mind not something less or more the same sovereignty of form of brow and eye and tone and manner everywhere the intellectual king of men standing before you that same marvelousness of qualities and results residing i know not where in words in pictures in the ordering of ideas in felicities indescribable by means whereof coming from his tongue all things seemed mended truth seemed more true probability more plausible greatness more grand goodness more awful every affection more tender than when coming from other tongues these are in all his eloquence but sometimes it became individualized and discriminated even from itself sometimes place and circumstances great interests at stake a stage an audience fitted for the highest historic action a crisis personal or national upon him stirred the depths of that emotional nature as the anger of the goddess stirs the sea on which the great epic is beginning strong passions themselves kindled to intensity quickened every faculty to a new life the stimulated associations of ideas brought all treasures of thought and knowledge within command the spell which often held his imagination fast dissolved and she arose and gave him to choose of her urn of gold earnestness became vehement the simple perspicuous measured and direct language became a headlong full and burning tide of speech the discourse of reason wisdom gravity and beauty changed to that superhuman that rarest consummate eloquence grand rapid pathetic terrible the aliquid immensum infinumque that cicero might have recognized the master triumph of man in the rarest opportunity of his noble power 
such elevation above himself in congressional debate was most uncommon some such there were in the great discussions of executive power following the removal of the deposits which they who heard them will never forget and some which rest in the tradition of hearers only but there were other fields of oratory on which under the influence of more uncommon springs of inspiration he exemplified in still other forms an eloquence of which i do not know that he has had a superior among men addressing masses by tens of thousands in the open air on the urgent political questions of the day or designed to lead the meditations of an hour devoted to the remembrance of some national era or of some incident marking the progress of the nation and lifting him up to a view of what is and what is past and some indistinct revelation of the glory that lies in the future or of some great historical name just borne by the nation to his tomb we have learned that then and there at the base of bunker hill before the cornerstone was laid and again when from the finished column the centuries looked on him in fanal hall mourning for those with whose spoken or written eloquence of freedom its arches had so often resounded on the rock of plymouth before the capital of which there shall not be one stone left on another before his memory shall have ceased to live in such scenes unfettered by the laws of forensic or parliamentary debate multitudes uncounted lifting up their eyes to him some great historical scenes of america around all symbols of her glory and art and power and fortune there voices of the past not unheard shapes beckoning from the future not unseen sometimes that mighty intellect borne upward to a height and kindled to an illumination which we shall see no more wrought out as it were in an instant a picture of vision warning prediction the progress of the nation the contrasts of it eras the heroic deaths the motives to patriotism the maxims and arts imperial by which the glory has been gathered and may be heightened wrought out in an instant a picture to fade only when all record of our mind shall die in looking over the public remains of his oratory it is striking to remark how even in that most sober and massive understanding and nature you see gathered and expressed the characteristic sentiments and the passing time of our america it is the strong old oak which ascends before you let our soil our heaven are attested in it as perfectly as if it were a flower that could grow in no other climate and in no other hour of the year or day let me instance in one thing only it is a peculiarity of some scores of eloquence that they embody and utter not merely the individual genius and character of the speaker but a national consciousness a national era a mood a hope a dread a despair in which you listen to the spoken history of the time there is an eloquence of an expiring nation such as seems to sadden the glorious speech of demosthenes such as breathes grand and gloomy from visions of the prophets of the last days of israel and judah such as gave a spell to the expression of grattan and of kasuth the sweetest most mournful most awful of the words which man may utter or which man may hear the eloquence of a perishing nation there is another eloquence in which the national consciousness of a young or renewed and vast strength of trust in a dazzling certain and limitless future an inward glorying in victories yet to be won sounds out as by voice of clarion challenging to contest for the highest prize of earth 
such as that in which the leader of Israel in its first days holds up to the new nation the land of promise, such as that which, in the well-imagined speeches scattered by Livy over the history of the majestic series of victories, speaks the Roman consciousness of growing aggrandizement which should subject the world such as that through which at the tribunes of her revolution in the bulletins of her rising soldiers france told to the world her dream of glory and of this kind somewhere is ours cheerful hopeful trusting as befits youth and spring the eloquence of a state beginning to ascend to the first class of power eminence and consideration and conscious of itself it is to no purpose that they tell you it is in bad taste that it partakes of arrogance and vanity that a true national good breeding would not know or seem to know whether the nation is old or young whether the tides of being are in their flow or ebb whether these courses of the sun are sinking slowly to rest wearied with a journey of a thousand years or just bounding from the orient unbreathed Higher laws than those of taste determine the consciousness of nations. Higher laws than those of taste determine the general forms of the expression of that consciousness. Let the downward age of America find its orators and poets and artists to erect its spirit or grace and soothe its dying. Be it ours to go up with Webster to the rock, the monument, the capital, and bid the distant generations hail. Until the seventh day of March, 1850, I think it would have been accorded to him by an almost universal acclaim, as general and as expressive of profound and intelligent conviction, and of enthusiasm, love, and trust, as ever saluted conspicuous statesmanship, tried by many crises of affairs in a great nation, agitated ever by parties, and wholly Free. End of section 46, section 47, appendix D, speeches for study and practice. Albert J. Beveridge, Past Prosperity Around, delivered as temporary chairman of the Progressive Party, National Convention, Chicago, Illinois, June 1911. We stand for a nobler America. We stand for an undivided nation. We stand for a broader liberty, a fuller justice. We stand for a social brotherhood as against savage individualism. We stand for an intelligent cooperation instead of a reckless competition. We stand for mutual helpfulness instead of mutual hatred. We stand for equal rights as a fact of life instead of a catchword of politics. We stand for the rule of the people as a practical truth instead of a meaningless pretense. We stand for a representative government that represents the people. We battle for the actual rights of man. To carry out our principles, we have a plain program of constructive reform. We mean to tear down only that which is wrong and out of date and where we tear down we mean to build what is right and fitted to the times we hearken to the call of the present we mean to make laws fit conditions as they are and meet the needs of the people who are on earth today that we may do this we found a party through which all who believe with us can work with us or rather we declare our allegiance to the party which the people themselves have founded for this party comes from the grass roots. It has grown from the soil of the people's hard necessities. It has the vitality of the people's strong convictions. The people have work to be done, and our party is here to do that work. Abuse will only strengthen it. Ridicule only hasten its growth. Falsehood only speed its victory. For years this party has been forming. Parties exist for the people, not the people for parties. 
Yet for years the politicians have made the people do the work of the parties instead of the parties doing the work of the people, and the politicians own the parties. The people vote for one party and find their hopes turn to ashes on their lips, and then to punish that party they vote for the other party. So it is that partisan victories have come to be merely the people's vengeance, and always the secret powers have played their game. Like other free people, most of us Americans are progressive or reactionary, liberal or conservative. The neutrals do not count. Yet today, neither of the old parties is either wholly progressive or wholly reactionary. Democratic politicians and office seekers say to reactionary Democratic voters that the Democratic Party is reactionary enough to express reactionary views. And they say to progressive Democrats that the Democratic Party is progressive enough to express progressive views. At the same time, Republican politicians and office seekers say the same thing about the Republican Party to progressive and reactionary Republican voters. Sometimes in both Democratic and Republican states, the progressives get control of the party locally, and then the reactionaries recapture the same party in the same state. Or this process is reversed. So there is no nationwide unity of principle in either party, no stability of purpose, no clear-cut and sincere program of one party at frank and open war with an equally clear-cut and sincere program of an opposing party. This unintelligent tangle is seen in Congress. Republican and Democratic senators and representatives, believing alike on broad measures affecting the whole republic, find it hard to vote together because of the nominal difference of their party membership. When, sometimes, under resistless conviction, they do vote together, we have this foolish spectacle. Legislators calling themselves Republicans and Democrats support the same policy, the Democratic legislators declaring that that policy is Democratic, and Republican legislators declaring that it is Republican. And at the very same time, other Democratic and Republican legislators oppose that very same policy, each of them declaring that it is not Democratic or not Republican. The condition makes it impossible most of the time, and hard at any time, for the people's legislators who believe in the same broad policies to enact them into logical, comprehensive laws. It confuses the public mind. It breeds suspicion and distrust. It enables such special interests as seek unjust gain at the public expense to get what they want. It creates and fosters the degrading boss system in American politics through which these special interests work. This boss system is unknown and impossible under any other free government in the world. In its very nature, it is hostile to general welfare. Yet it has grown until it now is a controlling influence in American public affairs. At the present moment, notorious bosses are in the saddle of both old parties in various important states which must be carried to elect a president. This black horse cavalry is the most important force in the practical work of the Democratic and Republican parties in the present campaign. Neither of the old party's nominees for president can escape obligation to these old party bosses or shake their practical hold on many and powerful members of the national legislature. Under this boss system, no matter which party wins, the people seldom win, but the bosses almost always win, and they never work for the people. They do not even work for the party to which they belong. They work only for those anti-public interests whose political employees they are. It is these interests that are the real victors in the end. 
These special interests which suck the people's substance are bipartisan. They use both parties. They are the invisible government behind our visible government. Democratic and Republican bosses alike are brother officers of this hidden power. No matter how fiercely they pretend to fight one another before election, they work together after election. And, acting so, this political conspiracy is able to delay, mutilate, or defeat sound and needed laws for the people's welfare and the prosperity of honest business, and even to enact bad laws hurtful to the people's welfare and oppressive to honest business. It is this invisible government which is the real danger to American institutions. Its crude work at Chicago in June, which the people were able to see, was no more wicked than its skillful work everywhere, and always which the people are not able to see. But an even more serious condition results from the unnatural alignment of the old parties. Today, we Americans are politically shattered by sectionalism. Through the two old parties, the tragedy of our history is continued, and one great geographical part of the Republic is separated from other parts of the Republic by an illogical partisan solidarity. The South has men and women as genuinely progressive and others as genuinely reactionary as those in other parts of our country. Yet, for well-known reasons, these sincere and honest Southern progressives and reactionaries vote together in a single party which is neither progressive nor reactionary. They vote a dead tradition and a local fear, not a living conviction and a national faith. They vote not for the Democratic Party, but against the Republican Party. They want to be free from this condition. They can be free from it through the National Progressive Party. For the problems which America faces today are economic and national. They have to do with a more just distribution of prosperity. They concern the living of the people, and therefore the more direct government of the people by themselves. They affect the South exactly as they affect the North, the East, or the West. It is an artificial and dangerous condition that prevents the Southern man and woman from acting with the Northern man and woman who believe the same thing. Yet just that is what the old parties do prevent. Not only does this out-of-date partisanship cut our nation into two geographical sections, it also robs the nation of a priceless asset of thought in working out our national destiny. The South once was famous for brilliant and constructive thinking on national problems. And today, the South has minds as brilliant and constructive as of old. But Southern intellect cannot freely and fully aid, in terms of politics, the solving of the nation's problems. This is so because of a partisan sectionalism, which has nothing to do with those problems. Yet these problems can be solved only in terms of politics. The root of the wrongs which hurt the people is the fact that the people's government has been taken away from them. The invisible government has usurped the people's government. Their government must be given back to the people. And so the first purpose of the Progressive Party is to make sure the rule of the people. The rule of the people means that the people themselves shall nominate as well as elect all candidates for office, including senators and presidents of the United States. What profiteth it the people if they do only the electing while the invisible government does the nominating? The rule of the people means that when the people's legislators make a law which hurts the people, the people themselves may reject it. The rule of the people means that when the people's legislators refuse to pass a law which the people need, the people themselves may pass it.
The rule of the people means that when the people's employees do not do the people's work well and honestly, the people may discharge them exactly as a businessman discharges employees who do not do their work well and honestly. The people's officials are the people's servants, not the people's masters. We progressives believe in this rule of the people, that the people themselves may deal with their own destiny. Who knows the people's needs so well as the people themselves? Who's so patient as the people? Who's so long-suffering? Who's so just? Who's so wise to solve their own problems? Today, these problems concern the living of the people. Yet in the present stage of American development, these problems should not exist in this country. For in all the world there is no land so rich as ours. Our fields can feed hundreds of millions. We have more minerals than the whole of Europe. Invention has made easy the turning of this vast natural wealth into supplies for all the needs of man. One worker today can produce more than 20 workers could produce a century ago. The people living in this land of gold are the most daring and resourceful on the globe. Coming from the hardiest stock of every nation of the old world, their very history in the new world has made Americans a peculiar people in courage, initiative, love of justice, and all the elements of independent character. And, compared with other people, we are very few in numbers. There are only 90 millions of us scattered over a continent. Germany has 65 millions, packed in a country very much smaller than Texas. The population of Great Britain and Ireland could be set down in California and still have more than enough room for the population of Holland. If this country were as thickly peopled as Belgium, there would be more than 1,200 million instead of only 90 million persons within our borders. So we have more than enough to supply every human being beneath the flag. There ought not to be in this republic a single day of bad business, a single unemployed working man, a single unfed child. American businessmen should never know an hour of uncertainty, discouragement, or fear. American working men never a day of low wages, idleness, or want. Hunger should never walk in these thinly peopled gardens of plenty. And yet, in spite of all these favors which providence has showered upon us, the living of people is the problem of the hour. Hundreds of thousands of hard-working Americans find it difficult to get enough to live on. The average income of an American laborer is less than $500 a year. With this, he must furnish food, shelter, and clothing for a family. Women, whose nourishing and protection should be the first care of the state, not only are driven into the mighty army of wage earners, but are forced to work under unfair and degrading conditions. The right of a child to grow into a normal human being is sacred. And yet, while small and poor countries packed with people have abolished child labor, American mills, mines, factories, and sweatshops are destroying hundreds of thousands of American children in body, mind, and soul. At the same time, men have grasped fortunes in this country so great that the human mind cannot comprehend their magnitude. These mountains of wealth are far larger than even that lavish reward which no one would deny to business risk or genius. On the other hand, American business is uncertain and unsteady compared with the business of other nations. American businessmen are the best and bravest in the world, and yet our business conditions hamper their energies and chill their courage. We have no permanency in business affairs, no sure outlook upon the business future. 
This unsettled state of American business prevents it from realizing for the people that great and continuous prosperity which our country's location, vast wealth, and small population justifies. We mean to remedy these conditions. We mean not only to make prosperity steady, but to give to the many who earn it a just share of that prosperity instead of helping the few who do not earn it to take an unjust share. The progressive motto is, pass prosperity around. To make human living easier, to free the hands of honest business, to make trade and commerce sound and steady, to protect womanhood, save childhood, and restore the dignity of manhood, these are the tasks we must do. What, then, is the progressive answer to these questions? We are able to give it specifically and concretely. The first work before us is the revival of honest business. The business is nothing but the industrial and trade activities of all the people. Men grow the products of the field, cut ripe timber from the forest, dig metal from the mine, fashion all for human use, carry them to the marketplace and exchange them according to their mutual needs, and this is business. With our vast advantages, contrasted with the vast disadvantages of other nations, American business all the time should be the best and steadiest in the world. But it is not. Germany, with shallow soil, no mines, only a window on the seas, and a population more than ten times as dense as ours, yet has a sounder business, a steadier prosperity, a more contented, because better cared for, people. What, then, must we do to make American business better? We must do what poorer nations have done. We must end the abuses of business by striking down those abuses instead of striking down business itself. We must try to make little business big and all business honest instead of striving to make big business little and yet letting it remain dishonest. Present-day business is as unlike old-time business as the old-time ox cart is unlike the present-day locomotive. Invention has made the whole world over again. The railroad, telegraph, telephone have bound the people of modern nations into families. To do the business of these closely-knit millions in every modern country, great business concerns came into being. What we call big business is the child of the economic progress of mankind. So warfare to destroy big business is foolish because it cannot succeed, and wicked because it ought not to succeed. Warfare to destroy big business does not hurt big business, which always comes out on top, so much as it hurts all other business, which, in such a warfare, never comes out on top. With the growth of big business came business evils just as great. It is these evils of big business that hurt the people and injure all other business. One of these wrongs is overcapitalization, which taxes the people's very living. Another is the manipulation of prices to the unsettlement of all normal business and to the people's damage. Another is interference in the making of the people's laws and the running of the people's government in the unjust interest of evil business getting laws that enable particular interests to rob the people and even to gather criminal riches from human health and life is still another. An example of such laws is the infamous tobacco legislation of 1902, which authorized the Tobacco Trust to continue to collect from the people the Spanish war tax, amounting to a score of millions of dollars, but to keep that tax instead of turning it over to the government, as it had been doing. Another example is the shameful meat legislation, by which the Beef Trust had the meat it sent abroad inspected by the government, so that foreign countries would take its product and yet was permitted to sell diseased meat to our own people.
It is incredible that laws like these could ever get on the nation's statute books. The invisible government put them there, and only the universal wrath of an enraged people corrected them when, after years, the people discovered the outrages. It is to get just such laws as these and to prevent the passage of laws to correct them as well as to keep off the statute books general laws which will end the general abuses of big business that these few criminal interests corrupt our politics, invest in public officials, and keep in power in both parties that type of politician and party managers who debase American politics. Behind rotten laws and preventing sound laws stands the corrupt boss. Behind the corrupt boss stands the robber interest. And commanding these powers of pillage stands bloated human greed. It is this conspiracy of evil we must overthrow if we would get the honest laws we need. It is this invisible government we must destroy if we would save American institutions. Other nations have ended the very same business evils from which we suffer by clearly defining business wrongdoing and then making it a criminal offense punishable by imprisonment. Yet these foreign nations encourage big business itself and foster all honest business. But they do not tolerate dishonest business, little or big. What then shall we Americans do? Common sense and the experience of the world says that we ought to keep the good big business does for us and stop the wrongs that big business does to us. Yet we have done just the other thing. We have struck at big business itself and have not even aimed to strike at the evils of big business. Nearly 25 years ago, Congress passed a law to govern American business in the present time, which Parliament passed in the reign of King James to govern English business in that time. For a quarter of a century, the courts have tried to make this law work. Yet, during this very time, trusts grew greater in number and power than in the whole history of the world before and their evils flourished unhindered and unchecked. These great business concerns grew because natural laws made them grow, and artificial law at war with natural law could not stop their growth. But their evils grew faster than the trust themselves because avarice nourished those evils, and no law of any kind stopped avarice from nourishing them. Nor is this the worst. Under the shifting interpretation of the Sherman Law, uncertainty and fear is chilling the energies of the great body of honest American businessmen. As the Sherman Law now stands, no two businessmen can arrange their mutual affairs and be sure that they are not lawbreakers. This is the main hindrance to the immediate and permanent revival of American business. If German or English businessmen, with all their disadvantages compared with our advantages, were manacled by our Sherman law, as it stands, they soon would be bankrupt. Indeed, foreign businessmen declare that, if their countries had such a law, so administered, they could not do business at all. Even this is not all. By the decrees of our courts, under the Sherman law, the two mightiest trusts on earth have actually been licensed in the practical outcome to go on doing every wrong they ever committed. Under the decrees of the courts, the oil and tobacco trusts still can raise prices unjustly and already have done so. They still can issue watered stock and surely will do so. They still can throttle other businessmen, and the United Cigar Stores Company now is doing so. They still can corrupt our politics, and this moment are indulging in that practice. The people are tired of this mock battle with criminal capital. They do not want to hurt business, but they do want to get something done about the trust question that amounts to something. 
what good does it do any man to read in his morning paper that the courts have dissolved the oil trust and then read in his evening paper that he must thereafter pay a higher price for his oil than ever before what good does it do the laborer who smokes his pipe to be told that the courts have dissolved the tobacco trust and yet find that he must pay the same or a higher price for the same short weight package of tobacco yet all this is the practical result of the suits against these two greatest trusts in the world such business chaos and legal paradoxes as american business suffers from can be found nowhere else in the world rival nations do not fasten legal ball and chain upon their business no they put wings on its flying feet rival nations do not tell their business men that if they go forward with legitimate enterprise the penitentiary may be their goal no rival nations tell their business men that so long as they do honest business their governments will not hinder but will help them but these rival nations do tell their business men that if they do any evil that our business men do prison bars await them these rival nations do tell their business men that if they issue watered stock or cheat the people in any way prison cells will be their homes just this is what all honest american business wants just this is what dishonest american business does not want just this is what the american people propose to have just this the national republic platform of 1908 pledged the people that we would give them and just this important pledge the administration elected on that platform repudiated as it repudiated the more immediate tariff pledge both these reforms so vital to honest american business the progressive party will accomplish neither evil interests nor reckless demagogues can swerve us from our purpose for we are free from both and fear neither we mean to put new business laws on our statute books which will tell american businessmen what they can do and what they cannot do we mean to make our business laws clear instead of foggy to make them plainly state just what things are criminal and what are lawful and we mean that the penalty for things criminal shall be prison sentences that actually punish the real offender instead of money fines that hurt nobody but the people who must pay them in the end and then we mean to send the message forth to hundreds of thousands of brilliant minds and brave hearts engaged in honest business that they are not criminals but honorable men in their work to make good business in this republic sure of victory we even now say Go forward, American businessmen, and know that behind you, supporting you, encouraging you, are the power and approval of the greatest people under the sun. Go forward, American businessmen, and feed full the fires beneath American furnaces, and give employment to every American laborer who asks for work. Go forward, American businessmen, and capture the markets of the world for American trade, and know that on the wings of your commerce you carry liberty throughout the world and to every inhabitant thereof. Go forward, American businessmen, and realize that in the time to come it shall be said of you, as it is said of the hand that rounded Peter's dome, he builded better than he knew. The next great business reform we must have to steadily increase American prosperity is to change the method of building our tariffs. The tariff must be taken out of politics and treated as a business question instead of as a political question. Heretofore we have done just the other thing. That is why American business is upset every few years by unnecessary tariff upheavals and is weakened by uncertainty in the periods between. The greatest need of business is certainty, but the only thing certain about our tariff is uncertainty. What then shall we do to make our tariff changes strengthen business instead of weakening business? 
rival protective tariff nations have answered that question. Common sense has answered it. Next to our need to make the Sherman law modern, understandable, and just, our greatest fiscal need is a genuine, permanent, non-partisan tariff commission. Five years ago, when the fight for this great business measure was begun in the Senate, the bosses of both parties were against it. So, when the last revision of the tariff was on, and a tariff commission might have been written into the tariff law, the administration would not aid this reform. When two years later the administration supported it weakly, the bipartisan boss system killed it. There has not been and will not be any sincere and honest effort by the old parties to get a tariff commission. There has not been and will not be any sincere and honest purpose by those parties to take the tariff out of politics. For the tariff in politics is the excuse for those sham political battles which give the spoilers their opportunity. The tariff in politics is one of the invisible government's methods of wringing tribute from the people. Through the tariff in politics, the beneficiaries of tariff excesses are cared for, no matter which party is revising. Who has forgotten the tariff scandals that made President Cleveland denounce the Wilson-Gorman bill as a perfidy and a dishonor? Who can ever forget the brazen robberies forced into the Payne Aldrich bill, which Mr. Taft defended as the best ever made? If everyone else forgets these things, the interests that profited by them never will forget them. The bosses and lobbyists that grew rich by putting them through never will forget them. That is why the invisible government and its agents want to keep the old method of tariff building, for, though such tariff revisions may make lean years for the people, they make fat years for the powers of pillage and their agents. So neither of the old parties can honestly carry out any tariff policies which they pledge the people to carry out. But even if they could, and even if they were sincere, the old party platforms are in error on tariff policy. The democratic platform declares for free trade, but free trade is wrong and ruinous. The republican platform permits extortion, but tariff extortion is robbery by law. The progressive party is for honest protection, and honest protection is right and a condition of American prosperity. A tariff high enough to give American producers the American market when they make honest goods and sell them at honest prices, but low enough that when they sell dishonest goods at dishonest prices, foreign competition can correct both evils. A tariff high enough to enable American producers to pay our working men American wages and so arrange that the working men will get such wages. A business tariff whose changes will be so made as to reassure business instead of disturbing it. This is the tariff and the method of its making in which the progressive party believes, for which it does battle and which it proposes to write into the laws of the land. The payne Aldrich tariff law must be revised immediately in accordance to these principles. At the same time, a genuine, permanent, non-partisan tariff commission must be fixed in the law as firmly as the Interstate Commerce Commission. Neither of the old parties can do this work, for neither of the old parties believe in such a tariff, and, what is more serious, special privilege is too thoroughly woven into the fiber of both old parties to allow them to make such a tariff. The Progressive Party only is free from these influences. The Progressive Party only believes in the sincere enactment of a sound tariff policy. The Progressive Party only can change the tariff as it must be changed. These are samples of the reforms in the laws of business that we intend to put on the nation's statute books. But there are other questions as important and pressing that we mean to answer by sound and humane laws. 
child labor in factories mills mines and sweatshops must be ended throughout the republic such labor is a crime against childhood because it prevents the growth of normal manhood and womanhood it is a crime against the nation because it prevents the growth of a host of children into strong patriotic and intelligent citizens only the nation can stop this industrial vice the states cannot stop it the states never stopped any national wrong and child labor is a national wrong to leave it to the states alone is unjust to business for if some states stop it and other states do not business men of the former are at a disadvantage with the business men of the latter because they must sell in the same market goods made by manhood labor at manhood wages in competition with goods made by childhood labor at childhood wages to leave it to the states is unjust to manhood labor for childhood labor in any state lowers manhood labor in every state because the product of child Childhood labor in any state competes with the product of manhood labor in every state. Children workers at the looms in South Carolina means bayonets at the breasts of men and women workers in Massachusetts who strike for living wages. Let the states do what they can and more power to their arm, but let the nation do what it should and cleanse our flag from this stain. Modern industrialism has changed the status of women. Women now are wage earners in factories, stores, and other places of toil. In hours of labor and all the physical conditions of industrial effort, they must compete with men, and they must do it at lower wages than men receive, wages which, in most cases, are not enough for these women workers to live on. This is inhuman and indecent. It is unsocial and uneconomic. It is immoral and unpatriotic. Toward women, the Progressive Party proclaims the chivalry of the state. We propose to protect women wage earners by suitable laws, an example of which is the minimum wage for women workers, a wage which shall be high enough to at least buy clothing, food, and shelter for the woman toiler. The care of the aged is one of the most perplexing problems of modern life. How is the working man, with less than $500 a year and with earning power waning as his own years advance, to provide for aged parents or other relatives, in addition to furnishing food, shelter, and clothing for his wife and children? What is to become of the family of the laboring man whose strength has been sapped by excessive toil and who has been thrown upon the industrial scrap heap? It is questions like these we must answer if we are to justify free institutions. They are questions to which the masses of people are chained as to a body of death. And they are questions which other and poorer nations are answering. We progressives mean that America shall answer them. The progressive party is the helping hand to those who a vicious industrialism has maimed and crippled. We are for the conservation of our natural resources, but even more, we are for the conservation of human life. Our forests, water power, and minerals are valuable and must be saved from the spoilers. But men, women, and children are more valuable, and they too must be saved from the spoilers. Because women, as much as men, are a part of our economic and social life, women, as much as men, should have the voting power to solve all economic and social problems. Votes for women are theirs as a matter of natural rights alone. Votes for women should be theirs as a matter of political wisdom also. As wage earners, they should help to solve the labor problems. As property owners, they should help to solve the tax problem. As wives and mothers, they should help to solve all the problems that concern the home. And that means all national problems, for the nation abides at the fireside. 
If it is said that women cannot help defend the nation in time of war, and therefore that they should not help to determine the nation's destinies in time of peace, the answer is that women suffer and serve in time of conflict as much as men who carry muskets. And the deeper answer is that those who bear the nation's soldiers are as much the nation's defenders as their sons. Public spokesmen for the invisible government say that many of our reforms are unconstitutional. The same kind of men said the same thing of every effort the nation has made to end national abuses. But in every case, whether in the courts, at the ballot box, or on the battlefield, the vitality of the Constitution was vindicated. The Progressive Party believes that the Constitution is a living thing, growing with the people's growth, strengthening with the people's strength, aiding the people in their struggle for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, permitting the people to meet all their needs as conditions change. The opposition believes that the Constitution is a dead form, holding back the people's growth, shackling the people's strength, but giving a free hand to malign powers that prey upon the people. The first words of the Constitution are, We the people! And they declare that the Constitution's purpose is to form a perfect union and to promote the general welfare. To do just that is the very heart of the progressive cause. The progressive party asserts anew the vitality of the Constitution. We believe in the true doctrine of states' rights, which forbids the nation from interfering with states' affairs, and also forbids the states from interfering with national affairs. The combined intelligence and composite conscience of the American people is as irresistible as it is righteous, and the Constitution does not prevent that force from working out the general welfare. From certain sources we hear preachments about the danger of our reforms to American institutions. What is the purpose of American institutions? Why was this republic established? What does the flag stand for? What do these things mean? They mean that the people shall be free to correct human abuses. They mean that men, women, and children shall not be denied the opportunity to grow stronger and nobler. They mean that the people shall have the power to make our land each day a better place to live in. They mean the realities of liberty and not the academics of theory. They mean the actual progress of the race in tangible items of daily living, and not the theoretics of barren disputation. If they do not mean these things, they are as sounding brass and tinkling cymbals. A nation of strong, upright men and women, a nation of wholesome homes, realizing the best ideals, a nation whose power is glorified by its justice, and whose justice is the conscience of scores of millions of God-fearing people. That is the nation the people need and want, and that is the nation they shall have. For never doubt that we Americans will make good the real meaning of our institutions. Never doubt that we will solve in righteousness and wisdom every vexing problem. Never doubt that in the end the hand from above that leads us upward will prevail over the hand from below that drags us downward. Never doubt that we are indeed a nation whose God is the Lord. And so, never doubt that a braver, fairer, cleaner America surely will come, that a better and brighter life for all beneath the flag surely will be achieved. Those who now scoff soon will pray. Those who now doubt soon will believe. Soon the nights will pass, and when, to the sentinel on the ramparts of liberty, the anxious ask, Watchman, what of the night? 
his answer will be, Lo, the morn appeareth. Knowing the price we must pay, the sacrifice we must make, the burdens we must carry, the assaults we must endure, knowing full well the cost, yet we enlist, and we enlist for the war, for we know the justice of our cause, and we know, too, its certain triumph. Not reluctantly then, but eagerly, not with faint hearts, but strong, do we now advance upon the enemies of the people. For the call that comes to us is the call that came to our fathers. As they responded, so shall we. He hath sounded forth a trumpet that shall never call retreat. He is sifting out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. Oh, be swift our souls to answer him. Be jubilant our feet. Our God is marching on. End of section 47. Section 48, Appendix D, Speeches for Study and Practice. Russell Conwell, Acres of Diamonds. Footnote. Reported by A. Russell Smith and Harry E. Grieger, used by permission. On May 21, 1914, when Dr. Conwell delivered this lecture for the 5,000th time, Mr. John Wanamaker said that if the proceeds had been put out at compound interest, the sum would aggregate eight millions of dollars. Dr. Conway has uniformly devoted his lecturing income to works of benevolence. I am astonished that so many people should care to hear this story over again. Indeed, this lecture has become a study in psychology. It often breaks all rules of oratory, departs from the precepts of rhetoric, and yet remains the most popular of any lecture I have delivered in the forty-four years of my public life. I have sometimes studied for a year upon a lecture, and made careful research, and then presented the lecture just once, never delivered it again. I put too much work on it. But this had no work on it, thrown together perfectly at random, spoken offhand without any special preparation, and it succeeds when the thing we study, work over, adjust to a plan, is an entire failure. The acres of diamonds, which I have mentioned through so many years, are to be found in Philadelphia, and you are to find them. Many have found them, and what man has done, man can do. I could not find anything better to illustrate my thought than a story I have told over and over again, and which is now found in books in nearly every library. In 1870, we went down the Tigris River. We hired a guide at Baghdad to show us Persepolis, Nineveh, and Babylon, and the ancient countries of Assyria as far as the Arabian Gulf. He was well acquainted with the land, but he was one of those guides who loved to entertain their patrons. He was like a barber that tells you many stories in order to keep your mind off the scratching and the scraping. He told me so many stories that I grew tired of his telling them, and I refused to listen, looked away whenever he commenced. That made the guide quite angry. I remember that towards evening he took his Turkish cap off his head and swung it around in the air. The gesture I did not understand, and I did not dare look at him for fear I should become the victim of another story. But... Although I am not a woman, I did look, and the instant I turned my eyes upon that worthy guide, he was off again. Said he, I will tell you a story now which I reserve for my particular friends. So then, counting myself a particular friend, I listened, and I have always been glad I did. He said there once lived not far from the river Indus an ancient Persian by the name of Al-Hafed. He said that Al-Hafed owned a very large farm with orchards, grain fields, and gardens. He was a contented and wealthy man, contented because he was wealthy, and wealthy because he was contented. One day there visited this old farmer, one of those ancient Buddhist priests, and he sat down by Al-Hafed's fire and told that old farmer how this world of ours was made. He said that this world was once a mere bank of fog, 
which is scientifically true, and he said that the Almighty thrust his finger into the bank of fog, and then began slowly to move his finger around, and gradually to increase the speed of his finger, until at last he whirled that bank of fog into a solid ball of fire, and it went rolling through the universe, burning its way through other cosmic banks of fog, until it condensed the moisture without, and fell in floods of rain upon the heated surface, and cooled the outer crust. Then the internal flames burst through the cooling crust and threw up the mountains and made the hills of the valley of this wonderful world of ours. If this internal melted mass burst out and copied very quickly, it became granite. That which cooled less quickly became silver and less quickly gold and after gold diamonds were made. Said the old priest, A diamond is a congealed drop of sunlight. This is a scientific truth also. You all know that a diamond is pure carbon, actually deposited sunlight. And he said another thing I would not forget. He declared that a diamond is the last and highest of God's mineral creations as a woman is the last and highest of God's animal creations. I suppose that is the reason why the two have such a liking for each other. And the old priest told al Hafed that if he had a handful of diamonds, he could purchase a whole country, and with a mine of diamonds, he could place his children upon thrones through the influence of their great wealth. Al Hafed heard all about diamonds and how much they were worth, and went to his bed that night a poor man. Not that he has lost anything, but poor because he was discontented, and discontented because he thought he was poor. He said, I want a mine of diamonds. So he lay awake all night, and early in the morning sought out the priest. Now, I know from experience that a priest when awakened early in the morning is cross. He awoke that priest out of his dreams and said to him, Will you tell me where I can find diamonds? The priest said, Diamonds? What do you want with diamonds? I want to be immensely rich, said al Hafed, but I don't know where to go. Well, said the priest, if you will find a river that runs over white sand between high mountains, in those sands you will always see diamonds. Do you really believe that there is such a river? Plenty of them, plenty of them. All you have to do is just go and find them. Then you have them. al Hafed said, I will go! So he sold his farm, collected his money at interest, left his family in charge of a neighbor, and away he went in search of diamonds. He began very properly, to my mind, at the mountains of the moon. Afterwards he went around into Palestine, then wandered on into Europe, and at last, when his money was all spent, and he was in rags, wretchedness, and poverty, he stood on the shore of that bay in Barcelona, Spain, when a tidal wave came rolling through the pillars of Hercules, and the poor, afflicted, suffering man could not resist the awful temptation to cast himself into that incoming tide, and he sank beneath its foaming crest, never to rise in this life again. When that old guide had told me that very sad story, he stopped the camel I was riding and went back to fix the baggage on one of the other camels. And I remember thinking to myself, why did he reserve that for his particular friends? There seemed to be no beginning, middle or end, nothing to it. That was the first story I ever heard told or read in which the hero was killed in the first chapter. I had but one chapter of that story, and the hero was dead. When the guide came back and took up the halter of my camel again, he went right on with the same story. He said that al Hafed's successor led his camel out into the garden to drink, and as that camel put its nose down into the clear water of the garden brook, al Hafed's successor 
noticed a curious flash of light from the sands of the shallow stream, and reaching in he pulled out a black stone having an eye of light that reflected all the colours of the rainbow, and he took that curious pebble into the house and left it on the mantel, then went on his way and forgot all about it. A few days after that, the same old priest who told al Hafed how diamonds were made came in to visit his successor. When he saw that flash of light from the mantel, he rushed up and said, Here is a diamond, here is a diamond. Has al Hafed returned? No, no, al Hafed has not returned. And that is not a diamond, that is nothing but a stone. We found it right out here in our garden. But I know a diamond when I see it, said he. That is a diamond. Then together they rushed to the garden and stirred up the white sands with their fingers and found others more beautiful, more valuable diamonds than the first. And thus, said the guide to me, were discovered the diamond mines of Golconda, the most magnificent diamond mines in all the history of mankind, exceeding the Kimberley in its value. The great Kohinoor diamond in England's crown jewels, and the largest crown diamond on earth in Russia's crown jewels, which I had often hoped she would have to sell before they had peace with Japan, came from that mine. And when the old guide had called my attention to that wonderful discovery, he took his Turkish cap off his head again and swung it around in the air to call my attention to the moral. Those Arab guides have a moral to each story, though the stories are not always moral. He said, Had al Hafed remained at home and dug in his own cellar or in his own garden, instead of wretchedness, starvation, poverty and death in a strange land, he would have had acres of diamonds. For every acre, yes, every shovelful of that old farm afterwards revealed the gems which since have decorated the crowns of monarchs. When he had given the moral to his story, I saw why he had reserved this story for his particular friends. I didn't tell him I could see it. I was not going to tell the old Arab that I could see it. For it was that mean old Arab's way of going around a thing, like a lawyer, and saying indirectly what he did not dare say directly, that there was a certain young man that day travelling down the Tigris River that might better be at home in America. I didn't tell him I could see it. I told him his story reminded me of one, and I told it to him quick. I told him about that man out in California who, in 1847, owned a ranch out there. He read that gold had been discovered in Southern California, and he sold his ranch to Colonel Sutter and started off to hunt for gold. Colonel Sutter put a mill on the little stream in that farm, and one day his little girl brought some wet sand from the raceway of the mill into the house and placed it before the fire to dry and as that sand was falling through the little girl's fingers a visitor saw the first shining scales of real gold that were ever discovered in california and the man who wanted the gold had sold this ranch and gone away never to return i delivered this lecture two years ago in california in the city that stands near that farm and they told me that the mine is not exhausted yet and that a one-third owner of that farm has been getting during these recent years twenty dollars of gold every fifteen minutes of his life sleeping or waking why you and i would enjoy an income like that but the best illustration that I have now of this thought was found here in Pennsylvania. There was a man living in Pennsylvania who owned a farm here, and he did what I should do if I had a farm in Pennsylvania. He sold it. But before he sold it, he concluded to secure employment collecting coal oil for his cousin in Canada. They first discovered coal oil there. So this farmer in Pennsylvania decided that he would apply for a position with his cousin in Canada. Now, you see, this farmer was not altogether a foolish man. He did not leave his farm until he had something else to do. 
of all the simpletons the stars shine on there is none more foolish than a man who leaves one job before he has obtained another and that has especial reference to gentlemen of my profession and has no reference to a man seeking a divorce so i say this old farmer did not leave one job until he had obtained another he wrote to canada but his cousin replied that he could not engage him because he did not know anything about the oil business well then said he i will understand it so he set himself at the study of the whole subject he began at the second day of the creation he studied the subject from the primitive vegetation to the coal oil stage until he knew all about it then he wrote to his cousin and said now i understand the oil business and his cousin replied to him all right then come on that man, by the record of the county, sold his farm for $833, even money, no cents. He had scarcely gone from that farm before the man who purchased it went out to arrange for the watering of the cattle, and he found that the previous owner had arranged the matter very nicely. There is a stream running down the hillside there, and the previous owner had gone out and put a plank across the stream at an angle, extending across the brook, and down edgewise a few inches under the surface of the water. The purpose of the plank across that brook was to throw over to the other bank a dreadful-looking scum, through which the cattle would not put their noses to drink above the plank, although they would drink the water on one side below it thus that man who had gone to canada had been himself damming back for twenty-three years a flow of coal oil which the state geologist of pennsylvania declared officially as early as eighteen seventy was then worth to our state a hundred millions of dollars the city of titusville now stands on that farm and those pleasantville wells flow on and that farmer who had studied all about the formation of oil since the second day of god's creation clear down to the present time sold that farm for eight hundred and thirty three dollars no cents again i say no cents but i need another illustration and i found that in massachusetts and i am sorry i did because that is my old state this young man i mention went out of the state to study went down to yale college and studied mines and mining they paid him fifteen dollars a week during his last year for training students who were behind their classes in mineralogy out of hours of course while pursuing his own studies but when he graduated they raised his pay from fifteen dollars to forty five dollars and offered him a professorship then he went straight home to his mother and said mother i won't work for forty five dollars a week what is forty five dollars a week for a man with a brain like mine mother let's go out to california and stake out gold claims and be immensely rich now said his mother it is just as well to be happy as it is to be rich but as he was the only son he had his way they always do and they sold out in massachusetts and went to wisconsin where he went into the employ of the superior copper mining company and he was lost from sight in the employ of that company at fifteen dollars a week again he was also to have an interest in any mines that he should discover for that company but i do not believe that he has ever discovered a mine i do not know anything about it but i do not believe he has i know he had scarcely gone from the old homestead before the farmer who had bought the homestead went out to dig potatoes and as he was bringing them in in a large basket through the front gateway the ends of the stone wall came so near together at the gate that the basket hugged very tight so he set the basket on the ground and pulled first on one side and then on the other side our farms in Massachusetts are mostly stone walls, and the farmers have to be economical with their gateways in order to have some place to put the stones. That basket hugged so tight that there as he was hauling it through, he noticed in the upper stone next the gate a block of native silver, 
eight inches square. And this professor of mines and mining and mineralogy, who would not work for forty-five dollars a week when he sold that homestead in Massachusetts, sat right on that stone to make the bargain. He was brought up there. He had gone back and forth by that piece of silver, rubbed it with his sleeve, and it seemed to say, Come now, 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 here is a hundred thousand dollars. Why not take me? But he would not take it. There was no silver in Newburyport. It was all a way off. Well, I don't know where. He didn't, but somewhere else. And he was a professor of mineralogy. I do not know of anything I would enjoy better than to take the whole time tonight telling of blunders like that I have heard professors make. Yet, I wish I knew what that man is doing out there in Wisconsin. I can imagine him out there as he sits by his fireside and he is saying to his friends, Do you know that man Comwell that lives in Philadelphia? Oh, yeah, I've heard of him. And do you know that man Jones that lives in that city? Yes, I've heard of him. And then he begins to laugh and laugh and says to his friends, They have done the same thing I did precisely. And that spoils the whole joke because you and I have done it. Ninety out of every hundred people here have made that mistake this very day. I say you ought to be rich. You have no right to be poor. To live in Philadelphia and not be rich is a misfortune, and it is doubly a misfortune, because you could have been rich just as well as be poor. Philadelphia furnishes so many opportunities. You ought to be rich. But persons with certain religious prejudice will ask, how can you spend your time advising the rising generation to give their time to getting money, dollars and cents, the commercial spirit? Yet I must say that you ought to spend time getting rich. You and I know there are some things more valuable than money. Of course we do. Ah, yes by a heart made unspeakably sad by a grave on which the autumn leaves now fall. I know there are some things higher and grander and sublimer than money. Well does the man know who has suffered that there are some things sweeter and holier and more sacred than gold. Nevertheless, the man of common sense also knows that there is not any one of those things that is not greatly enhanced by the use of money. Money is power. Love is the grandest thing on God's earth, but fortunate the lover who has plenty of money. Money is power. Money has powers. And for a man to say, I do not want money, is to say, I do not wish to do any good to my fellow men. It is absurd thus to talk. It is absurd to disconnect them. This is a wonderfully great life, and you ought to spend your time getting money because of the power there is in money. And yet this religious prejudice is so great that some people think it is a great honor to be one of God's poor. I am looking in the faces of people who think just that way. I heard a man once say in a prayer meeting that he was thankful that he was one of God's poor. And then I silently wondered what his wife would say to that speech as she took in washing to support the man while he sat and smoked on the veranda. I don't want to see any more of that land of God's poor. Now, when a man could have been rich, just as well, and he is now weak because he is poor, he has done some great wrong. He has been untruthful to himself. He has been unkind to his fellow men. We ought to get rich if we can by honorable and Christian methods, and these are the only methods that sweep us quickly toward the goal of riches. I remember, not many years ago, a young theological student who came into my office and said to me that he thought it was his duty to come in and labor with me. I asked him what had happened, and he said, I feel it is my duty to come in and speak to you, sir. 
and say that the holy scriptures declare that money is the root of all evil. I asked him where he found that saying, and he said he found it in the Bible. I asked him whether he had made a new Bible, and he said, no, he had not gotten a new Bible, that it was in the old Bible. Well, I said, if it is in my Bible, I never saw it. Will you please get the textbook and let me see it? He left the room, and soon came stalking in with his Bible open, with all the bigoted pride of the narrow sectarian who founds his creed on some misinterpretation of Scripture and he put the bible down on the table before me and fairly squealed into my ear there it is you can read it for yourself i said to him young man you will learn when you get a little older that you cannot trust another denomination to read the bible for you i said now you belong to another denomination please read it to me and remember that you are taught in a school where emphasis is exegesis so he took the Bible and read it, The love of money is the root of all evil. Then he had it right. The great book has come back into the esteem and love of the people, and into the respect of the greatest minds of earth, and now you can quote it and rest your life and your death on it without more fear. So, when he quoted right from the Scriptures, he quoted the truth. The love of money is the root of all evil. Oh, that is it. It is the worship of the means instead of the end, though you cannot reach the end without the means. When a man makes an idol of the money instead of the purposes for which it may be used, when he squeezes the dollar until the eagle squeals, then it is made the root of all evil. Think. If you only had the money, what you could do for your wife, your child, and for your home and your city. Think how soon you could endow the temple college yonder, if you only had the money and the disposition to give it. And yet, my friend, people say you and I should not spend the time getting rich. How inconsistent the whole thing is. We ought to be rich because money has power. I think the best thing for me to do is to illustrate this. For if I say you ought to get rich, I ought at least to suggest how it is done. We get a prejudice against rich men because of the lies that are told about them. The lies that are told about Mr. Rockefeller because he has two hundred million dollars, so many believe them. Yet how false is the representation of that man to the world? How little we can tell what is true nowadays when newspapers try to sell their papers entirely on some sensation. The way they lie about the rich men is something terrible. And I do not know that there is anything to illustrate this better than what the newspapers now say about the city of Philadelphia. A young man came to me the other day and said, if Mr. Rockefeller, as you think, is a good man, why is it that everybody says so much against him? It is because he has gotten ahead of us. That is the whole of it, just gotten ahead of us. Why is it Mr. Carnegie is criticized so sharply by an envious world? Because he has gotten more than we have. If a man knows more than I know, don't I incline to criticize somewhat his learning? Let a man stand in a pulpit and preach to thousands, and if I have fifteen people in my church and they're all asleep, don't I criticize him? We always do that to the man who gets ahead of us. Why, the man you are criticizing has one hundred millions, and you have fifty cents, and both of you have just what you are worth. One of the richest men in this country came into my home and sat down in my parlor and said, Did you see all those lies about my family in the paper? Certainly I did. I knew they were lies when I saw them. Why do they lie about me the way they do? Well, I said to him, If you give me your check for one hundred millions, I will take all the lies along with it. Well, said he, I don't see any sense in there thus talking about my family and myself. Conwell, tell me frankly, what do you think the American people think of me? 
Well, said I, they think you are the blackest-hearted villain that ever trod the soil. But what can I do about it? There is nothing he can do about it, and yet he is one of the sweetest Christian men I ever knew. If you get a hundred millions, you will have the lies, you will be lied about, and you can judge your success in any line by the lies that are told about you. I say that you ought to be rich, but there are ever coming to me young men who say, I would like to go into business, but I cannot. Why not? Because I have no capital to begin on. Capital, capital to begin on. What, young man, living in Philadelphia and looking at all this wealthy generation, all of whom began as poor boys, and you want capital to begin on? It is fortunate for you that you have no capital. I am glad you have no money. I pity a rich man's son. A rich man's son in these days of ours occupies a very difficult position. They are to be pitied. A rich man's son cannot know the very best things in human life. He cannot. The statistics of Massachusetts show us that not one out of seventeen rich men's sons ever die rich. They are raised in luxury. They die in poverty. Even if a rich man's son retains his father's money, even then he cannot know the best things of life. A young man in our college yonder asked me to formulate for him what I thought was the happiest hour in a man's history. And I studied it long and came back convinced that the happiest hour that any man ever sees in any earthly matter is when a young man takes his bride over the threshold of the door for the first time of the house he himself has earned and built when he turns to his bride and with an eloquence greater than any language of mine he saith to his wife my loved one i earned this home myself i earned it all it is all mine and i divide it with thee that is the grandest moment a human heart may ever see but a rich man's son cannot know that. He goes into a finer mansion, it may be, but he is obliged to go through the house and say, Mother gave me this, mother gave me that, my mother gave me that, my mother gave me that, until his wife wishes she had married his mother. Oh, I pity a rich man's son, I do, until he gets so far along in his dudism that he gets his arms up like that and can't get them down. Didn't you ever see any of them astray at Atlantic City? I saw one of these scarecrows once, and I never tire thinking about it. I was at Niagara Falls lecturing, and after the lecture I went to the hotel, and when I went up to the desk there stood a millionaire son from New York. He was an indescribable specimen of anthropologic potency. He carried a gold-headed cane under his arm, more in its head than he had in his. I do not believe I could describe the young man if I should try. But still, I must say that he wore an eyeglass he could not see through, patent leather shoes he could not walk in, and pants he could not sit down in, dressed like a grasshopper. Well, this human cricket came up to the clerk's desk just as I went in. He adjusted his unseeing eyeglass in this wise and lisped to the clerk, because it's English, you know, to lisp. Sir, sir, will you have the kindness to furnish me with some paper and some envelopes? The clerk measured that man quick, and he pulled out a drawer and took some envelopes and paper and cast them across the counter and turned away to his books. You should have seen that specimen of humanity when the paper and envelopes came across the counter. He whose wants had always been anticipated by servants. He adjusted his unseeing eyeglass and he yelled after that clerk, Come back here, sir! Come right back here! Now, sir, will you order a servant to take that paper and those envelopes and carry them to yonder desk? Oh, that poor, miserable, contemptible American monkey! He couldn't carry paper and envelopes twenty feet. I suppose he could not get his arms down. 
I have no pity for such travesties of human nature. If you have no capital, I am glad of it. You don't need capital. You need common sense, not copper cents. A.T. Stewart, the great princely merchant of New York, the richest man in America in his time, was a poor boy. He had a dollar and a half and went into the mercantile business. But he lost eighty-seven and a half cents of his first dollar and a half because he bought some needles and thread and buttons to sell, which people didn't want. Are you poor? It is because you are not wanted and are left on your own hands. There was the great lesson. Apply it whichever way you will. It comes to every single person's life, young or old. He did not know what people needed and consequently bought something they didn't want, and had the goods left on his hands a dead loss. A.T. Stewart learned there the great lesson of his mercantile life, and said, I will never buy anything more until I first learn what the people want. Then I'll make the purchase. He went around to the doors and asked them what they did want. And when he found out what they wanted, he invested his sixty-two and a half cents and began to supply a known demand. I care not what your profession or occupation in life may be. I care not whether you are a lawyer, a doctor, a housekeeper, teacher, or whatever else. The principle is precisely the same. We must know what the world needs first, and then invest ourselves to supply that need, and success is almost certain. A.T. Stewart went on until he was worth forty millions. Well, you'll say, a man can do that in New York, but cannot do it here in Philadelphia. The statistics very carefully gathered in New York in 1889 showed 107 millionaires in the city worth over 10 millions apiece. It was remarkable, and people think they must go there to get rich. Out of that 107 millionaires, only seven of them made their money in New York, and the others moved to New York after their fortunes were made, and sixty-seven out of the remaining hundred made their fortunes in towns of less than six thousand people. And the richest man in the country at that time lived in a town of thirty-five hundred inhabitants, and always lived there and never moved away. It is not so much where you are as what you are. But at the same time, if the largest of the city comes into the problem, then remember it is the smaller city that furnishes the great opportunity to make the millions of money. The best illustration that I can give is in reference to John Jacob Astor, who was a poor boy and who made all the money of the Astor family. He made more than his successors have ever earned, and yet... He once held a mortgage on a millinery store in New York, and because the people could not make enough money to pay the interest and the rent, he foreclosed the mortgage and took possession of the store and went into partnership with a man who had failed. He kept the same stock, did not give them a dollar capital, and he left them alone, and went out and sat down upon a bench in the park. Out there on that bench in the park he had the most important, and to my mind, the pleasantest part of that partnership business. He was watching the ladies as they went by, and where is the man that wouldn't get rich at that business? But when John Jacob Astor saw a lady pass, with her shoulders back and her head up, as if she did not care if the whole world looked on her, he studied her bonnet and before that bonnet was out of sight he knew the shape of the frame and the colour of the trimmings the curl of the something on a bonnet sometimes i try to describe a woman's bonnet this is of little use for it would be out of style to-morrow night so john jacob astor went to the store and said now put in the show window just such a bonnet as i described to you because said he I have just seen a lady who likes just such a bonnet. Do not make up any more till I come back. And he went out again and sat on that bench in the park, and another lady of a different form and complexion passed him with a bonnet of different shape and colour, of course. 
Now, said he, put such a bonnet as that in the show window. He didn't fill his show window with hats and bonnets which drive people away and then sit in the back of the store and bawl because the people go somewhere else to trade. He didn't put a hat or bonnet in that show window the like of which he had not seen before it was made up. In our city especially there are great opportunities for manufacturing, and the time has come when the line is drawn very sharply between the stockholders of the factory and their employees. Now, friends, there has also come a discouraging gloom upon this country, and the laboring men are beginning to feel that they are being held down by a crust over their heads through which they find it impossible to break, and the aristocratic money owner himself is so far above that he will never descend to their assistance. That is the thought that is in the minds of our people. But, friends, never in the history of our country was there an opportunity so great for the poor man to get rich as there is now in the city of Philadelphia. The very fact that they get discouraged is what prevents them from getting rich. That is all there is to it. The road is open, and let us keep it open between the poor and the rich. I know that the labor unions have two great problems to contend with and there is only one way to solve them. The labor unions are doing as much to prevent its solving as are the capitalists today, and there are positively two sides to it. The labor union has two difficulties. The first one is that it began to make a labor scale for all classes on a par, and they scaled down a man that can earn five dollars a day to two and a half a day in order to level up to him an imbecile that cannot earn fifty cents a day that is one of the most dangerous and discouraging things for the working man he cannot get the results of his work if he do better work or higher work or work longer that is a dangerous thing, and in order to get every laboring man free and every American equal to every other American, let the laboring man ask what he is worth and get it. Not let any capitalist say to him,